Doing great. Doing great. Uh, should we uh, get started? Sure. All right. All right, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome and thank you all for being here. This is, this is another fun six to six and a half hours we're gonna get to spend together talking about very detailed things. Um, let's be respectful of each other. Uh, raise hands and use your reactions as often as you can to let me and everybody else know how you feel about an issue. Um, it's important because normally we'd be in a room and we'd be able to see each other's head nods or, or facial expressions or whatever, and now we can't do that. So please use your reactions to, to make sure that we know what you're thinking um, so we can go through this faster. Um, if everybody is agreeing on something, there's no reason to continue discussion. We can, we can simply vote it forward. And if everybody fully disagrees with something, then, then maybe we need to spend more time on it or, or scrap it all together. So please use your reactions. Um, if you don't know where they are, they're at the bottom of your screen or right by your kind of your chat and participants and it's called reactions. And there's a, a thumbs up, which is temporary, clapping hands, which is temporary, crying, hearts, parties, all sorts of kind of fun things. The one is if you do raise hand, it will stay up until you are <clears throat> called on. And then uh, you need to put your hand down by doing, clicking on the same thing. The same thing for the yes button, which is also the agreement button that will stay up until you are, until you choose to put it down. The other ones and the no button as well will, um, will stay up until you put it down. The other ones, we'll only stay up for a few seconds. So with that, thank you again for all being here. Um, we have several topics today and the main event is at 10 o'clock where we'll be talking about heat pump water heaters. Um, so I guess let's do a roll call. Okay. Michael Baranek. I'm here. Eric Fidel. Christopher Burroughs. Present. CJ Brockway. Here. Mark <laughs> McConnor. Martin Connor. Mike Fowler. Good morning, present. Patrick Hayes. Present. Gary Hickenen. Here. Scott Henderson. Chris Holiday. Luke Howard. Present. Dwayne John Lynn. Morning. Elizabeth Joyce. Present. Bill Kraus. John Lay. Mike McGiver. Present. Alan Montpelier. Henry Odom. Present. Eric Olnon. Good morning, present. Andrew Poltorak. Here. Irina Rasputinus. Here. David Reddy. Present. Lisa Rosenau. Poppy Storm. Present. Gavin Tennold. Present. Sean Vig. Present. And Amy Wheelis. Present. Okay, and we do have a quorum this morning. Great. That means we can actually do something today. Okay, so uh, we have an agenda in front of us. Um, Let's look at it and um, in a short amount of time, we can review and approve it. I think there was a suggestion earlier that we 
uh, pair 165 and 188 together. Um, but we can probably do that when they get there. Those are the very, very end. 165 and 188. <clears throat> I move to approve the agenda as amended. Thank you, Amy. Do we have a second? Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second for the discussion. Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. Okay, motion passes. Um, the, the minutes from last time on June 25th are no are not available yet, so we, we can't um, prove those or review those. Um, that means we are on to the, the main event for today, which is um, starting with lighting proposals and then heading into other proposals. So Krista, take it away. And I, I guess I'm gonna remind everybody. So we have under lighting proposals, we have some that were consensus, meaning when we discuss them on um, uh, in early June, Everybody generally agreed that these were were, were good and, and nobody had comments. So um, please bring up comments if you have them. Um, but just a reminder that these first 10 or so, uh, we, we generally agreed on and had no substantive comments um, on. So the first one is timer switches. And it was a Shondera proposal. I am here, by the way, if it's helpful. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I mean, I think this is this is this was a consensus proposal. That I guess does anybody have any comments or questions about it, or or want to go through this in more detail? Uh, how about if I move to approve, as shown on the screen? Second. Mm -hmm. That would be fine. We have a motion, we have a second. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. All right, our second business of the day is taken care of. Let's move on to proposal of parking garage lighting 127. This is a Mike Kennedy. Um, Mike Kennedy proposal. This is also a consensus proposal from last time. Are there any, any comments, questions? Motion to approve. Second. Okay, we have a motion in a second. Are there is any further discussion? Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. Okay, we have this one approved. Um, the next one, general lighting updates, uh, 237. This is Lisa. Um, this was another consensus proposal. Are there any questions or comments on the language that we, we talked about earlier? Could you, could you scroll? Motion to approve. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. Okay, motion passes. The next one is a Mike McGivern. Um,
move some language around. Krista, we don't yet see the proposal. Is it struggling to open? There it is. Okay. Okay, CJ, comment. Yeah, can you just clarify if I know that the, the dwelling units have been changed relative to the language of the entire code? So how does this code change proposal relate to the fact that dwelling units is no longer um, called out in quite the normal way, the way it was? Anybody have an answer for CJ? I don't have an answer, but I had a similar thought because I was remembering, uh, I think it was Eric Vander May or um, one of his colleagues had a proposal about that specific section CJ was mentioning. I was wondering if that had, had the same, same thoughts. Um, I believe this dovetails with the, the change. Um, previously, uh, multifamily dwelling units were handled differently than non-multifamily dwelling units. So if you had a, a unit in a hotel or a lodging that complied with the dwelling unit, it would still need hotel or lodging unit controls, um, which is what this was about. And I believe the change up top eliminates that path. So this is no longer needed or eliminates that distinction. Right, that's my memory as well, that this is, this is compatible. CJ, do you need more? We can come back and revisit this if it turns out there's something. No, that's fine. I'm just wanting to confirm what the difference might have been. I'm fine with it. Move to approve. Second. Um, motion. I'll second that. Okay, we have a second. Motion and a second. Any further discussion? Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. Okay, we approve this and we reserve the right to revisit it if necessary, as necessary. Okay, um, next one is Krista, you shall stop. Okay, there you are. Yep, sorry. Having some technical difficulties here. Oh no. All right, this one is Michael Meyer. Um, this is another consensus proposal. Move to approve. Second. Okay, we have a motion. We have a second. Further discussion? Um, can we just um, a sec, please? What was that, CJ? I, I just want to make sure I'm, I'm completely yep. clear on what this is. Yeah, please, let's take the time we need. Uh, this is Michael Meyer. I, I also just, I'm inadvertently uh, participating on the phone for a little bit more. Um, I appreciate you naming who, uh, which proposed them. Can you also read the names again? Just uh, the names, of the, the short name of the proposal, just to refresh ourselves. Yeah, this one was called Exterior Building Grounds Lighting 204. Ah, thank, thank you. So if, if CJ would like more of the background there, it was just, 
uh, the, uh, there was a tax requirement of an occupancy center that was redundant, and then a, a, a solar power lighting uh, comment. My, I looked at the consensus version, this is Michael Meyer again. My only question was, um, it looks like the solar powered requirement is still gonna stay in, which is fine, for my opinion, I, I just raised it. But in the version I saw in the consensus, it looks like you have two, it looks like right now it's one, two is struck out, and then three struck out as one again. It should be struck out as, and it should be one and two. I, I, the only comment I wanted to say on the version that was available. Okay, in the version that Krista brought up, one was struck out, and there was only one exception. Okay. But um, okay. we changed it to meet what you had suggested, which is that we maintain the solar power lamp exception. Is that what you're suggesting? I, I, no, I, I personally said I thought, in the original proposal, I said I thought solar power lamps would be in scope. In the version that was a part of the agenda, and uh, it looked like it was still in there. So if, if one is struck out, then I have no comment. Okay, so one, you, in your opinion, one should be struck. I, yes, I think solar power is out of scope, and you would never need to, to, you wouldn't comply with the code if you have a solar power picture, correct? I, I think that's correct. I think the scope of the code, uh, the lighting part of the code is, is lighting that's connected to the, to the uh, building's electric service. Is that right, Mike? That's my general understanding if you're talking to me, Dwayne. Yeah. Okay, so the recommendation is that one maintains being struck out. Um, Sean Denniston has raised his hand. Go ahead, Sean. Hi, thank you. Uh, I understand the redundancy from a usability standpoint. I would just suggest that you strike the text in the body instead of the exception, because it's kind of weird to have one exception in the body and then another exception in the exceptions. Just my suggestion for usability. Thank you. I tend to agree. I feel like exception in there and one of the exceptions is, yeah, that, that does seem like it's too wordy where it could be fewer words. Mike Fowler? Uh, just for clarity, the, I don't know, the file that I downloaded has a 204 T rev. Um, the exception number one was not stricken, but the word lamps was stricken and replaced by luminaires. So I just want to make sure that we're um, have the right version of and what, what, what our direction is for exception number one. Or, That, this is Mike Byer. That was the same version I looked at this morning that had that exact, that was what I saw as well. So to maintain exception one, but change lamps to luminaires? I, I'm, this is Mike Byer again. I'm not advocating one way or the other. I mean, my original proposal was I think you could remove one. It was just the proposal that was available in the agenda made it seem like the, the tag had decided to keep one. Uh, if, if you guys are in agreement that one is out of scope, I would say yes, one could be removed outright. I was just agreeing with that previous person. The version I had still had that in there. Okay. Does it make it, I guess, CJ, do you have thoughts on this? Uh, relative to whether solar power is in here or not, it seems like if it's not, uh, if it's excluded from the energy calcs altogether. I don't know why it's worth mentioning, but. Um. Okay. That sounds like, it sounds like you would be agreeable to having one, the exception number one removed. Correct. That kind of makes sense to me, I guess. Um, and then does anybody have any great ideas about eliminating the redundancy of the exceptions? seems to me that you could put a period right after watt, 100 lumens per watt in the first sentence and delete the rest and then restore exception two. 
Yes, that that would seem. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, Mike, you still have your hand up. Sean likes that. How many people like this idea? Show me your your hearts and your thumbs up and your or your thumbs down. Okay, we have general agreement on this. This seems better than when we came in today, so I like that. Um, is there a motion on the floor? Did we yet? Approve? Oh no, there was actually there was a motion on the floor. Yeah. So you interrupted uh, or or had further discussion during the motion, which is very much appreciated. So we do have a motion. Is there any further discussion? I could say that, that those changes are, I, I take as a friendly amendment. All right, and Mike, do you agree? Yes, I think they are improvement. Thank you. Okay, and then Mike Fowler was the second, I believe. Um, so Mike Fowler, do you also accept these as friendly? Uh, I don't think I was the second on oh. those, but I'm, I'm fine with what has been discussed. Who, who did the second on this one? I had Mike Fowler as the second as well. Okay. okay. Your memory's better. I have short-term Swiss cheese memory. Okay. Well, in that case, uh, further discussion. All right. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. Okay. Passes with flying colors. All right. We are on to... Another exterior lighting one, this is 198. And this is a Michael Meyer one again. Uh, it's called exterior lighting, Mike. So. Um, Thank you. And this one basically changes a lot of numbers. Um, you know, I remember we had some, some good discussion on this last time. This was also consensus, but it does have a lot of numbers in it. So if anybody had further thoughts on those numbers, um, that would be a good time to bring that up. Patrick. I'd like to know where the numbers came from. As in, is, uh, it, is it dartboard math? Did it come from another code? Is it, you know, where'd they come from? Uh, this is Michael Meyer, and I will try to respond to that. I appreciate the question. It is not dartboard math. Um, so, uh, 3.1, so that, that part of the um, version of 2016, where the numbers came from was an improvement on LED technology between 2016 and now. And then also a secondary change is that when we, when LEDs came onto the scene, we didn't know how the depreciation would work. And so we assumed that much uh, more, uh, severe depreciation and the and new data says well the depreciation is much uh, more gradual and that causes the lighting zones are supposed to get more uh, i'm not sure that that answered my question i was looking for okay. a source or a formula or you know i do a lot of lighting power allowances and um, sooner or later, we're going to be living in the dark. So a reliable source or a reliable equation or something is what I'm looking for. So Mike Meyer, I think the first maybe 30 seconds of what you said was cut off. So um, if oh. you did give a source during that, um, I don't think anybody here, it. I certainly didn't. I, I, didn't uh, I apologize. Uh, I apologize. Uh, I apologize. So the 2016, the, these numbers had not changed since 2016, and they were the, the technology has become more efficient. So in 2016, the average LED uh, outdoor picture efficiency was 80 lumens per watt. Now you're over 105, and really 120 is common. So the reduction first is an improvement in technology uh, based on just changing that technology. Then the second comes in from a design practice change, and that's about 50. Oh, we just lost you again. Um, still looking for a source. I, I, 
if we could come back to it, I'll be better. Yeah, that, that sounds like a good idea. Why don't we come back to this? Why don't we hear from, um, I think Mike Kennedy raised his hand first. Yeah, I can tell you, Patrick, I compared these to the um, values that are in the new or in the proposed language for Title 24. And if, um, these are actually slightly higher than the values that are being considered from Title 24. And I believe the, these derive from the same body of work. So these are slightly more conservative than what is being proposed to be adopted in California at the moment. Yeah, but it's still being proposed. It hasn't been adopted. Uh, yeah, it's made it through eight months of trial language so far. So it's, it's pretty likely. I'm going to suggest that we uh, move on from this proposal and come back when, when uh, Michael Meyer can join us. Does that sound generally good, everybody? Sure. Okay. Um, I, I couldn't hear much of what he said, and I'm assuming that goes for the rest of you as well. I couldn't hear anything. <laughs> yep. Okay, so the next one is... Uh, is it parking occupancy? This is also Michael Meyer, so perhaps um, lighting setback is the next one, which is a Mike Kennedy proposal. Um, I believe the Michael Meyer one was consensus to be withdrawn, just because ah. it, it contradicts with the one we just passed. Uh, just a little bit ago. Okay. That or no, is this one, right. And this is yours. Right. Um, this one was modified a little bit. Um, so this was also a consensus proposal. It looks like Krista, you're not showing. Uh, you're not showing. Maybe this is a different one than. Okay, I was looking at a different one. This is uh, one twenty-five, and when we had gone through before and looked at this one, and uh, what was it, two hundred two from Mike Meyer, the tag consensus was they preferred uh, this 125 from Mike Kennedy. So I have a 125 in the agenda that is different than, than what you have. Um, and it's noted as revised 6421. Um, and it has a bit. Now I may have pulled the wrong. File. Hang on just a second. Let me go back to the agenda. Oh, you still want to improve the that every products right now in front of everybody? Yeah, this is the one I have in front of me. Mike likes it. CJ has her hand raised. CJ? Yeah, I'm I'm still confused because when I click on the agenda, I get a different file than even this that you just clicked on. Like I get one that has lighting setback. It's totally different. Is it 125? Does it say 125 in the upper right? No, it doesn't have a log number. So are you looking at 202 maybe? Um, I'm looking at the agenda that was part of the actual email invite for this uh, meeting today. Is there, a, is there a different one that we should be looking at instead of the one that was attached to the actual meeting invite to this? Uh, I, I, 
Is this the one you're looking at, CJ? Yes. This is 202. Okay. The parking occupancy? Yes. Okay. The one we're looking at now is 125. Um, and it also is titled Lighting Setback. Sorry, that's my confusion. Okay. Uh, Mike Kennedy, give your hand up. Yeah, I was just going to summarize. These came in independently from Michael Myers and I, and his reasoning for eliminating um, this parking control was that the 70, previous 78 watts um, generally would not occur um, in parking lots on poles that were less than 24 feet. Um, so he was supportive of this language. Um, and I have an email, he actually reviewed these things last night and I have an email from him that says that. Um, and this is the version I remember from the last tag where someone had the great idea to move it up to the top here. Okay, is everybody on the right proposal and ready? All right, CJ. Yeah, um, I remember we had a conversation about mounting heights and wanting to confirm that the uh, mounting height listed in the, in the language was appropriate. And there was, I think, some homework that someone was gonna do on that. I didn't know if there was any report out on that homework. I do not remember homework. 24 feet is what's in the current code. I, I think we determined that, that 24 feet was sort of the maximum capability of the um, of current technology for outdoor. So it was the change between 30 and, 20, and 24 that we discussed last time then? I think so. Okay. Right, and I, I had originally posed 30 and um, based on Michael Myers and a few other people's input, we reverted back to the 24 that was in the current code. Can, can I point out a typo, please? Um, like the fourth line, it says 50% during any tie where activity has not been detected. Pretty sure that should have been time. Um, but actually that phrase during any time could also just be stricken because it's, so they would just say 50% where activity has not been detected for 15 minutes. Makes sense. CJ, I have a question for you. Um, 1500 watts, is that an appropriate maximum number of watts for parking lot lighting? Uh, this, your question really ought to be provided to uh, an electrical engineer. I do not know to what extent there'll be, and they'll end up controlling uh, fixtures together from an actual um, power hookup standpoint, but that seems reasonable given the fact that that would be less than 120 amp breaker. Do we have an engineer on the call? That is the one tag one of one of about two tag slots we don't have filled is electrical engineer. Dwayne, this is Michael Meyer. Uh, that's the same in ninety point one, and I believe IEC. I, I think. Uh, back in the day, are you asking, is that too much? Should it be lower or uh, it's easily one circuit? Okay, just as long as it's been looked at, I'm fine. Are we ready to vote when that phrase um, gets stricken? I move to approve with the changes we've discussed. Second. We have a motion second for the discussion. Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Say no. All right. This means we are on to 
I guess. Ch shall we skip over 202? Do we need a motion to, I'll make a motion dis to disapprove 202. Uh, why don't we bring up 202 briefly and then. Because um, they were dealing with the same topics. Is that how I understood between 202 and 125? Yeah, so I um, just want to make sure we handle this right. So this was withdrawn or this, is was this withdrawn by the proponent? Do not believe so officially yet. Okay. And the proponent is? Michael Meyer. Michael Meyer. So Michael uh, yeah. Meyer, are you going to withdraw 202 based on further discussion? This is. Uh, I am comfortable. I am comfortable with drawing it, um, uh, especially since the previous one didn't change the mounting height. Yeah, I would draw. Yeah, and the previous one was a mounting height of 24 feet. So Correct. Yeah. Okay, so 202 is withdrawn. Um, so, and, and Michael Meyer, are you now in a place where you can speak or, or should we wait a bit for, before we cover Exterior lighting. Uh, I will be available. I'll be about three more minutes exterior lighting. I think there's one more in consensus. And then if we can do uh, the exterior, the full table, I'll be ready in three minutes. Oh, great. Okay. So let's go to 197. This is LPA table cleanup. This is a Michael Meyer one. Um, this was also a consensus one. Uh, are there any questions or discussion on this? CJ. Yeah, I just have a question on the uh, elimination of footnote B for guest rooms. I'm wondering why that's crossed out. Footnote D? B is in boy. B is in boy. My exact question too, thank you, CJ. Where, where is it crossed out? Next to guest rooms. Oh, in the in this superscript. Yeah. Does anybody have an, an answer for that one? I'm I'm confused about what we're looking at there. There's some bullet points and then some yeah some footnotes, and I'm not I don't see how they connect together. Yeah, I agree. There's no section in front of for SI, right? Normally you'd expect a section number to there. This is the space by space table. Yeah, so the guest room is a line on the table as fire stations and libraries. Okay. And this, so they're just pulled down for without pulling the whole table in. Okay, makes sense. CJ. If I'm understanding correctly, this really is truly just cleanup. Um, I would was going to notice note the same thing. Like the library, of course, has a footnote F, which after it no longer is pertinent. Um, so again, my question was just the elimination of footnote B for guest rooms, but I think I completely concur with everything else I'm seeing here. With one caveat, actually. <laughs> but we can get there later. Uh, Dwayne. Actually, Mike McGivern had his hand up first. Oh, Mike. Yeah, there's currently no definition of guest room in the energy code. So I could see a case being made to either provide a definition or eliminate the reference to guest room. And that's what's not, that's not what's being proposed, I guess. We still have exception A for guest rooms. Well, just not exception B is at least what CJ is bringing up. Does this have to anything to do with the dwelling unit um, discussion that was happening earlier? 
I don't think there's any anybody's ever had any um, concern about what a guest room is. Uh, it's been in the table for a very long time. Uh, I, I could see that you could strike B because from as a footnote there because B uh, because the facility for the visually impaired is already a general category that's that's covered. You don't have to have the a, a separate uh, item for guest rooms. David, ready? Um, I, I guess I would. I just want to echo Mike's comment that that I think there's a number of places in the code, energy code, where um, guest room is used, and then also in other contexts, uh, our group R sleeping unit, group R one sleeping. So I think there's there's it's there definitely could be used some clarity or maybe a new definition and using it consistently where it applies. Well, this has been a function of the space by space table for a few code cycles. Yeah, no, I, I'm, I think I'm expanding this, the point beyond just this table. Mm -hmm. Maybe something we can come back to. Well, certainly if, I'm, I'm guessing we could add to this, this proposal, a definition of guest room if we thought it was important and then that it would be part of the definitions in the code if we thought that that was an important thing to do. I'd, I'd support that. Second that. Do you have, David, a, a definition handy? Um, or I guess we're gonna take a break at 11.30 or so. Could you, or does anybody feel like coming up with a definition of for guest room that would apply throughout the entire code. I can take a crack at it. I think there might be something in Title 24 that we could look at. OK. You, you know, I, I just was looking back through the table, and, and footnote B is listed for a few other things, dormitory living, living quarters. And I can't find okay. a model, so how is the So um, maybe it is appropriate to leave it in as a footnote for guest rooms. Put no B. Yeah. Okay, so I see two things that we can talk about or potentially vote on. One is whether we keep the exception for B or not. Um, another one is whether we add a definition for um, for guest room. Uh, Mike Kennedy. Yeah. Um, as it was my observation that when ninety point one created the lighting categories, specific lighting categories for facility for visually impaired, they got rid of this exception from their space by space table in all cases, I believe. Um, and then the IECC adopted the visually impaired allowances, but kept this, this exception. Um, so I think there, there is an, uh, I'm not sure we want to keep, I mean, I think we need to look at it maybe more generally and not just on guest room. It might be that we want to eliminate it from a lot of the categories. Exception B. Yeah. Or. Mike Meyer. Mike Meyer. Michael Meyer. Um, yes, I'm on 90.1, and uh, we have this as a footnote currently, or something very similar to this, to a footnote in our table. Um, we are in our current version, we're revising it um, to group all of them together. But we have a, a similar note, mainly because visually impaired, they're low light conditions, and, and so we're differentiating a corridor for, between a normal corridor and a, and a visually impaired corridor. So we still have something. It's not identical, but B, B is very close to what we have. I'm pulling up our language to verify it, but we, we still have that currently in the table. Okay. I think next was either CJ or Eric. Um, CJ. Yeah, thanks. I, I just would really like, given the fact that this code change proposal was a cleanup proposal, 
I feel like we should stick to its intent, which was to um, deal with the cleanup of these footnotes. And I, as much as I, I think that the conversation about guest rooms and facilities for the visually impaired is something that sounds like we need to look at in the future, uh, I guess I'm suggesting that we uh, try to move forward and improve this specific code change proposal uh, with eliminating the cross out on the B because it seems like it's an actual change, um, whereas everything else in here is a clarification. Okay, Eric? Uh, looks like guest room is defined by the IBC. It's actually spelled as one room or one word guest room and it's a room used or intended to be used for one or more guests as, for living or sleeping purposes. So that's a possible definition that could be used. I guess, do we, can we add a definition anytime later or should we vote on this and now with the definition as part of it? I feel like a guest, guest defining guest room would have lots of implications throughout the code. Um, well, I mean, the IBC definition would be, would if there is no definition of the energy code, then you would go to the IBC next, right? So, okay. So then it's just whether we decide to include that in the energy code or just defer to the IBC. Right, so um, it is a defined term and it is out italicized throughout the use in, in the building code, so. Okay, Mike Fowler. Yeah, I was trying to pull up the integrated draft. I just had the, uh, the current 2018 code at easy reference, but I'm looking through the space by space and like lounge break room has footnote N in the table. And now footnote N is being renumbered to whatever it is down below in the bottom of the screen. So it seems like there's additional coordination that need, may need to happen with a space by space table as well in terms of the new, if the footnotes up. But my proposal would be just to leave the things, leave reserved in there. And then, then there's no other coordination needed with uh, the table and renumbering the footnotes within the table. Okay. Um, everybody? I'm sorry. I uh, forgot to put, I'll lower my hand here. Dwayne. Oh, Dwayne just took his hand down. Or Dwayne, did you have something to say? No, go ahead. Okay, Mike, Michael Meyer. Um, yeah, I mean, this is my proposal, so I'm supportive of getting rid of the reserves. The, my, I understand while it makes it easier, and I apologize, I, I didn't have the table, so I didn't, I didn't make those edits. Um, but the reason why I would still advocate getting rid of the reserves is there's one, and I don't know if it's going to go forward or not, but there's one in the, the next session, the B category, that we're going to resolve or re, re, review, and it, it's a dead demo, or it's not a dead demo, it's footnote O. And all I'm saying is that at some point, you're going to need to clean up the table because you're, the footnotes are just going to keep, could keep accumulating and they're just going to get longer and longer. And at some point, just it's, in my opinion, it's better to do the cleanup once versus just keep adding on uh, more. And, uh, and, and if you remove another one, it just starts, it just starts making it more cumbersome. So it, it's, a, it's, an, uh, it's still an argument for cleanup and expedience. Um, and okay. while it does require cleaning up the table. Okay, that, that makes sense to me. And then we will just leave it to Krista and others to make sure that the old footnotes and the new footnotes go to the same things that they used to. So. Michael, this conversation started off with uh, questioning the uh, changes of the footnote to guest room. Can you um, explain those? The strikeout of exception B on guest room. Um, I'm sorry, I, 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 the question was directed to me. I'm a little confused. Uh, I understand the 
I don't, the footnote B, I think actually wasn't being changed. So that's where I'm confused while it's shown here. So if it's directed to me, I apologize. Okay. Yeah. It, uh, it looks like, and it's really tiny on my screen. The, there's a strikeout of exception B for guest rooms. Um, oh, oh, I see what you're saying now. Yes. And what's the, what's the impetus for that change? Uh, I would say the impetus of that change is that uh, I don't actually think they're necessary in, so in this category, it's with this, with a guest room that's a visually impaired guest room, that would be like a, uh, a assisted living facility uh, per, personal room. I, I guess I'm confused by when you differentiate a guest room for the visually impaired. CJ. Yeah, I think you raise a good question. I, I don't, again, think that that is what the purview of this code change proposal was attempting to address. Um, I, I think that if we want to discuss that, it would be worth discussing under a different code change proposal and there should be some actual metrics behind it. Um, my concern, and especially considering that we're asking for occupancy sensing in, in guest rooms, uh, so if you leave the space, your lights turn off is, I mean, this is a dwelling unit. This is a living unit where if you want to turn your lights on, it's where you live and what makes you comfortable. I don't, I just don't feel like we should be mandating that you can't have, if you think that the, a, a large majority of your clientele actually might be the elderly, you might want to try to actually utilize this in as a, as a credit for, for your design. And again, if you've got a human living in a space, I don't think we should be telling them they can't have uh, a few more layers of light that serves their needs. So again, it's not the purview of the CCP and if we need to talk about it more, we could do so, but that's my opinion. Mike Meyer, do you wanna to respond to that? Um. No, I, I, I'm actually, I think CJ is making an interesting point and I'm reviewing. Uh, I don't know, I, I, I would take the, the, men, the comment from CJ as leave, uh, I'm hearing what CJ say is a friendly amendment is remove the strikeout of the B and the rest of the addendum is fine. If that's what I'm interpreting, and I'd be okay with that because I think what CJ is saying is there's a larger issue that should be considered, and and if so, do that. And so, and I think if I'm interpreting the thumbs up, she's in agreement. Yes, I'm fine with that friendly amendment of removing the B strikeout. Okay, so we have basically we've removed the strikeout of the B for guest room. We've added a definition for guest room, which is directly from the IBC, which would have taken precedent anyway or been been relevant anyway. Are there any other comments on this before we vote on it? CJ? I don't think we need to add the definition for guest room in here. Doesn't make sense. Anybody else have thoughts on that? Uh, I, I agree that, that there's never been any, to my knowledge, any confusion about what is a guest room for purposes of lighting. Okay. David ready. Does that um, mean we can't consider that that or table that discussion for future consideration, adding a definition or kind of clarifying and cleaning up related on requirements related to guest rooms? I think if it's perfectly editorial um, or or clerical, we can do that. Okay. Um, if it's, if it's changing the way buildings are used or built, um, I don't think we can do that without a code change proposal. Um, mm -hmm. So I, Krista, I don't know, what, what do we do when we have something like this where it's you know adding a definition or maybe cleaning up some language, but it's not a code change proposal? It would just be um, a revision to the code, this code change proposal. So uh, it could be added if the tag so wishes, just as a point of clarification for the. Okay. Okay, right. so, so my instinct is to attempt to vote on this now. And then if David Reddy or someone else later comes back and says, I have 
some clarifications for guest rooms um, that might apply in this section and in other sections, then we could revisit this proposal. Like the only thing I would offer is that the word guest room, as, as Eric pointed out, is used as one word in yeah. the IBC, and it's also used as both one word and two words in the energy code. So do we want to adopt a convention here and make the edit here and then follow up with that unification throughout? That sounds very reasonable. I think having it be one word makes a lot of sense because it's more, more a more easily defined term, I guess. Um, anybody have any thoughts on that? Okay, why don't we make it one word? And then um, if David or anybody else feels like this code change proposal needs a modification in the future such that it applies the term guest room more universally throughout the code, yeah, well, let's bring it up later. But why don't we attempt to vote on this now? Anybody? Motion to approve. All right. Second. We have a motion and a second. Further discussion? Okay. All in favor say aye. Okay. Aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. Okay. Motion passes. Why don't we go back to Mike Myers' proposal that we skipped? That was. Which one was that? Was that um, 204, was it? No, it was not 204. It was 198. Yeah, 198. All right, Mike, do you want to talk about the, the source for these um, so that we can all hear you now? Yeah. So the 90.1 exterior working group, which was a sub uh, team of the 90.1 lighting subcommittee evaluated the exterior lighting. Um, the two, these values had not been changed since 2016, roughly. And 2016, the efficient, uh, efficacy of LED technology was roughly 80 lumens per watt. We are now easily at 105 and really 120 lumens per watt. So just by change in uh, maturity of, of where we are with LED technology, you're seeing a 25 to 35% gain in efficiency. And that's where some of the reduction in values come from. The other change that occurred was in the, in the 2016 era, um, we were less knowledgeable about the, how quickly um, the LEDs would depreciate. And that time we actually assumed they would depreciate very quickly. And since then, we have uh, new data on, on how fast they would appreciate, which is much slower. And as a result, design practices have changed, and therefore, the depreciation values used in calculations have shifted as well. So that is the second place where efficiency gains have had, because we are, we are assuming we were accounting for previously much faster degradation, and now we don't have to. And that's uh, where some of the efficiency gains. The third kind of formula that was in question was that um, previously, the zones were not entirely structured. So the concept of a lighting zone is zone one. You're in a rural, very rural state park or um, uh, other type of place. Zone four, you may not even have in certain places in Washington, but if it does exist, it's probably only in Seattle. Um, but the concept there is uh, low light in zone one, high light in zone four. Most of us all live in zone two and three. And, the re and so why I'm bringing this back up story is that um, in the process of, of this new uh, reconfiguration of the values, um, a scaling was actually applied as well. So as you can see in that walkway example is a great example. Previously, it was 0.1 in was zones 1 and 2, and then zone 3.11, uh, and then in zone 4.14. And now you can see more of a gradation effect. And so that's actually, the, someone asked about a formula. So actually, they all are scaled uh, in reference to zone 3, um, and that's where we did all the kind of analysis was on zone three, but then actually said, okay, well, if the logic is that you need 
uh, your your eye is adapted to let lower light levels in zone one. You're gonna you're gonna go this way, and zone four, your eye needs to be adapted for more light levels. You're gonna go this way. So that's kind of how uh, the values were developed. I can go on more, but someone asked about formulas. That's kind of where we are, as well as I can provide more information. Patrick, does that address your concerns? Not really. I mean, yes, it does. And he answered the question, but I can say looking at these values and the one that does an awful lot of lighting power allowance calculations, I am definitely going to vote no. Okay, CJ. Okay, so uh, Patrick, respectfully, I'm in favor of this proposal. Uh, I, I believe that we should be striving to lower our outdoor lighting illuminances. And I think that this helps us to do this. I also think that we haven't touched this table for a while. And I think that this seems like a fair place to be right now. I think we can also try it out. Um, Starting to develop some of these analysis tools to look at the temperature loss. Uh, that, that's my comment. Okay, thanks, CJ. Any more comments on this? Otherwise, we'll entertain uh, interns. Move to approve as we've got it on the screen. Second. Okay, we have a motion. We have a second. Further discussion? Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. Okay. Okay. Uh, motion passes. Um, all right. Was that that was that the only one we skipped, or did we skip another one in here? That's the only one we skipped. So that means we are on to 203 is the next one. 203 space by space method. Basically, it's just a correction of what of uh, square meters versus square feet. Um, I think this is fairly simple. I will entertain a motion to approve. Motion this. to approve. Second. Okay, we have a motion. We have a second. Further discussion. Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 <laughs> I heard two ayes. Aye. A any opposed? Say nay. Okay, um, that one passes. Um, Okay, so that, I, I believe that takes us through all the consensus proposals. Um, now we're on to the lighting topics that, that needed further discussion or rewrites. So in this case, I would like the proponent or the rewriter to talk briefly about changes that were made uh, and homework that was addressed. So the first one was interior lighting power allowance. And this is a, Haley Ojama. Is that person in the room? I don't believe Haley is here. Is, is a Lucretia, are you here? Hey, is anybody able to talk to any changes that were made based on the homework? Uh, I guess I can attempt to talk to this because they didn't even get a chance. They didn't talk to this last time. Um, okay. And has anybody actually read it? <laughs> uh, because it's actually fairly thorough. Um, the issue is that they specifically want to 
try to address spaces that have multiple functions being able to be allowed the highest lighting power allowance of the representative use type that it is expected to occur. Now, I believe that the problem that we that comes into play is that, and correct me if I'm wrong, but when one attempts to get a project permitted, the architect is gonna have to stamp each room with a certain identifying space type definition, in which case they're gonna go for something that just seems logical However, if you know that that, uh, I don't know, let's try to think of an example. Uh, I think that they mentioned some in here. If it's a gymnasium, uh, if it's a dining area, for example, in a school, uh, you're only allowed at a cafeteria 0.4 watts per square foot. However, if they're gonna end up using it as a gymnasium or a fitness center, as well as a dining cafeteria, but again, the drawing is stamped cafeteria. We still need to provide lighting that allows for the function of the fitness aspect, the gymnasium aspect of that space. So essentially we're saying that there may be some situations where if it's a multi-use space, the stamp on the drawing doesn't clearly communicate what we're supposed to be trying to design for. Um, and I don't know that I've, totally thoroughly understood the exact mechanism to be able to push this through relative to the code review, but there is some language that has been added that's underlined that I think Lucretia and Helly are trying to suggest. Thanks, CJ. Uh, Mike Meyer. Michael? I can't hear you if you're talking. Hey, Jean Michael Meyer, you have your hand up. You look like you're not muted, but I can't hear you. Okay, Mike Fowler. All right, thank you, CJ, for jumping in to explain that. Uh, my question is, uh, I did read through it, and I just don't know that it it's applied to both building area method and space by space. I wasn't seeing the need for it to be as part of the building area method. Uh, I could see it for being space by space. Uh, my other question is, it seems, I don't know, uh, a little collaboration with uh, among a project team could come up with a naming convention that, that works for everybody. Um, um, but I would say the language I was liking would be whatever is the dominant function of the space. Um, should be the the one that is determines the lighting. Um, you know, if it's, it's sort of like the you have a pickup, but you use it on the weekends, but then you use it to commute to work. Um, you know, um, you know, I don't want to have a function that's only five percent of the time use drive much higher lighting lighting allowances. So trying to figure out a balance between those. Hi, Kennedy. Yeah, I guess I wanted to, I was going to say kind of what Mike Fowler just said. I guess I get concerned that this kind of opens it up to, you know, the lobby. Well, we might have an art display in there. So it's a gallery um, kinds of things. And I'm not sure this seems kind of open-ended. Um, it's also not in any of the other codes. So. I yeah, I, mean, would it, I guess would it be reasonable to suggest that if somebody really wanted to do this, they could use space by space instead of building building area method. That that's in the next screen yeah. down. Yep. Um, I have I have a similar concern to Mike and Mike. Okay, Michael Meyer. Uh, can you hear me now? Yep. Um, yeah, I. I wrote some comments on this internally. Yeah, I completely disagree that it's for the uh, the building area. That's the whole reason the space by space exists, as well as the way the, the building area means 
is that if you had, let's say, in the example they wrote about a, re a religious facility that had a daycare, at the end of the day, it's going to be a religious facility. You can't just say, well, it's really a daycare building. If it's if it's eighty percent a daycare, then they can't call it a, a, a you know they can't call it a religious facility if it's eighty percent daycare. So it doesn't really work at all in the building area. We we've had this issue in the space by space in ninety point one a couple of times. Honestly, I'm not too worried. I think CJ's example is great because they're going to name it the drawing what it is every once in a while. It may, you know, the cafetorium gymnasium that we grew up with as kids are less and less. I think it's a very small thing and I don't think it heard that many spaces. Um, and 90.1 has one that's very similar to what's described there of the subspaces that are of the area that are 20% enclosed. So we, they already kind of, this this exists in the Washington code as well, where you can actually, you, you can apportion at the space. So I actually think it's a small change that just trying to clarify so people understand it differently. So you support this? Or I'm, I'm fine with it in the space by space. It, I, I completely disagree with it there in the building area. Okay. CJ. I think Heli and Lucretia would take that as a friendly amendment. Do you also agree with that, CJ? Well, I, 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 I do agree with it. I, I do think it's a problem that we're faced with as designers on jobs. So if we can do it in space by space with this, um, I, I think that, that would satisfy our needs. Okay. Mike Kennedy. I, I guess I was, uh, Michael Myers seemed to think this language was uh, uh, clarifying, but this seems quite different in that it's actually saying if it's used for different purposes at different times, so it, it seems like it's going beyond what was previous there. It's quite an expansion um, of, of interpretation, I guess. So again, again, I still think it's pretty open-ended. Uh, I, I think you're, I think the different times, if there was a different word you could write there, I think the issue is multi multi-purpose rooms is, is how do you define a multi, it, 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 there, I mean, the one question is, do you wanna add a multi-purpose room to the space by space? That's kind of a catch-all. Um, and to answer your earlier question about lobby use for artwork, um, the, the downside is once they start claiming it's some other type of space, it often triggers um, life safety or other issues. So I, again, I think there's a deterrent for them to claim that it's actually some other space because then that can open them up to um, egress or other challenges that they don't wanna to have to deal with. I, I still think this is a, a small thing. I can understand your concern about the, the soft wording of different times. I don't have a better suggestion at the moment though. I apologize. CJ. Yeah, I think that this could be wordsmithed a little bit better for the actual sentence. Um, and I would be willing to tackle that during a break. Okay, I, I was just thinking if you just struck out if an entire space has multiple functions to hide it, that might be better language. But um, CJ, if you're taking on this this break time task. Um, it might be better to just do it now so we don't have to keep coming back to it. Uh, my, yeah. my issue is actually, I don't think the word should be in there. I think it should be may be used, not should be used. Right here? At the very end, yes. Yeah, can or could, I, I don't know. What's the better code word? We, we never shall. say may, we say it is permitted to be. Or shall be. <laughs> shall be is, is mandatory, but I think you're looking for is permitted to be, right? Yes, I would agree. Okay. What about striking out this? Because I, I don't see how this, this really adds a whole lot to it. Doesn't that kind of contradict the language in the sentence before that if 20% of this, you know, that you can break up a space into different use types? Or I guess the entire space, but. I think the word types at the end should be singular instead of plural. Mike Feller. Uh, the what I was going to suggest uh, tagging onto my earlier comment was if that might say uh, if the space has multiple functions, the dominant use uh, shall be 
or is permitted to be used? Well, I think the goal of this proposal, I would, I would say, is the highest one, not the dominant one. And I, I, I don't understand know and agree, but I'm just proposing what um, the, what, what it's going to be used for the majority of the time or the, the most use, have that be the one that governs rather than the highest. So as a, I'm just making a suggestion, it can be a, a, a received or not received, I'm fine. Okay, is, is, is dominant a code, a word that, that we can, that a code official can interpret? Uh, primary is more typical than dominant. Okay. Primary use, CJ. Yeah, I actually think that this is to try to deal with the situations where the dominant or the primary use, sure, means that you need to design for something. It's just that, yeah, 10 times out of the year, you're going to need to have lighting serve a different function and they want to be able to put in a layer that serves that. So it doesn't work from our, my perspective to use the term dominant. Sorry, Mike, I just... Uh, I think that this is actually intended to be the, and I don't like the word highest either. I think that that gives a different, I think it alludes to the notion that you can try to give yourself an out. I think you could say, um, uh, one may use a higher, uh, the, a lighting power allowance suitable to the use of the space, to the, to the a function, I don't know. Here's where I wanted to wordsmith it because I felt like there were a few things in here that were trigger points. Um, why don't I go ahead and just do that during a break? Okay, that sounds good. And then I think we'll, I guess, I guess there, I see two camps in, that have spoken so far. One camp that says the primary use is the one that should be permitted to be used. Um, and the other camp says even a, a non-primary use, you could use the LPD from that. Uh, section. Um, and CJ, I know which camp you're in. And um, I guess if you spend all this time wordsmithing it, I, I don't want to then get voted down simply because most people actually just don't agree with that intent at all. Um, but, oh, but why don't you, why don't you do that? And then we'll, um, then we'll look at this later. I think that's actually a really good, good way forward. Okay, Lighting Controls LLLC 124. This is a Mike Kennedy proposal. So I'm not sure. Um, we're not really done. I'm not really done with kind of resolving the differences here. I did just send you a file, Krista. Um, that's a little bit of a mess um, that tries to integrate um, Dwayne's proposal to require open offices to have um, enhanced lighting control or LLLC and my proposal to move the LLLC language and then um, respond to the tag um, desire to have better trim language. Um, and so this kind of common document that I just sent, it's not on the screen. Um, maybe it hasn't popped into my inbox yet. Hmm. Uh, let's see, should I send it to you personally as opposed to SBCC? Oh, did you send it to the SBCC one? Let me go into that mailbox. Sorry. And it's not in that one either. <laughs> hmm. Well, I'll try one more time. Well, lucky for us, we have another LLC, LLLC um, proposal to consider. Um, and this is a Duane one. Right. Uh, this is. <laughs> well, the plan is that I will withdraw my LLC and open office. 
And so I'll, I'll do that. And then we'll be at adopting language that's kind of merges all these ideas. Okay, so you're saying 124 will be withdrawn. With withdrawn, 178 will contains the intent or whatever of, of 124. And as well as the relocation, LLOC. 126. Okay. Um, and um, yeah, so this section, just to review that Dwayne's proposal, these bottom two sections are unchanged. Um, the ones that are on the screen now. Um, and then if you scroll to the top, um, what's changed, actually this whole section changes because the LLC relocation relocates LLC to its own section. And then, did you get the language yet, Krista? Aha. Uh -huh. um, David Reddy had, um, so basically the change here is all the new requirements move to a new section, which is called uh, advanced lighting control. So Mike, I'm, I'm starting to understand. So if you're withdrawing 124, then we should only look at 178 or why would we need to look at 124? We should only look at this document. It should have everything in it. Okay. So we're, you're, so you're looking, yeah. So we should look at only at 178 or well, this document I just sent, which I had the language to start with that I, I had the word file. I didn't have Dwayne's word file. Okay, so we we do need to look at 124. I, I guess I'm, I'm, I want to see procedurally what, what you're hoping, what you and Duane are hoping to do. Should we just look at 178 or should we also? I, I think at... the problem here is the, that this document, the language, the code language in this document is what we want to look at. Okay. It probably needs to be in Duane's proposal. Well, we could adopt the language in 124, and then when we look at 178, you know, not adopt any language in 178 that would overwrite what we just adopted in 124. Okay, this that, this, that has, do? this has everything in 178. Oh, this oh, this right. has this should have everything in it. <laughs> okay, so actually, we we might withdraw 178 and do 124 instead. I suppose we could do that, yes. But the Dwayne. tag had expressed the interest to go forward with Dwayne's idea of having LLC and uh, enhanced controls an option in Open Office, um, and that this document has that. So, Dwayne, how do you feel about that? Yeah, I I want. Uh, I'm, I'm in agreement that this consolidated document is the way to go. And I think was, was your come to some kind of kumbaya and, and uh, uh, which, whichever one it's going forward under, I'd like Mike to continue leading the discussion. Okay, so. And just to jump in real quick, I thought the description of your word file, Mike Kennedy, where it says at the very end, 124 with be withdrawn this it was already already had on the screen it's scrolling past it <laughs> um where it's at the very top where it says brief description yeah 124 will be withdrawn but then at the beginning of that description okay. paragraph this merges 126 with 178 so that's where i think I thought, to me that summarized it very well i just wanted to point it out right and i'm glad to if bureaucratically we need to swap the 124 and the 178 I'm happy to do that in this description. Um, and then yes, I guess Dwayne would withdraw 178 and 124 would go forward. I, I was just trying to get language that got, got the language of the intent of the, all the proposals. Okay, um, why don't we then, if it's okay with Dwayne and then why don't we just consider 124 and if that passes, then we'll, we'll accept with, Withdrawals from 178 and 126. Good. So, um, sorry for the confusion. So this 
this section, uh, part of the LLC um, relocation, um, all the LLC language goes away and go, it does, moves to another section um, and in, is just referenced here. Um, in my proposal 124 and Dwayne's proposal 178, we had uh, at the top of 405.2, we had an opening sentence about open office. Um, and David Reddy just thought that was suggested that was really awkward, which I had to agree and hoped we could figure out a way to move it. So that's also moved. It's preserved in Dwayne's form, um, just moved. Um, Dwayne's proposal 178 had this uh, change to exception two to lower the egress illumination to 0.1 watts. Um, and that's maintained in this document. And then in the next screen, um, this new added um, item five, which is really just kind of a reminder that uh, open plan, you know, within the occupancy sensor control function for open offices, it's kind of a reminder that the controls here also have to comply with this new requirement for enhanced lighting control. Um, so then we go to the, the ugly part here. And I'm sorry for all the colors. I appreciate um, the colors. Okay. I think it's it's good to it offer some clarity to something. Okay. Um, so Everything here that's green or the slate slate color is what it is on my monitor um, is language that has moved. Um, and then stuff that is in. Um... Oh, shit. Um, uh, I'll just back up. So basically this advanced lighting controls is a new section and um, it introduces the, the language that we previously had at the top, which is a contiguous office larger than 5,000 square feet. She'll have one of these two things. Um, it then defines those within their own sections so that they could be referenced by other sections of the code. Um, the idea being that, and if we went to the top, where we allow people to comply with um, comply with the, all the lighting controls LLC, it points to this section of 2.7.1. Um, the luminaire lighting control um, a group went through. Um, there was a desire at the tag to redo the trim language, um, but some of the LLC language um, was changed and that's this stuff that's in the, the I don't know what you call that, the salmon color or the tan color. Ah, yeah, there's a typo up there at the top. But anyway, so this is uh, the maximum eight fixtures is from Dwayne's proposal and the high trim and low trim rather than bright and dim set points um, was added by the work group. Um, so that, this is the LLLC definition. Um, I agree with that change. Krista. I think that, that would be a good change to do. Ah, yes. Okay, so then we have this new section down below, which is the network lighting control and it's it's very fairly close to the enhanced lighting control language that's currently in 406.4. Um, the goal here, and there was some coordination with Reed Hart, who has a proposal on C406, um, that this section would be referenced uh, by C406.4. Um, here, uh, the language that's the change language here is all. Uh, essentially all new changes. Um, some of it are changes in <clears throat> requirements. Um, some of them are kind of a reformatting of item four down here, um, which was deleted. And that basically had this thing of luminaire should be controlled by a digital control system that does all these things. And so some of those now become requirements. Um, and then at the bottom, it's the high-end trim language. So that's the language that's truly new. Um, 
And I had had a one sentence high end trim. Um, in the C406 has a fairly detailed high end trim language. And this, uh, with several people working on it, came up with this language. So this would be the main presentation. Thanks, Mike. We are approaching the 10 o'clock hour, but I think we can spend some time. What are initial thoughts on this combined proposal? I'm interested to hear from CJ. Gibbon likes it. CJ. Uh, okay. <laughs> um, it looks like Mike has found a way to not force us to have to use LLC fixtures because network lighting controls are still allowed. Um, so I've kind of, I, I'm just, I haven't had, I, I'm looking at the network lighting control section because I'll be honest with you, it's going to be a rarity that I get in a job that's going to have the LLC function. So for the network lighting controls, yeah, thanks for scrolling back up. Um, no problem with full range dimming, no problem with monitoring occupant activity, although uh, I want to make sure that we don't have a situation where out of one corner of your eye while you're working, you're seeing the lights turn up and down in an open office environment. So how do we have the language address that? I think that we've been allowed in the past, and correct me if I'm wrong, Dwayne, but occupancy sensors have been forced to be used during non during after hours conditions like during the normal daytime use of an office space we, the code has not mandated that occupancy sensors turn lights on and off and that specifically has been because you don't want to be distracted by the lighting while you're trying to focus on your work so is this now saying that those have to be there regardless i believe so then i uh, wouldn't have, I, wouldn't I don't have. i don't think that anybody has to blink the lights on and off, they'd probably do a controlled um, gradual dimming, right? But um, that's the whole point of having LLLC or the network lighting control is so that when a whole work group from one section of the office goes off to a conference room for a couple hours, that those lights dim down. That's, that's where the energy savings is. So of course that has to be required. Well, I would, I would say that a 5,000 square foot work environment isn't actually that large of a space. Um, and you can definitely see from one side of the space to the other, especially if the lighting that's being controlled is a wall washer. Um, I, I would really like to not have this occupancy part be part of this code. I think that that's the problem that I have. I think I that out of is, your eye, you're going to see that light turn up and down. This is the requirement that's already in the Seattle code, but just much better worded and organized. Uh, that you need to have occupancy act activity during normal business hours? Right. And. I guess we don't have a tag for the Seattle code, so I don't agree with that either. <laughs> CJ, I don't know if you, you're through your final thoughts on this. Um, Andrew's also raised. I'd be interested in the comments on CJ's comments on trim language as well. And any others on NLC. Yeah, the 85%, where did that come from? That way, again, it was the work group thing. I'm, I'm kind of the, I'm not even the secretary. Sean was the, um, did most of the legwork here um, between Reed and Sean. Um, and it was agreed. Reed had the 85% the number. That's in a C406.4 proposal. 
in, in the main C406 thing that Reed Hart is proposing. And uh, Sean wanted to have the, um, based on full light output, uh, output to uh, meet target light levels documented in the sequence, just decided just to or those two so you can do either approach. Okay, I am, um, I'm gonna take my executive privilege here and I think this is gonna attract a lot of discussion and I would like to go to our, our main event and let's come back to this after our main event. Um, so I'm gonna, I would like us to transition to the heat pump water heating uh, proposal. And um, sorry for those of you with hands up, um, I'm just sensing with four hands up that this is not gonna be a five minute discussion. So let's go to the heat pump water heating. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to the proponent in a second. Um, right now, I just wanna remind the group that there are only a few proposals that are gonna get the 19% energy reduction that the legislature has told us we need to get in every cycle between now and 2030. Well, the legislature said where we need to be by 2030 or 2031. Um, if we take a straight line, it's 19% every code cycle between now and then. And this is one of the few proposals that will get us a large percentage of that 19%. Um, so, I, in order to meet the legislative intent, I would strongly encourage everybody to support some part of this. And if you're against it, great, you're against it. Um, but if you're against parts of it, I would hope that you would suggest improvements to the language um, or limitations on it, rather than just say, I'm, I'm completely against it because we're not gonna meet our legislative mandate if we're just wholeheartedly against this and a few other proposals that are, that are gonna get us most of the way there. So with that, um, Johnny, I think you're the proponent. So uh, take it away. Um, thank you so much, Shell. And um, thank you everybody for uh, giving me some time to speak today. I wanted to uh, make sure everyone's aware that uh, yesterday afternoon, we um, submitted a friendly amendment to the heat pump water heating proposal. Um, I worked with uh, Jonathan Heller with Ecotope to uh, submit a friendly amendment to align the proposal with the um, advanced water heating specification that is on NIA's website. Um, so I'll be presenting today on that friendly amendment and um, I'll also be calling on Jonathan to present a little bit um, straight into it. Um, so could you give me the opera, uh, possibility to share my screen for a presentation? Thank you. Can everyone see this? Yep. Thank you. Um, yeah, so uh, just to get straight into it, uh, summary is that we're basically saying we need to heat pump water heaters rather than fossil fuel or electric resistance for all commercial buildings. Um, there are a few exceptions that will be allowed. Um, this is largely based off of what was passed in, um, the summary is largely based off what was passed in Seattle, but um, there are obvious differences with the friendly amendment. Um, so it would apply to all commercial building types and it requires heat pump water heaters to follow NIA's advanced water heating specification. Um, there is an exception for solar thermal waste water heat recovery and other waste heat recovery, ground source heat pump, et cetera. Um, they're permitted to offset a portion of the uh, heat pump water heating capacity as long as it complies with the Washington State Plumbing Code. Um, it also allows for secondary water heating use of electric resistance um, as long as it's there to provide temperature maintenance, defrost of the compressor coils, heat tracing of the piping for freeze protection um, for low ambient temperature conditions, um, 40 degrees Fahrenheit or less. And then there's also an allowance for 24 kilowatts plus 0.1 kilowatts per square foot of building area for standalone buildings. Um, this number was uh, kind of a combination of what was uh, asked in the Seattle code plus um, some conversations that I had with Jonathan Heller around like what would be a good kind of a, for larger buildings, what would be a good allowance for heat pump or for uh, electric resistance water heating. And we can discuss this a little bit in further details in a bit. 
Um, I did some economic modeling. Uh, it was kind of based off of 182,000 square foot, pretty large multifamily building with 173 units. Um, a lot of the assumptions were based off conversations that I had with um, engineers on um, the amount of hot water to be required per unit. And um, we picked this because it would be considered likely a worst case scenario. Um, the baseline was a centralized heat pump water heating system to provide hot water to the whole building. And then we had two alternatives, one which is an electric boiler system and one that was a gas boiler heating system. And getting into the results, unsurprisingly, central electric boiler was pretty crappy. I think it is where we needed to both on operational, on the uh, present value of the utility costs, which was by far the highest, as well as energy use intensity, which was also very high. But our, our central heat pump water heating system, although it had a higher um, first cost and replacement cost, does have about equivalent or slightly lower present value of utility costs over its lifetime. And uh, it saves a lot of energy, uh, about 5.5 kilobt per square foot. Um, just as an example, this is uh, pulled from the uh, technical roadmap by NIA for the Washington State Commercial Energy Code, um, showing like the for a mid-rise apartment a base EUI about 40 from the 20, 2006 code, and and what we need to get to by 2030, which is you know around 17. I do want to flag that the model that I used was not modeling um, using the 2006 baseline for Washington State Energy Code. I don't. Unfortunately, wasn't able to get a budget or have enough time to be able to model that at this point. But just to kind of get an idea of like what type of energy savings we're talking about, a 5.5 kilobt per square foot is quite a bit. Um, and you know, in this example here, it's about 10%. So um, hopefully, it would be something relatively similar if we were to be able to model it compared to a baseline 2006 building. Um, Reason why we're getting such high energy savings is because, sorry about that. Um, heat pump water heaters, because they use heat pump technology are at least twice as efficient and as, as high as 3.5 times as efficient as an electric resistance water heater. Um, and even more compared to a gas water heater, which you know, we'll get uh, efficiencies between 65, 80%, maybe 85% if you're talking about really efficient. So it's just a lot more efficient technology. Um, that's what's gonna get us to our 70% by 2030. So that's why we're um, presenting it today. And this is a straight from the uh, specification for the advanced water, um, advanced water heating specification. So um, this shows the different tiers. And if you actually read the specification for commercial buildings, it, it specifies which tier would be required. Um, so why are the operational costs? Some of you are probably asking that doesn't really feel intuitive why the operational costs would actually be lower over the lifetime. That's because according to the, the um, economic model that the Department of Commerce requires to be used, natural gas prices are likely going to increase 1.6 times by 2070 compared to electricity, which is going to be relatively the same. So, um, not accounting for inflation, we're expecting higher natural gas prices over the lifetime of a building using natural gas for water heating versus electricity. Um, what about capital cost? Uh, this here is uh, from NYSERDA's Carbon Free Buildings Roadmap. Um, there's a lot of information here, and um, you know this isn't set in stone. It's not like we're like really saying this is like definitely going to happen, but there is a lot of opportunity for cost compression of heat pump water heaters. Uh, we're talking as much as 50%, likely we're gonna see you know, something closer to like 10 to 30% cost compression um, between now and 2040, if we're, if we're doing massive heat pump adoption, heat pump water heater adoption nationally. So prices are gonna come down as this technology is, becomes more ubiquitous and this code proposal is gonna be one of the things that actually pushes that. What about renewable natural gas, um, also known as a fossil gas alternative? Um, they're a very small fraction of the gas demand um, from a paper done by Earth Justice and Sierra Club. Uh, we're talking about like 14% natural gas, uh, fossil gas alternatives nationally. 
Um, they're also very costly. Um, I forget the exact number, but it's like seven to 12% more costly, according to that paper. And that's using data from the American Gas Association. And they have a mixed environmental record and they still perpetuate health impacts of combustion inside homes. So not saving the fact that we're gonna be um, likely continuing to cause childhood asthma like symptoms for children that use natural gas, at least natural gas stoves. Um, and uh, here's a graph from that paper showing the amount of fossil gas alternative potential versus the current demand nationally. So we're talking about 31,000 total volume of a total BTU per year of gas demand in 2018 and about 4,500 according to American Gas Foundation's own reports. So not a lot of gas to be used. Um, and then finally, before I hand it over to Jonathan from Ecotope, um, heat pump water heaters can get to temperatures that are able to um, deal with Legionnaire's disease. I know that there were some concerns in Seattle about this. So I wanna kind of correct the record on this. Um, according to ASHRAE handbook, HVAC applications, they're able to reach temperatures up to 140 degrees Fahrenheit. And uh, there's documentation from both the heat pump center as well as USDOE that shows that they can cycle on and off at temperatures that are able to limit the growth of Legionnaire's disease. Um, cool, going to, um, I think we should pass it on to Jonathan from Ecotope before we uh, take any questions. Is that okay with you, Joe? Yes, yeah, go ahead. And then as Jonathan is talking, please raise your hands and I will call on people in the order in which I see them raise their hands, which um, it doesn't show up as logically as it should on my screen. Um, so go ahead, uh, Jonathan. Sure, thanks. Um, I just wanted to uh, have a chance to fill people in on the work that's been happening to bring this technology uh, more, more uh, dominantly into the marketplace. So uh, Bonneville, Nia, um, and uh, Ecotope and some other folks have been leading a commercial heat pump water heating working group within the Advanced Water Heating Initiative with the intent to move this technology from something which requires custom um, engineering in buildings to something that's much more of a plug and play, fully packaged water heating system approach. And we've got five, five of the manufacturers fully engaged in this, uh, in, in this development with the idea that it's modeling the way that the residential heat pump water heaters are delivered to the market, which is a single package, which includes the compressor, the storage tank, the controls, uh, the backup elements, all as a, as a single widget. Um, so the, the intent here is the same, um, bringing, to, bringing the manufacturers to selling water heating systems rather than selling heat pumps. So that uh, a contractor could call a distributor and say, I've got 150 unit apartment building and the distributor would say, okay, here's my solution for that. It's three of these heat pumps, four of these storage tanks, this control package, um, here's the schematic for how it gets piped up in the field. Tell me when you're ready and I'll send somebody out there to help you start it up and commission it and give you a, a warranty and a, and a maintenance contract on it. So um, that is the work that we've been doing with the manufacturers and that is all aligning with the uh, development of the commercial section of the advanced water heating spec. So that to, to what, it's, what it's doing is, is guaranteeing reliable and repeatable results. So if you do it like this every time, um, we can expect similar results. And so the, the manufacturers will submit their tested performance maps for, for their uh, heat pumps, uh, their, their uh, schematic or, uh, for how to use their heat pump in a um, commercial water heating system, the controls package, the warranty, the verification that it's UL listed, um, et cetera, to, to get onto the qualified products list. Um, and then those products based on the, the heat pump technology, the climate, the design, 
uh, configuration, the, the integration of backup, um, we'll, drop, we'll put it into a tier level based on total uh, system COP. And the system COP includes the energy required to heat the water up that's coming into the building, plus the energy that's required to maintain that water hot in the temperature maintenance distribution system throughout the building. So a tier one product in the Seattle climate will be expected to achieve a average annual system COP of 2.0 or better. A tier two product will be 2.5, a tier three product will be 3.0, et cetera. Um, so this, this provides a way to, to really widgetize the commercial systems to align the way that the manufacturers are bringing them to the marketplace and to uh, provide codes and programs a way to, uh, to re get reliable, repeatable results and to treat different systems, to give different credit to systems that are achieving higher performance. All right, thanks, Jonathan. Um, I am gonna start calling on people. Um, I think this will get a lot of attention. So Gary. Hey, um, thanks, Joe, appreciate it. Um, I'll be speaking in, in opposition to this proposal. Um, you know, this will prescriptively mandate really only one choice uh, for uh, commercial buildings. Uh, it will eliminate the option for using highly efficient and cost-effective options, including, including uh, gas water heating options. Um, it, it will uh, preclude um, any uh, consideration of advancements and in innovative uh, technologies uh, for the use of natural gas. Um, I'm uh, concerned about, um, also concerned about uh, the electric resistance um, exceptions. Um, I think that sometimes electric resistance will be allowed as a backup, um, especially during lower ambient conditions when uh, it's very likely that the electric system will be peaking already um, and actually result in increased emissions uh, rather than decreased emissions. Um, and I really call in the question the ability uh, for a heat pump water heater system on, on uh, for example, say uh, hotels or, or restaurants and being able to handle the larger loads uh, from those. And, and uh, so I really question the ability uh, of those systems uh, to do that. Um, in the uh, proposed impact data sheet, uh, the average cost is going to be $250 or $2.50 per square foot. That's a significant cost increase. And I believe in the end, those will um, hit disproportionately um, small business, low income housing, They're really bringing into question some issues of, of social equity. Um, so I, I just see a, a lot of problems with this uh, particular proposal. It's, it's not ready for prime time. And, and I will um, differ with the chair's uh, assertion that, that uh, one of the only ways to get to 70% is, is by utilizing uh, heat pump water heaters. Uh, I do believe that uh, we can get there uh, by continuing to allow the use of of natural gas water heating technologies uh, that will continue to advance uh, also. So those are, um, and I might just also uh, mention a couple of things in the, in the presentation uh, uh, by um, uh, RMI uh, the proposal. Um, really, uh, although I don't have numbers in front of me right now, I would really challenge the assertions on the RNG potential uh, it is much higher uh, than what's shown there, um, and how natural gas prices will be increasing as compared to electricity prices. Um, if systems are start, uh, starting to be electrified, um, I do not believe that, that those projections on electricity costs 
uh, take into account um, the significant increase in electrical load um, if proposals like this go forward. So um, thanks for the time. Those are, the, uh, those are my comments. Thanks, Gary. Um, just to your, your question about uh, what I said about how to get from here to there. Um, I'm always interested in how other people think we can get to a 70% energy use reduction. And um, in just reviewing all the proposals I saw for this cycle, um, I didn't see other paths to get to the 19% energy reduction. I would love to hear uh, what proposals you would accept that would get us to that 19% proposal, 19% uh, uh, requirement. Um, I'm gonna call on other people, but I'd like you to, th to think about and perhaps respond to how we can get there um, maybe later in the discussion with the proposals that we have in hand or modifications to those proposals that we have um, at this point. Um, so next I have Sean, Sean Dennison. Thank you, Sean Dennison from New Buildings Institute. And we definitely support this direction for the Washington Code. Uh, we've been a big part of the water heating initiative and we've seen a tremendous amount of work there. I uh, want to emphasize that heat pump water heating has been part of NBI's multifamily guide since 2017 as a recommended practice. You know, so this is not kind of as new and novel as it is sometimes uh, played out to be. It's also included in uh, the ASHRAE design guide for low to mid-rise multifamily. Um, so this is a widely accepted practice. I think the only thing that I would say about this proposal itself is that the term central water heating system is not defined and could create some confusion when it's adopted. Uh, the original language that this is replacing talks about high input. So I think maybe a little bit of wordsmithing there to either define what a central water heating system is or to use the capacity threshold that's in the exception to define um, when this actually applies would help with understandability. Um, but I mean, that's that's a minor wording issue. I, I don't think that that's something that should really hold this up. Uh, if, if the tag feels that some of the issues that have been raised are serious enough that this proposal as it is cannot or largely make it through, I think keeping, it's, I think it's really important to keep the fundamental push of this proposal through, which is that primary water heating with heat pump water heaters is certainly ready for code. And if you have concerns about some of these fringe cases or backup, to address those separately and not to throw the whole thing out. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Sean. And I'm just going to note that your your audio was not great. Um, I was able to understand what you said, but um, I don't know if everybody was. So I think we might have had this issue last 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 time as well. Um, Eric Vandermeer. Uh, thanks, Joel. I guess I'll, I'll start out with my comment saying I think that this proposal definitely needs a technical committee to review technical language to make sure we get it right. Um, I'll start out today with a, a bunch of technical comments about the language. Um, so, it, but uh, there, there are quite a few loopholes that I'm seeing right now. And, and so I would like to, to definitely address those along the way. Um, I'll re reiterate that, yeah, the, and again, I haven't seen the latest version of this. Um, so my comments are more based on what was posted, I guess, and linked in the meeting, um, maybe the original proposal. So um, anyways, so it looks like some of that may have been cleaned up already. Um, okay. But uh, so this says service water, water heating shall not use fossil fuel. Okay, so it's much broader language than what was originally pro proposed. Um, and then we have an exception, I guess, for, I guess, when was this one post, po po posted? Was this posted? I should have reviewed this one. I think this was last night or this morning that it was posted. Oh, okay. Last night at about five o'clock, I think, 5.30. Okay, well, apologies for that. I, I was uh, kind of had a ninth, ninth inning friendly amendment um, after Johnny, Jonathan. Johnny, could you just highlight the, were there just like a small number of changes made? 
And could you highlight those? I, um, or, let me, or, let me explain some of that. Yeah. So um, the intent with this uh, amendment was to take the sections that were written in code that are covered in the advanced water heating spec and refer to the advanced water heating spec rather than trying to define all of the sizing criteria and the, um, the mixing valve and, and things like that that were that really um, to make sure that it aligns with the way that the manufacturers are bringing their product to market and the way that the advanced water heating spec has already uh, defined those criteria in a similar way that, that the Washington State Residential Code points to the advanced water heating spec for the residential products, the commercial code can point to the spec for the, for the commercial products. And, and Eric, I agree with you that there were several loopholes in that original language, which also is why um, I think this makes sense to, uh, to point to the advanced water heating spec rather than um, have a lot of confusing language within the code itself. Okay, thanks, Jonathan. So that, that was the change that, that occurred. Okay, so to align with, with a standard um, more robustly. Okay, go ahead, Eric. Okay, yeah, so I guess I'll tailor my comments to, yeah, I think we'll, we'll need to look, work on some of these exceptions um, to figure this out. Um, so yeah, it looks like this is much, this, this one, this version now no longer can't, contains the central water heating system uh, language at the beginning, I think. Uh, so, so that is a good change. Um, the supplemental heaters, uh, you know, is, is better written in, in the sense that in how that's written. Um, I, I think there are a number of exceptions that we could talk about um, needing for, um, you know, kitchen booster heaters or, or other things like that, that um, process uh, booster heaters. So there's maybe an exception that we'd want to build around that. Mm -hmm. um, for, for things like water wash hoods or, or dishwashers that have to get up to you know, 180 degrees for, for disinfection, uh, for um, other standards. Um, so yeah, I think this is much broader language um, and very different than the original proposal. Um, so again, I th think we should just have a, a very good technical review of how that's gonna, how this is gonna be worded, so. Um, thanks. Does a proponent um, understand what Eric was saying? I guess I guess Eric is also suggesting that we have a, a working group, a subgroup that that works through some of the languages. That what you're suggesting, Eric? Well, I mean, this new proposal is much simpler than the old one, but nobody's had a chance to look at it yet. So um, it, it's a very different proposal. So yeah. Okay. And I'm not. <laughs> I guess. Uh, probably precludes voting on this today, uh, but I think today we'll be finding where there's a consensus and agreement and where there are differences and also what areas of this are, are weaker or stronger and um, the questions that, so that we can address this at a future tag and vote on it. Yeah, and I, I, I think there is the question whether this code cycle, you know, natural gas could be used to, uh, as a sample, supplemental water heating source. So that, that is potentially a, a minority position that, that could be, um, you know, we could have two concurrent proposals, you know, that one that doesn't allow electric or one that doesn't allow natural gas backup and a second, you know, proposal that is going through that, that would allow natural gas backup to the, the primary, so. Anyways, th there's different ways that this could go through uh, the tag and and state process um, to get greater outreach and public comment. Um, so, thanks, Eric. Um, I have Kurt Wright as the next person who raised their hand. Yeah, so I've been asked to to uh, address this kind of from the angle of the commercial real estate developers. Um, there was a comment earlier and the present proponent mentioned 80% efficiency on gas water heaters. 
That's that's old technology. We have 98% efficient condensing boilers now. 98% efficient. When you look at the COP on electric heat pump water heaters, it is the the low end of it is 2.0. When you look at the source of the power, the energy production, uh, often it's hydroelectric or coal-fired plants. They run at 33% efficiency. So what you're doing is, okay, you have a COP of 2.0. So let's double that, 66% when you're pulling from, from a power plant versus 98% efficiency on a condensing boiler. Um, the next thing I'd like to address is, is the cost, the cost to the developer. The recent project uh, we studied was an, it was an ad of $1.4 million to go to heat pump technology. Um, and yet our tag group is, <clears throat> is according to what Washington State Technical Advisory Group guidelines, we are to identify proposed changes that may have an impact, economic impact on small businesses, housing affordability, construction costs, life cycle costs, or the cost of code enforcement to report reported to the work group economic impact. It was earlier mentioned, uh, this impacts housing affordability without question. Uh, not just an R1 and R2, but also in commercial development of, of other occupancies. This is a heavy cost impact on development. That cannot be denied. The next point I, I go to, and I just have a couple more. This addresses heat pump water heaters. And then you and have at some point. This addresses heat pump water heaters in central systems. Central systems. There is an exception, exception six, that says standalone electric water heaters serving single zones not served by the central water heating system can be electric. What this is gonna do on multifamily is cause each apartment, the commercial real estate developers will go to a non-central system where each apartment will have its own say 40 gallon electric water heater and that from the water heater to the final run to the fixture will be uninsulated according to the energy code. So what you're gonna have is an apartment building with 500 units and 540 gallon electric water heaters. That's, that's what you're gonna to go to. They're, they're not gonna to go to a central heat pump water heating system uh, because it's cost prohibitive. It takes too much, no pun intended, real estate it takes more structural reinforcing for the large volumes of storage. One other thought is that this compression of costs on heat pump water heaters that's projected is just a projection. It's not what we see today. We're, we're dealing with a market with real-time costs today. The, on the other hand, as people do start implementing heat pump water heaters, electric heat pump water heaters, you're gonna see gas demand go down. So the projection of the 140 or 60% increase over the years, no, it's supply and demand. We all know that it's basic economics. As gas demand goes down, implementing heat pump water heaters, so will gas costs go down and finally, there, there is a reference in this to a standard, the Northwest Energy Efficiency Alliance Advanced Water Heater Specifications. It allows for systems meeting that standard. That standard is not complete and not published. 
why are we writing legislation referencing standards that are not even published? And uh, so, so the commercial real estate market, you ask for a solution. The solution we suggest is put this, put this into the point system. Rather than making it descriptive with no wiggle room out, put this into the point system. Whereas you, you know, we know what that is. It's one of the options. Rather than eliminating it from the point system, which is the way Seattle has done it, put it into the point system where that the commercial real estate developer can, can look at different options, six, eight, ten options, and choose the ones that make the most sense for the facility specifically. I oppose to heat pump water heaters, absolutely not. But they have their place and their place is not every commercial development as this is written. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I guess um, my initial thought is just one reaction is that we, we have adopted standards that are not yet finalized before. Um, that doesn't mean it's a, a good idea in, in necessarily, but we have done that before. Um, and I guess the other one is, are you, are you hoping none of this goes through except in C406 or are there certain typologies that you think this is a good idea for? Yes, that, that was my point, is <clears throat> I made it very clear, I'm not opposed to heat pump water heaters. I, I appreciate the efficiency. Um, of course, when you compare it to the efficiency of the power source, which in coal plants is 33%, you're not, what, what are you really achieving? Um, compared to a 98% condensing boiler, no, I'm not opposed to heat pump water heaters. They have their place, as I said, but it should be up to the individual. It should not be prescriptive. In other words, the individual project development, where it makes sense, use them. Where it's not practical and it's more efficient to use gas-fired, maybe even gas-fired backup on heat pump water heaters, use that technology. In other words, let the let the commercial developer figure out the most cost effective and efficient means of generating hot water and not stipulating one way only again what you're driving people to do what you're going to drive development to do is on a 500 unit apartment house put in 540 gallon water heaters and we all know that is not energy efficient, but that is the loophole we have here. I, I appreciate that. Thanks. That's that's great um, input. I, I am going to say that I think our last coal-fired power plant is being retired very, very soon. So um, the, the power mix that we have available is majority hydro, and then there's a, a lots of other things that include gas and um, nuclear and, and other things. But we won't have any coal um, in this state really soon so yes but i i gotta say uh, who wants hydro who wants hydro in the northwest that's another discussion yeah okay um thank you we'll go to um i think chris burrows was next hey shell yeah um so from PSE, I just had a, a couple things moving my hand down. Um, so first of all, I just let you know, I've worked with heat pump water heaters for the past six years of my life. I've been dedicated to getting these things installed. So I have a fairly, fairly extensive knowledge of heat pump water heaters and really like them. I think in the right application, they are a great uh, solution in, in the right application. The problem that we have found over and over again, working with NIA and every year, I've worked with NIA where we come back and we haven't installed as many heat pump water heaters as we wanted to. And we always have to research why. And it's always because the installation is really difficult. There's a, there's a lot, of in, lot, lot of stuff that you have to think about when you're, when you're installing a heat pump water heater um, that increase costs, increase time um, for their installation. And so I guess that brings up my, my second concern, uh, which is the price. Uh, I with looking out for our customers uh, at PSE, the increased cost of this in large, maybe large develop, large developers, Amazon, you know, they can afford this just fine. But when you're talking about 
smaller, uh, small businesses, it seems like this puts an undue burden on small businesses, especially at a time when they're still, pro they're still going to be recovering from what we just went through with this pandemic that hit the restaurant industry really hard. I think we should really think hard about affecting small businesses in, at this time. And then the other point I had is it's really hard to talk, speak on a proposal that I don't have, that I haven't had a chance to review. So that would have been nice to be able to review it before we came and talked today. But thanks. And thank you, Johnny, for uh, submitting. I appreciate appreciate you. So Chris, I'm um, always trying to make this, this better and take everybody's viewpoints into consideration. It sounded like you were, one of your points was about the size of projects. Um, Just, and, yeah. So, affecting small businesses, yeah. Go so, ahead. I guess if there's a, a building size, is is that maybe something that you're suggesting? Is that maybe buildings under? Maybe I mean, that'd be something I'd probably something. want to talk to more of my our specific engineers at PSC about that. But I, I mean, I kind of I think what uh, what we heard before going to a technical committee and having having some of these discussions, I would love to be a part of that. Um, and, and like I said, I do think heat pump water heaters are a good solution in the right in the right situations. Okay. All right, thanks. Next, I have Chris Haas. Uh, thank you, that's, that's Chris Haas with uh, UA Local 32. Um, I'll give you a quick perspective as a, a technician uh, who works on these systems once they're installed. Uh, there's been a lot of issues with, with uh, large scale uh, heat pump water heater systems, reverse cycle chiller applications for central plant, uh, where they have not been able to achieve the, uh, the recovery rate and do fall into the Legionnaire danger area, especially under low load conditions. The solution um, from manufacturers is to install electric heaters on the air side coils to add uh, heat back into the heat pump loop when it, the temperatures fall below um, you know, you know, 40 degrees. So this, is, this was the, the solution for multiple manufacturers on mul multiple job sites. So large plant uh, heat pump technology isn't quite there yet. Uh, it's gonna be an issue moving forward for the, for the next several years. For small single point use systems, uh, single family homes, uh, small residential, um, you know, the single point use uh, heat pump systems, that technology is there. Uh, CO2 based uh, uh, systems uh, using CO2 as a refrigerant source. Those systems are highly efficient, work excellent down to low temperatures and are good, are good products. But for large scale commercial use for central plant water heating, uh, in my experience, the technology just isn't quite there. I think we're a little bit ahead of, ahead of schedule. Um, I'll, I'll echo what uh, Mr. Cartwright said with 98% boilers. We haven't installed 80% boilers in a decade. 98% uh, condensed, condensing boilers are all that uh, have been installed for the last 10 years. They're highly efficient. Uh, they work great and they have a low, uh, low initial installation cost. Central plant uh, heat pump systems generally cost five times more than a, a boiler system, adds tremendous amount of cost to, to the building construction. Uh, they also occupy a much greater mechanical space and this eats up on the, uh, the ability of the building owner to lease uh, a tenant space. In a multifamily structure, this is less units per square foot and then drives up the actual rent cost to having a direct effect on on uh, housing prices within the, you know, within the county. So uh, that's been my experience, my two cents. So hopefully it's been helpful. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Um, from Chris B's comments, uh, it sounded like uh, maybe from a small business perspective, accepting smaller projects, but I hear the opposite from you where the larger projects and when you say larger projects, you're talking 100,000 square feet and up, or, or is there some range that you're you're thinking of when you say large projects? Yeah, you're getting into multi-units um, uh, structures, uh, hotel size structures, 100 unit and up, anywhere where you have to do a central plant water heating system, um, where it's not efficient or economical to do single point. 
um, water heating systems, which generally will end up being small gallon, low wattage uh, uh, heat pump or uh, um, electric resistant heat systems in individual spaces um, as plant systems tend to be, you know, heat pump plant systems still tend to be problematic. Okay, thanks. I have Julie B as next. Hi, um, my name is Julie Banerjee, and I've been asked to speak uh, on behalf of City Light's role in the TAG. Uh, and we support the direction of the code and the fundamental push towards reducing carbon. We've seen multiple projects successfully incorporate centralized heat pump water heating systems in multifamily affordable housing projects with limited life cycle cost increases. And we've seen the progress that's being made to bring these systems mainstream. We do want to acknowledge that for the proposal we reviewed, uh, not the one from 5 p.m., but the one prior, we're concerned about unintended impacts of the way that it's being proposed uh, and believe that heat pump water heating in some cases is still an emerging technology based on building type and other considerations. So we would like to take this proposal forward uh, through either a technical working group or an additional working group to review and possibly review some of the considerations we've heard today as well that make uh, the nuances of the technology and how they should be implemented into a mandate under consideration. Thanks, Julie. Um, I think there's general consensus that, that you know, we're not going to vote on this today and that we need some more review. And I think the only challenge will be making sure we don't have a quorum of the tag in that review um, so that we don't. This is not an, an official, I guess, needs to be a public meeting at that point, which requires its own set of things. Mike Kennedy is next. Yeah, thanks. I had a, a few comments, um, I guess not pro or against this, um, more just concerns about the language. Um, one, several people have talked about the impact of this related to, I guess, small projects, small commercial. And it would be really helpful to me if the, um, I, I guess I'm a little confused about the supplemental water heater threshold. Um, and the 0.1 kW per square foot, which seems like a very large number, um, and wonder whether that's supposed to be watts per square foot. Um, but it, if there are, I guess I'm, I'm a little confused whether that applies, like if, if you have less than that amount of water heat, whether you need to do the heat pump um, or you always have to do the heat pump, I guess I'd like that clarified. On the, um, Link to, you know, linking this to a, a NIA specification. Um, I actually went and looked at this link and there's three documents that are shown. There's residential and commercial, or I, there's a couple of them. I don't know, there's electric and gas. And then if you go into one, there's three or four sections in there. And it seems like the specification has to be a lot more specific um, you know, like section three of this document and probably needs version numbers. Um, and then I also have concerns about the, the document itself uses terminology that's different than the code terminology. It refers to IECC zones, not Washington state zones. Um, it refers to the word residential, but not quite in the context that Washington would use it. So it seems like there needs to be a lot more um, a, a bridge built to that spec from within the code if we're gonna lean on it, um, including version numbers um, so we can know what we're talking about. So that's it. Thanks, Mike. Do, I guess Johnny or, or Jonathan have, um, was the 0.1 kW per square foot the, the intended thing? No, Mike uh, Kennedy is correct. It's that's Watts, not K Dub. Thank you, Mike. Um, I will comment on the on the version number comment. The intent with the pointing to the spec is that it allows for uh, manufacturers that are continuing to develop products and bring them into the marketplace 
to add those to the spec and and update the spec as as time goes on and new products come uh, into the marketplace that meet the the basic requirements of the spec. So I would uh, argue against referring to a, a specific version because that's a it's a a growing uh, body of of uh, products. Uh, but I, I do agree that it could be more clear to point to the just the commercial section. And could could you clarify just uh, and I, I think I maybe you're requiring heat pump water heater heaters here in all cases or is this 24 kW some kind of threshold? That's that's to allow for buildings that don't have much of a d domestic hot water load at all. They could just put in an electric water heater or or two or three or four. 24 kW gets you about four residential electric hot water heaters scattered around a an office building, for example. So the janitor closet could have a little electric water heater. The kitchenettes could have that. Um, so it th that is put in there for specifically for buildings that just don't have a big need for that. So, and also, so also to allow for things. Me. Also to allow for things like a school, which might have a a deluge shower that has to have a water heater that you don't want to hook up to the primary water heating system. So right. Should that exception be in the section above 404.2.1? Because it's described as supplemental water heat, which is a little confusing. Okay, yeah. Um, and That's I, a good idea. It would be really useful for me. Um, I, you know, I, I'm, I just tried to do a back of the envelope and gave up, but it would be really kind of convenient to have a, a little cheat sheet on the proposer's guesstimate of building size that that threshold would trigger. Like 24 kW, I think is a pretty big office building. Um, the potential. Yeah. And, and it could be used by a single restaurant, you know, if, if there's just one restaurant and they want to use electric resistance, 24 k is probably enough for a restaurant. Uh, so is it a good idea? Maybe you're arguing that it's too big. I don't know. No, I, I guess it's just to the extent that people are concerned about the economic impact of this in small projects. It seems like having some, some idea of kind of what size thresholds we're talking about. Um, in the real world might be kind of convenient by building type. I mean, obviously it's gonna hit most multifamily, but. Right, but but you're absolutely right. A lot of small buildings would not need to have a heat pump water heater in, in this uh, in this proposal because of that 24 kW uh, ex exception. Cool, thanks. Okay, so we all already have a bit of a small building exception in there. That's, that's good to hear. Um, next, I have uh, Rand C. Rand Kronger. Go for it. Yeah, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah, I just, um, just wanted to make a comment. Um, we've been working in the um, installation and you know, selling essentially our source or air source heat pumps for domestic hot water heating. Uh, for many years now. I think our first installation was somewhere around 2012 or something like that. Um, certainly there's been, you know, some learning curves along the way, um, but uh, and I've heard a lot of concerns in general and I won't necessarily um, refer to any in particular, but concerns about this technology, you know, not being ready for the big time. Um, it's been a pretty major uh, portion of what my company has been doing over the last, let's call it eight years or so. Um, it's, it's something that, yes, certainly there are uh, some learning curves in terms of application. There's been some development in the product. Um, but I don't, I don't really necessarily see the technical um, concerns or issues that, um, you know, maybe five years ago, we would have been concerned about. The, the products are, are better now. There's more products entering the industry all the time. Um, as long as these things are applied correctly, which is the big, the big uh, um, concern. And, and a lot of what I see in the code um, is sort of structured to 
help these things be applied correctly. Um, you know, they're, they're reliable and they're, they're, um, you know, useful and, and, you know, present safe, um, operation. So I just, just because I had heard, um, several concerns from the standpoint of, Hey, we don't think these things are ready, um, for the big time yet. Um, I just wanted to throw in my two cents to say that, that, you know, the, the, the technology as I see it is one that, that um, we have a lot of faith in, um, have seen applied successfully multiple times. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's not the black box or the, the um, scary future technology that I think a lot of people may perceive it to be. Thanks, Rand. And what size of projects or what types of projects are you working on to install these things? Yeah, for, for the most part, they've been uh, multifamily um, and um, we've done low income type multifamily and, and, and other type multifamily jobs. Um, there's, you know, we have several competitors out in the market um, who kind of tend to get slightly different sizes, uh, but, you know, essentially where the, where the, um, uh, the main driver has been in the in the products that have, uh, or in the in the projects I should say that have high um, domestic hot water loads, and those tend to be um, residential applications. And a lot of a lot of mixed use too, um, where you will have, um, say, a multifamily with restaurants or something, et cetera, in the in the podium of a building or et cetera. Okay, and um, are there building types that you would suggest these are not appropriate for um, based on your, because this, this proposal covers lots of typologies and, and there's- Correct, been correct, correct. yeah. Uh, it, in, from the standpoint of, you know, you know, let's, let's just look at it, you know, bang for the buck, right? Um, you know, there's, you know, an office building or something that's got a very low um, uh, domestic hot water demand um, you know, you may not get as much benefit for the cost that you would um, from a, you know, uh, you know, residential building, a like a um, squirt, sports complex with showers or someplace like that where you where you have um, large energy use um, in the domestic hot water. So, um, you know, there's there's some places where at least from the standpoint of trying to make a big impact to, you know, the the energy use or the carbon use of a, of a city, um, you know, you're just not going to get as much bang for your buck for those those low intensity type applications. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, move on to John Frankel. Hello, thank you. Um, I want to make a proposal based on uh, what has been identified as this incremental cost associated with this proposal. Uh, the economic impact data sheet uh, does indicate there would be an average uh, net present uh, value uh, additional cost of about 250 a square foot, which is significant. Um, we, uh, we've kind of briefly mentioned, a few people have mentioned that, uh, that there would be an impact on small business. And, and we think about kind of uh, what kind of a barrier that creates for small business. We are uh, essentially describing uh, a greater impact that will be uh, placed on people of color, low-income renters, frontline communities, uh, particularly when we look at the fact that the paybacks that are associated with this are probably uh, likely best at the high volume usage that uh, has been described in a couple of the projects in the proposal, uh, that the, the payback will likely be very, very long or completely uh, uneconomic uh, for small business. So my suggestion, a proposal would be that, uh, uh, that we create an, equi uh, an equity impact statement for this proposal that really does examine uh, what that cost is gonna be to the frontline communities the people that we think are gonna be most uh, negatively impacted by this additional cost. Um, and, uh, and that should consider um, really the, the, the usages across the spectrum from high use to low use.
that sounds a good idea like a good idea i would love to hear best how to do that um but i think that's that's great it's it's important to yeah it's important to con for all those considerations so thanks john um uh Rand and Chris Haas, you still have your hands up. I don't know if you have anything more to say, but I'm going to call on Mark Rayleigh next. Hey, thanks, Joe. Um, so I'm Mark Rayleigh. I work for the uh, Northwest Energy Efficiency Alliance. So uh, we're, we're the ones that have the advanced water heating specification that's referred to in this. And I thought I'd make a few comments regarding that specification and kind of our overall position on, on water heating. Um, so first off, I'll just start to say, uh, we support all forms of heat, of wa of heat pump water heaters. Uh, and that includes both electric and natural gas fired water heaters. Um, and in commercial applications, both products are available in the market and represent uh, an improvement in efficiency over the, the baseline electric resistance or, um, or boilers. Uh, so we'd like to see something uh, to that effect here um, to reflect that there's um, there are products on both sides. Both both fuels have uh, solutions there. The uh, the other comment is I, I just want to just differentiate between the um, the work that's been done on what I would call unitary residential water heaters and um, actually until version eight of our advanced water heating specification, uh, that specification was entirely dedicated to just those unitary uh, residential products. And we have decades worth of experience with those and uh, lots of field research, lab research, many, many manufacturers and, uh, and a really impressive, I would say, uh, progression from the early days when uh, when the products barely meet, met a COP of two to today where we have products that are upwards of a COP of four. Um, and the reason I mention that is because the, on the commercial and the large scale, while there are products, I would say we're still, still fairly early in the uh, proving out those products and the progression, I think that's still an area of active research and an active uh, market development for those products um, to improve. And so I think having some flexibility in here to reflect that yes, they are gonna improve over time. And I, and I think that's true both on the gas and, and the uh, electric heat pump versions. So not, not trying to restrict um, or, or uh, prevent improvement in the future. Um, and then the third point I'd say is we have some data on these systems, but not a lot. Um, actually, the research that Nia's done so far, we probably have an equal amount of information on natural gas heat pumps as we do on uh, electric, large-scale electric heat pumps. So, um, so there's still research to be done there, um, especially around um, how they perform across the full temperature range and how um, uh, whether they can deliver uh, well, we know what they can, but to, to, to make sure that they deliver the um, equivalent amount of hot water as required uh, across, across the full ambient ranges that they might operate in. And then finally, I just want to, I, I want to, I'd love to hear a little bit more discussion about the practices that go along with these systems and whether there needs to be some additional safeguards added. Uh, in the case of residential, um, I think uh, I, heard, I heard a comment that these are difficult to install. Actually, the residentials are very easy. Uh, it does add a couple of things like a condensate line, uh, but, but they're largely a drop-in replacement. In the case of commercial, how you design your loop and the loop losses, the return temperature has a really big bearing on whether the heat pumps really perform to the, the level expected. So the equipment performance is important, but the design and the installation are equally as important. And that's an area that we haven't, it's, it's not an area that we've, tipped, that we've really delved into much on the, um, uh, you know, at least confirming how that gets done and understanding uh, a little bit about the, 
I guess, the range of performance across different practices. So thank you for, for that. Happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Mark. Um, When you say more flexibility is needed for this proposal, what are you, are there, is there a specific piece of flexibility that you're looking for? Well, I'd like to see something about uh, uh, including uh, thermally driven heat pumps as opposed to just electric driven and uh, to reflect that there's research and product improvements that are happening there. Um, I think that- Is that the gas fired? Um, it is. Ones? Okay. It is gas yep. fired, yep. And then the other would be to, uh, uh, to include some options for, bat for uh, supplemental. So um, I think it's been mentioned a couple of times that condensing gas fired systems, whether it's a boiler or a tankless system, um, they actually work really well for loop losses and are easy to install and inexpensive. So it, allowing for, for both fuels I think would be valuable. And then I'm not sure exactly the flexibility on the, I, I appreciate the versioning piece. Right now we're on version eight and that could be referenced in terms of the advanced water heating spec. Um, and within that, there's some tiers of performance, uh, but we do plan to continue to advance that um, and add more details about gas. And I just, I don't know whether that, I, that's, that's, <laughs> Chell, you know, you know my background. So I'm, I'm a little new to the code side of this, but, uh, I don't know how that letting that run independent to the to the code language uh, works, but I just I want to let you know that that will be advancing over time as we have more information. Is there a, a timeline for the next version? No, I don't. I don't think we're just. I mean, we literally. I think this last week it got published on our, okay. on our website. Yeah. Um, so if we've we been, were to adopt something, it would be version eight. Yeah, okay. uh, I mean, we're probably. Um, what about every year to year and a half is it gets updated. Okay. Um, yeah, this, this, just for everybody's knowledge, this code would go into effect July 1 of 2023. So we've got a bit of time between now and, and when it would be adopted. So um, I guess just that's. For so we might knowledge. have another, we might have another version by then. Okay. Eric Vanderman. Thanks, Chell. I guess I've had a chance to review this and I have a few technical comments. If we could scroll to the top, Christopher. Um, so first, first all, single pass and multi-pass, those are defined here, but they're never now used in, in this. So I don't know if we need those definitions anymore. So that'd be something to look into. Um, the, the, it seems like it would be helpful in section C404.2.1, the first sentence there to say the, the primary service water heating system shall not use fossil combustion and electric resistance or electric resistance, just to clarify that in the first sentence. And then it might be good to clarify in that first sentence if that's intended that the recirculating system can't use um, can't use fossil fuels or electric resistance only um, unless it's in compliance with uh, the section C404.2.2. So that's something to look into. Um, in the sentence section, the second sentence of that paragraph there, um, the service water shall be provided from an air source heat pump water heating system. It would be good to clarify if that air, if that air source system has to use outdoor air or if it's acceptable to use you know, indoor conditioned air, or so I would I would say that needs to say outdoor air so that folks are clear as to what that means um, without having to go to the standard, I guess, to figure that out. Um, as mentioned, Mike Kennedy mentioned moving the uh, the exception five up to exception two is good. It's more appropriate in that primary section. Um, I think we do need more exceptions. One is for small tank, the unitary tank uh, air source heat pumps that take air from the indoors. Those can be used to um, extract heat off of server rooms or electrical rooms in an office building or a multifamily building for small uh, domestic hot water loads. And I think you know that those small 
unitary heat pump water heaters can be good. And then also for kitchen process, emergency showers, eye wash, those kind of needs allowed to be electric. And then small hand wash sinks. I don't think, I don't know if the 24 kW is enough for, for handling the hand wash sinks around an office building. I'd love to see more kind of analysis on that. Um, moving down to C404.2.2, um, you know, item one, it does it, it lists 40 degrees outside, but it does not specify what that temperature is. I'm assuming that's an outdoor air temperature, but it, it's not clear in the code language if that is an outdoor air temperature or not. Um, and the same, same as uh, in regards to item four, whether that's an outdoor air temperature or, or some other temperature. So th those are a few technical comments. Um, again, I can pass those along in writing, but would be happy to work with a, a group that's, that's uh, trying to develop this technical language to be enforceable. Thanks. Thanks, Eric. Um, I appreciate the, the technical comments. Um, we wanna make this better and um, so that we all and feel better about it and making sure it's implementable and technically feasible. Um, Dwayne? Uh, yeah, thanks. I just wanted to respond to a few concerns that were raised. One's about timing. You mentioned that, that this is a code that would go into effect for permits that are applied for after July of 23, which means that the first uh, of these systems getting installed in buildings under this new code would be in in uh, somewhere in 25 and and would extend all the way through 2028 it's a long ways out and for so so if people are concerned about about uh, uh, things being ready uh, to go we have years more uh, the second thing is about cost when we did cost studies for our Seattle amendment, we were able to find uh, several head-to-head -head comparisons between um, for, for multifamily between uh, uh, gas and, and heat pump. And while we found that the reverse cycle chiller uh, systems would add about $1,800 uh, per, um, uh, per apartment unit uh, all in, uh, with the with the CO two systems, it was only about eight hundred dollars, and and uh, that's now been those CO two systems have been augmented with a new larger unit by Mitsubishi. So so uh, if we're talking about eight hundred dollars, we're talking more like one dollar a square foot uh, cost increase, not the two and a half that was mentioned. Um, and finally, in Seattle, we already have a dozen or more. Um, large scale heat pump water heater systems. No one has reported uh, uh, an inability to, to um, reach that, uh, to provide sufficient hot water. Uh, so I'm, I'm not even sure why that was raised as a, as a concern. Thank you. Thanks, Dwayne. Um, Chris Hawes, you still have your hand up? I don't know if you intend to, or if you just didn't lower it. Um, uh, Representative Alex. Uh, yes, uh, my name is Alex Ybarra. I'm the state representative for District 13, uh, which encompasses uh, Kittitas County, North part of Yakima, Grant County, and Liga County. Um, just looking over, just got in, into this meeting a little bit ago and heard a little bit about what's happening with the uh, uh, with uh, this particular portion of the of the legislation, I guess I just want to say is some of the analysis that I was hearing over the phone, which was I'm sure correct for it seems like Seattle prices um, aren't reflective of what's going on in Eastern Washington. So I think when we do a, a analysis of the payback and the cost of these particular systems, it depends on the price of electricity as where you're standing. Um, I'm paying like three cents a kilowatt hour over here, where in Seattle you're paying more like 10. And so when you do your cost analysis of this stuff, uh, it needs to be reflected And why I bring it up is because if this particular, these requirements are put into the code, I just 
at, you know, even from the numbers I'm hearing today, it's going to, it won't be cost effective. And who is it going to hurt? It's probably going to hurt the people of color most because they're the, if you look at the numbers, if you, if you look at the statistics, you would find that uh, people of color, small business owners, um, usually have the least amount of um, uh, funds to purchase buildings like this. And, and all this would, the way, uh, the way I see it, you're going to drive up the cost of these buildings. And another piece of, uh, another point I'd like to make is, um, I, you know, I voted against a lot of the legislation that you're having to deal with. I voted against it because the industry isn't quite ready to, to go to the next phase. I want clean air, but I want to get there efficiently. I don't want, I don't want to get rid of all the dams because they're the, they're the lifeblood of the grid. And so the re reason I'm bringing all that up is because we can't just go willy nilly into the future with something that's not uh, cost effective and may not work. I think that even though you, there's going to be a long uh, lead time on this thing, I think we need to be real cautious as to, um, well, at least I don't want to get rid of uh, natural gas systems yet um, until we're sure that we have a system that works for the future for everybody and that is cost effective. And the reason I bring these things up also, I worked for Grant County PUD for 17 years. I worked on initiative 937. Um, so I did all of the cost analysis for all of the, uh, the different um, uh, conservation management projects that we had. And I also did them for residential, did it for commercial, did them for ag and did them for um, uh, irrigation, agriculture and dairy products in our area. And again, it always depended on the price of energy if, as to whether these particular new systems that we wanted to bring in, and one of them was heat pumps. Um, it wasn't cost effective to bring here because the price of electricity in my area was uh, so low, um, where it could have been cost effective in Seattle because their price of electricity is much higher. And so just want to throw that out there. Again, just be a little more cautious, I think, in my opinion, uh, make sure that if the code goes through uh, without electric uh, heat pump or electric uh, and gas type systems that uh, it, it may not go well. So I just, I just wanna be cautious about this and just make sure when you make those decisions that they're the right decisions and the technology is there to, to get us where we want, which is clean air for all, um, just make sure it's there. I don't wanna be, like the, like the electric grid, I do not want to go to blackouts and brownouts. And if we go too fast, uh, this particular item could be very similar. And I know I wander all over the place, but I just want to make the point that let's not go too fast on this thing. Let's make sure that we don't get rid of some of the technologies we have in it right now. And when we get to that point where we have the technologies to use these types of heat pumps here that you put in the code, that uh, it's the right time. And we do it well. Thank you. Thanks so much for your comments um, and for being part of the tag. That's great, or not, not part of the tag, but showing up for the tag meeting. So there are, um, Dwayne and Chris, you still have your hands up. So when you're done speaking, if you want to put your hand down. Um, All right, could I direct respond to please, Representative Alex? Please, okay. Johnny. Um, thank you so much. Um, just wanted to flag that one thing about the economic modeling is that there's actually required um, utility costs that I'm that we, we have to use in the economic modeling for this and it's actually prescribed um, in the assumptions so the prices that we used were is required to be used in the economic analysis and so are the projections for the utility price increases um, I don't have any ability to really edit that in the yeah. model yeah understand under, understand completely about that um, uh, maybe as a legislator, I'll come back and we'll have to change that language because it doesn't make a lot of sense. Again, having done that analysis for 15 years at Grand County PUD, uh, I can tell you those prices vary uh, from county to county, from Western Washington to Eastern Washington, and they don't make a lot of sense for Eastern Washington. And um, I just wanted to address one more thing around equity. Um, there are burning natural gas has huge equity impacts all across the nation, including the state of Washington on health. 
And we're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars per year in health costs that are mostly bared upon low income and people of color, according to Harvard study. And I can send, I can send direct analysis of data to support this to anybody that would like to see it. So, yeah, so I've, Johnny, I've seen those, I've seen that analysis. I, I understand what, how that analysis is put together. I don't um, fully back that analysis. I really think that yes, if we have, you're burning natural gas, you put more carbon equivalencies in there, tons of car metric tons of carbon in there, and it hurts, it doesn't hurt people of color, it hurts all people. And so we all want to get rid of um, carbon in there. That's, we definitely want to do that. But I, in my opinion, it's not hurting people of color, it's hurting all people because that air is used by all. And so that's why I'm kind of wishy-washy on that type of uh, ethnic yeah. analysis. So just, just I, again, not, not trying to argue with you or anything, but just want to make sure you understand uh, the position I'm at at the moment. Thank you. And um, I agree with you, Gary. I'm just addressing points that were made in other comments. But um, I can share for anyone that's interested, if we're talking about externalities, we could talk about this all day long. Thank you. Okay, we've got uh, Dwayne and Chris Hawes both have your hands up. Um, yes, um, Representative I Ibarra, thank you for showing up for our meeting. Uh, I know they're tedious. I just wanted to point out that the fact that you have very low electric costs makes the electric heat pumps dramatically more cost effective and more appropriate for you. Thank you. Well, that's that's very good to hear. I'd love to see the analysis on that. And uh, it, if it makes sense to do it, let's do it. So I'm not trying to negate using heat heat pumps or anything. It's just, uh, I just want to make sure we do it efficiently and we use the best product that we have out there. So. Okay, well, um, we've had lots of good discussion. Um, I think the next step is, since I don't see any more hands up, um, the next step is to come up with whatever working group uh, is going to take the next step with this. I think we had some very substantive uh, technical comments that I think can improve the proposal. I think we had a lot of um, discussion on whether it's a good idea or not, but I think we should focus on making it a technically sound proposal with the best thoughts of everyone in here, and then have those who are opposed to it suggest limitations on this proposal that would make it more to their liking. Um, and then I would love to hear if people are completely against this, how they see us getting to our 19% energy use reduction in this cycle. <clears throat> and then I guess I'm also gonna remind everybody that we are not, this code is not expected. We're not required to be cost effective. Cost effectiveness is something we look at, um, but it is required um, to, and I'm gonna paraphrase here, um, to be the most uh, cost-effective way to get to our energy use reductions. So there is no, no requirement that, that everything pay back within a certain number of years. Um, but we are trying to craft the most cost-effective code to get to that 70% reduction. So um, I guess the, the next step is to come up with the, um, the working group. So um, please unmute yourself and say your name and um, we'll all write that down and then we'll convene the working group. Chris Burroughs. Okay. Wayne Johnlin. Gary Hakenen. Johnny, if I'm allowed. Johnny, certainly. <laughs> David Reddy. Okay. Sean Vig. Eric Vandermeer. Henry Odom. Eric Vandermeer. And then who else? Chris Little. Henry Odom. Henry Odom. Chris Little. Is that? That's correct. With rushing. Yep. Um, 
I, I'd like to invite someone from City Light who isn't me to the working group, if that's okay. And I can give you the name. That sounds great. Uh, Emma Johnson. Uh, Michael Kurtwright. And then, Mike, Michael, I don't have your email address. Um, does Krista or somebody else have your email address? Yes, I do. Great. Anybody, uh, anybody else? Scott Peterson. Scott Peterson. Mark Reilly. Mark Reilly. Um, Jonathan, are you still on? It'd be great if you could also join. Yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to. Thank you. Um, Sean Denniston. So, uh, Sean Denniston, okay. Anybody else? Cal, how are we looking for a quorum on that working group? <laughs> That's what I was just gonna do, is during the break, we're about to take a break for about 20 to 30 minutes. And I was gonna go through and see if in fact we have a quorum on our working group, which we couldn't have. So um, a quorum means over half of the people who have been assigned to the tag. Um, if, if more than half the people that are assigned to the tag are present in any email chain or meeting or, or hanging out at a park together, that's considered a quorum and that needs to uh, comply with all the public meeting things. So, um, so we, can't, we can't do that without setting up a public meeting which, which has its own infrastructure. And, and ideally we would avoid that, um, not because we don't wanna be uh, transparent, but because it just it just adds to layers of, of um, yeah uh, yes Sorry, inefficiency. I'm just to the last uh... so um, we cannot go to happy hour together. Um, I don't think. Uh, Krista, do you know how alternates are counted? So, in theory, if we have a quorum that includes alternates, that that runs afoul of the open meetings, right? Yes, I would say so. Yeah. So. I'm gonna go through the, the two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 15 people that, that signed up for this and we'll find out if, if we have a quorum uh, or not. And then we'll have to reopen this. But right now I am gonna call for a break and we'll have a break and we'll be at, why don't we have a, a, a why don't we back, be back here at uh, right at noon. So you all have a chance to have a decent lunch, get outside, get your mind refreshed. All right, see you all in 25 minutes. All right, everybody, I hope you had a good lunch period and are refreshed and ready to go um, for the next three hours of joy that we're about to experience together. Um, I did look at the people who signed up for the working group on heat pump hot, wa hot water heaters and I only counted six tag members, which means we're fine to meet um, to our heart's content. Gary. Yeah, maybe just, um, are, are we 100% sure that even though it's a s less than a quorum of the tag, that it doesn't need to be a public meeting. I guess I just want to make sure that we're not running afoul of any public meeting rules. It's, it's, it's still a subgroup of the tag. So um, it, I don't know if, if Krista knows um, uh, specifically about that or if we just need to have somebody give us more of an official read on that. I'll check on it, um, unless Krista has certainty about it now. Sorry, my alarm clock, clock was chiming and I was trying to let it finish before I chimed in. We should be fine because the group itself is not 
making any actual decisions. They will be bringing back results to this tag to look at and vote on, and then it will go further through the process to allow more input. So as long as you're not uh, terminating discussion on something, it should be fine. Um, maybe one more question. Would, would any meeting of the subgroup still be open to those who wanted to listen in or, or, or comment? What's the, the process on, on the meeting itself when the work group meets? Yeah, I think, I mean, we, we've... That's um, a little more of a gray area. We've, we've opened it up to anyone who wanted to be part of it. Um, and I asked for names. Yep. I am a bit hesitant to have too many people on it because I think um, we, we're not gonna, never going to get anything done if everybody has to air their their five or ten minutes. Um, I think this this will need to be a working group in in function. So, you Gary are, are welcome to invite a, a, another expert if you want. Um, but I, you know, this is this is going to make a recommendation back to this group. So this will be a public meeting when we get back in a few weeks and discuss right. it here. So you know, go ahead and invite somebody if you want to. Um, but I really don't want it to be, you know, 40 people. And, uh, you know, this, this, the idea of this, this working group is to come up with language that seems more acceptable um, and is technically correct and, and, and all that stuff. Um, and I know in earlier today, we can talk about, is it a good idea? Is it a bad idea? Um, but I'd rather focus on in what ways could it be a good idea or could, <clears throat> could some of the seeds in here be a good idea that's acceptable and moves us forward? Um, whether it's, you know, adding language or subtracting language or something like that. Right. No, I, I understand that a larger group can certainly be real. I just want to make sure that, um, number one, we don't run afoul of any public meeting rules. And number two, we... Uh, we have appropriate um, input from affected parties, let's put it that way. But I, I agree, a, a large group just gets unwieldy and, and it's hard to get anything done. So I realize we're walking a, um, in line here to, to speak, but just wanted to uh, bring up the concern. Thanks, Joe. Yep. Yep. And as I said, bring invite somebody if you want. Kevin. Oh, thank you, Chair. This is Kevin Dwell with Northwest Natural. Wanted to put my name in the hat for this subcommittee as well, uh, respecting that perhaps it's large enough already. <laughs> but nonetheless, I'm a professional engineer registered in the state of Washington, mechanical specialty. So thought that might be of use. Sure. Yep. I put your name down on the list, and um, the 16 or so of you or possibly us will meet and see if we can make this um, into a winning proposal uh, that is good for the state of Washington and our energy for progress and all that. So, um, all right, well, let's, we stopped off at uh, 126. So I think the next one is 093. Is that where we're at, Krista? Well, we were in the discussion on the rewrite oh, yeah. to 124. Oh, yes. Melding the three proposals together. Okay, yeah. So that's, yeah. So 124 tied in 178 and 126. And um, I think we had gotten some general discussion points. Why don't we go section by section and see what, what additional comments we have? on that. So um, please raise your hand as you have comments. Is there any comments on what's on the screen right now? Does everybody kind of use your reactions? Does everybody kind of agree with what's on the screen as being, I mean, obviously we're moving things elsewhere, but um, does everybody kind of agree with what's on the screen right now or nobody takes opposition to it? All right. Got a sleepy post-lunch. 
All right, why don't we scroll down a little bit and see where we're going to get the, the good discussion. Um, I think for uh, exception five down here uh, was going to attract some discussion. Does anybody want to speak it's, or against it? It's not an exception, that's a requirement. Oh, sorry, okay, yeah. Yep, requirement five <laughs> under C4 5.2.1.3. Okay, so is everybody generally in favor of, of item five there? Okay, C405.2.7, lighting, advanced lighting controls. Hey, well, this is a, a Hi, Kim. This is Gavin Tennell with Northwest Renewables up in Spokane, Washington, and you left me a message on uh, Wednesday. Okay, all right. Um, this this had a lot of discussion before. It, it seems like everybody's either asleep or away from their desk. So, um, love love to have comments on this, CJ. Yeah, I think before we about to stop, we were we had some raised hands from both Sean Dara and Andrew Poltorek. I voiced a concern about the use of occupancy sensing. It sounds like the purview of this specific code change proposal does not change anything. Therefore, I'm just uh, out of luck relative to my desire to not have the code mandate the use of occupancy sensing in open office environments. I would very much like to find a way to rectify that, but this doesn't seem like that's what this code change proposal is dealing with. Okay, thanks, CJ. Sean? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Shel. The, the, the biggest thing about this proposal is that it, it essentially aligns more or less with the existing Seattle Energy Code. And then it also uh, further enumerates uh, a network lighting control as sort of a separate and uh, uh, similar, similar thing, essentially trying to uh, minimize some confusion that had been that had been engendered by the, the Seattle Code potentially. But, but CJ, it, it really doesn't uh, make any major changes with respect to uh, what really has to happen in offices anyway. Um, it, it's, it's really um, um, not a huge uh, difference than what we have in Seattle currently. Andrew. Um, I'd like to point out that it does say um, that it's general lighting and I think that should ease you, CJ. And do we have a definition for general lighting so that be italicized? Because mm -hmm. I think CJ's concern is more about accent lighting, wall washers, things like that. And the term general lighting is there. So that would be the ambient light in the space. Um, I think that would help alleviate you for that, CJ. Um, also, there was a comment about um, being able to dim, and I see somewhere in there, uh, where was it? I lost it now, it was in purple, I thought, having to do about dimming. Is Mike on here? Can you yeah. unmute yourself, Mike, and just tell me where that is? No, we well, further up. Each, up. each section, it's uh, requirement one there is provide one. continuous full range dimming. Right, the issue with that is when you try there are many manufacturers out there. You can actually dim them, but when you go to a set point and they go to off, they don't dim when they go to off. Many times there are products in the marketplace that they will do a step down dimming. So it'll say 20 minutes, all of a sudden we'll step down to another percentage. And then after another 10 or 15 minutes, whatever the set, said is that it will then turn off. Um, there are some that will dim as they go into that next range, but there are many that will do what we would consider step dimming. Right. The, 
the current enhanced There's not light, products in the marketplace. Right. I, I am glad to take direction from lighting designers. Um, the current enhanced digital lighting controls requires continuous dimming. And I don't know, uh, the full range, I believe, was something that Sean added. I might be well, wrong. Well, yeah. uh, it, it's not incorrect to say that it's dimming. The issue becomes when it, the space becomes unoccupied, what happens with that fixture? If you want to sit at a wall box dimmer and dim those, yes, you do get full range dimming, or what would be considered full range dimming. That is true. And those fixtures can behave that way. The issue becomes when the occupant the occupants leave, the, the fixtures will not dim. They will they will jump down to another level. They'll go from the set point of 100% down to 77%, down to 66%, and then 33%, and then off. They will not dim smoothly during that range of not sensing occupants. So is there a better way to word this that would uh, align with what you're thinking, Andrew? Unfortunately, at the top of my head, no. Um, not on the spare of the moment. And I was part of the working group, but I guess every, I, I couldn't meet when the group was meeting. Hmm. Andrew, are you talking about all all systems or some systems? No, no, I don't. I, I, I try not to speak in overarching terms of all because you never know what everybody is doing out there but i do know of systems that don't have that capability to do a smooth dimming transition between um one point to another if you stood there dimming them on a wall box dimmer they would so like for a private office they would but you couldn't do that when it's occupancy sensing it'll just step down one product in particular is the uh, Philips slash Signify products. It Where would freeze will do smooth dimming. So it would do smooth dimming for daylight control, but just not the occupancy sensor. Is that, is I that what you're saying? I, no, I don't know that for sure. Okay. We're saying that some fixes will dim between those, like Cree will dim between settings, but the Signify slash Philips old products will not. Yes, it's Andrew, an entry level, they have that it's an entry level project. No, not no, the no, entry they, level project the products. But, but they don't. They do have the ability to do full range dimming. You, you just said so from a wall box dimmer, they have that ability. Um, I get where you're coming from. Does the, does the fact that we've incorporated high trim and low trim um, not not kind of cover what your concern is? If you look at number four. I would, there's the, to, to my reading of this, there's nothing in here that says that to go from, from one preset to another or from one, one point to another, there has to be anything to do with smooth dimming. They have to, but the system has to provide that ability. So perhaps maybe the um, um, number one should be provide the capability for continuous full range dimming. Would that satisfy? Sure, sure. I think that would be better rather than a, a hard statement of provide continuous ability to provide or something would be better. Okay. Keep typing, add the word continuous. Great, we've got some language in here that addresses that addresses your concern, Andrew. And yeah, and uh, I hate to belabor the point, but um, full range can mean a whole slew of things unless we have a definition. Um, unless you have a 1% dimmer, I think, Sean, you'd know this, it's, you know, most of these are going to dim down to 10%, maybe 5%, and that wouldn't be considered full range. I think full range is 1% to 100%. I guess I would, don't want to really belabor it because how many code officials would know that difference? Um, just want to toss it out there. It's 
kind of a term that maybe shouldn't just be thrown out if, as full range, because what does that mean, at least to the lighting world? Does anyone have thoughts on that response? The current language for the enhanced lighting control says luminaires shall be configured for continuous dimming. And that was, that's been in the code okay. for quite a while. Um, continuous that, would probably be better than full range. Um, but it also says configured, not capability. Correct. Configured is what the term we've been using to make sure that it has to be checked out for commissioning. So configured to or the configured term. Um, so I, I'm I'm I, I I defer to Sean on full range. Um, I don't generally have the same the same concern, Andrew, that you do with respect to that. I, I understand where you're coming from, um, but colloquially in the industry, usually when people say full range dimming, at least the ones that I've talked to tend to be talking about um, a continuous rather than step dimming where you were talking about step right. dimming. So uh, if we wanted to do one of two things and say, okay, uh, assume that, that uh, because this is supposed to be advanced controls, if we wanted to say, provide the capability for continuous full range dimming to 1% or 5% or whatever that happened to be, um, I mean, the intent here, I think, is to make this um, better than the average bear, if you will, right? Um, so Mike and or Dwayne and or CJ, I'd be curious about your thoughts on that. But um, uh, one thing, whatever is done in number one here should, should uh, be copied to number one in the 7.2 there as well. So just, just as a general thing, we're trying to kind of align the functionality of the, the, two, the two sections to be fairly simple, uh, fairly similar. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I, I agree with that, that they should be similar. And I am a little concerned about going from configured I mean, I think these fixtures should be continuous dimming. I don't know that they need to go down below 10% light level or you know, some level of light um, below that. I guess I was, I was, that was a distinction I was not making. Um, so I, I think that the goal here, yes, is that these would be better than the average bear. So straight step dimming, particularly step dimming related to daylight control would not be, th this should be continuous. And actually we require continuous dimming now for daylight control. So to comply with C405.2.5, it's gotta have continuous dimming. I'd like to just chime in that some of the concerns that Andrew's raised uh, r remind me of concerns about lighting power, where some some products uh, were were what were called glare glare bombs because um, too much power focus in one spot. But I think there will be better and worse ways to comply with the code, and it's up to the specifier or lighting designer to select uh, systems that that uh, don't cause that kind of discomfort or distraction. Uh, that discomfort or distraction is not caused by the code. It would it could be caused by a, a, a poorly specified system. So, but we can't ever get to the point where we give all the details in requirements necessary to, to do every single thing optimally. I, I think getting rid of that full word full range would be better. Um, CJ, your thoughts on that? Yeah, um, I'd like to keep it. Uh, I agree with Sean. I think colloquially, at least it communicates the intent. 
Um, and to Dwayne's point, I also completely agree. I don't think that the purview of the code is to, de is to determine the way to achieve it. What we care about is the notion that you're not going to have an occupancy sensor or a device step dim. I think the continuous dim is, is the need. I, I would keep it as written. I'm not, uh, I don't have a problem with changing the wording to being provide the capability for continuous full range dimming, although I certainly would want a system that I specify to just be always continuous full range dimming in all applications. Yep. <clears throat> so I guess I'm hearing that if we didn't make any changes to this section, that would be maybe a good thing to do. Is that is that what I'm hearing? I would endorse the change if Andrew feels strongly about it, um, if, if that solves his problem. I guess the, the code is not about providing capabilities for things, but about requiring things for energy efficiency. So just from a, it just doesn't seem like the, the code is about providing capabilities of perhaps providing actual energy savings, which would, would I think if we had just capabilities in there, we wouldn't, we wouldn't see that. <clears throat> would returning to configured for yep. continuous dimming be better than provide? Andrew, would that help, help you out? It was configured to provide continuous for range dimming or something like that? Okay, we get the thumbs up. So configured for continuous full range dimming. Works for me. It looks like the language down under the next section, item one, could be copied. Right. Okay. Are there any other comments on this section of what's on, on the screen right now? Mike? On um, item three, um, uh, the current LLLC, LLLC definition has the uh, language that's in green there uh, about monitoring ambient light and dimming and brightening the light. Um, and then the in Dwayne's proposal, and I assume this is part of the Seattle code now, a maximum of eight fixtures are permitted to be controlled together for uniform light levels. Um, and I guess drawing attention to the, uh, the lead off sentence before the numbered items, it says each LLC luminaire shall be independently configured to. So those, it feels to me like those two sentences are in conflict. And I'd be interested in opinions on that. Andrew, CJ. Um, I agree they seem to be in conflict, but also I think numbering the fixtures rather than saying square footage would be better. Um, an example is at our own offices back almost seven years ago now when LLCs were being introduced into the market, we split our office in half on one floor plate and one half was one company, one half was the, the other half was another. And the way the layout turned out was because you have a virtual hallway um, in the, going down to the cubicles, it laid out that it was nine fixtures. So we wouldn't have met code, which seems kind of silly because it, you really should do it on base of square footage. I think saying the specific amount of fixtures rather than amount of square footage would be better for most projects rather than telling them how to design so that would be the 300 or 600 feet like we have in the open office control. Um, yeah, but this is saying above there, it says open office area 5,000 and maybe it said there, it's broken down to whatever layout for eight, nine fixtures would be. Um, well, that'd be like 30 by 20 or something, I don't know. No, but the, the 5,000 square feet is just to establish a threshold below which you don't have to bother with this. And so that was just 
and and we actually it i think it was picked because that's the the smallest uh that that's the threshold for doing plan review for electrical mm. so so andrew are you saying when you guys set up llc you'll have five thousand square feet all controlled the same even though every fixture has its own occupancy sensor and photo sensor no no we broke them we broke them up there one um one side of the office space had six fixtures grouped together but the way the work groups were on the other side it was nine fixtures together the way everything came together so nine fixtures if we submitted for permit for that we wouldn't have met that and it would have been a i just think eight fixtures is kind of funny to be telling people how to design under eight pictures rather than just saying 600 square feet or, you know, 700 square feet or something, given a square footage amount, we're giving the square footage elsewhere. We don't tell them how many pictures to use. Well, again, so I think that sense, like, I, I can't speak for Dwayne or Seattle, but I assume that eight fixtures came from the enhanced lighting control, which also had eight fixtures. Um, like if we go down below, that's the language that was just part of the enhanced lighting control. So that was written by a group of lighting designers about two cycles ago. I'm not married to it. And, and actually, the <clears throat> being able to control eight fixtures together, CJ, was that your proposal back then? No. no. <clears throat> Do we need to have another work group on this one? I mean, we haven't gotten to CJ's comment or to the trim language yet. I mean, I guess <clears throat> we'll see how many comments this attracts, but it sounds like th this one is is either we go with eight fixtures or we go with 600 square feet or something like that. And that seems like something that, that can be addressed one or the other um, within the, the tag. Um, I'd like to say that I'm, I'm fine with 600 square feet instead of eight fixtures if it works better for you. Okay, reactions. How many people would rather have 600 feet than eight fixtures? Use your thumbs up, your thumbs down, your, your no way, CJ's against it. Lots of other people think it's a good idea. Um, CJ. Okay, so I I do think that it would be wise to do a square footage. I just don't think 600 square feet is the correct amount. Um, again, if you think about if assuming this is a essentially, let's say this is these are two by two fixtures. If you're going to have two by two fixtures in an open office environment, you're probably going to be spacing them around eight feet on center. So let's say that that's a, a, a I think that's closer to a thousand feet rather than 600 feet. So if you're talking about a square footage area of light fixtures to be controlled, uh, what was the language? Um, yeah, I'd say that that's. Well, actually, um, if that's 64 square feet per fixture, eight fixtures is 512 square feet. So um, the no. 600 square feet would be even more generous. No, I was thinking it was a 32 foot square box. So, I mean, this is a, a to some degree, I believe, a rollback in what's required for LLLC. Um, so I'm, I'm mindful of making this too liberal. So um, I think we're looking at this, sorry. Um, I think we're looking at this 600 square feet is kind of um, on the lower side. I just looked at a quick number and it was closer to 1200 square feet. Yeah. With, well, it was with, our nine, with, our, with our nine fixtures that we did, it was 1200 square feet that we covered. So if you pull out a fixture and you want to go to eight, it would be closer to a thousand. Uh. And we're just equaling whatever eight fixtures would be, right? So there shouldn't be, I know we're having disagreement here, but. Well, I'm, I'm actually proposed not the adding eight, the eight fixtures at all. I mean, I'd go with the language that we've had as opposed to adding any number of fixtures here. No, I'm saying square footage. Go I with know. square footage. And what's that square footage number? But, but Andrew, you're saying that, that 
in 1200 square feet with nine fixtures, that's 133 square feet per fixture. That's way bigger spacing than is, than is typical. That's, that's double. Six hundred is I don't think is the right number. Well, are, are we at a point where one of us could make a, a a motion to vote on something, and then we could see where the rest of the tag is at? You're everybody's free to make motions at any point. All right, I will make a motion that we leave it at eight fixtures and and take the other changes that have been typed up on the screen here. We have a motion. Do we have a second? That's for this section, Dwayne? That's for this whole thing that's, that we're considering here. C405.2.7. We haven't even looked at the trim language yet. OK. I'll, I'll rephrase that to be uh, my, well, do we even vote on partial bits of, I guess we could have a, just a show of hands. Um, for for this, this section on, on the lighting controls that we leave it at, at the eight fixtures. My understanding is you, people can make motions for whatever they want. You can make a motion to have everybody order a pizza or something like that. And that's probably not a, a purview, but um, so you could make a motion to um, <clears throat> to adopt certain languages in this proposal, I guess. Um, that's that's my understanding. There's somebody seconds it and we vote on it. Okay, so I guess my, my motion is only regarding 2.7. And it's to use, maintain the eight fixtures Right. Okay. How many do we have a second for that? I'll do a second. Okay. Um, all in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. Okay, so the motion passes. I only saw one um, uh, no, uh, and that was visually through Andrew's um, red X. So, but but I don't technically think that counts because I'm an alternate member, voting member, and CJ is the primary. So I don't think my vote even is considered. <laughs> okay, so so that motion passes. Sorry. Um, your opinion is Andrew. No, no, I get it. No, no, no. I was, I, I, I don't take it the wrong way. I, I, I totally agree. I was saying because CJ is in the room. So yep. yeah, don't feel, I don't feel offended or anything else. It's all good discussion. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Well, let's move on to the next section here. Other comments on what's on the screen now? Or were, about we, the were we going to delete the word full range in item one? I'm sorry, I may have just, it may be that Swiss cheese short-term memory, but someone already referred to. Somebody didn't like it, but I think we were, more of us were inclined to leave it. Okay. So CJ had a problem with item three. Um, The current language requires that in office and open office that the fixtures be individually configured, configured to be individually dimmed by the occupant. Um, just somewhat similar. I, I'm open for discussion on this, CJ. Um, again, I would, I mean, I would defer to Sean on this to some degree. Um, I think I have an editing error. Um, item five doesn't need to be there, or it needs to be, it's kind of repeating the sentence before it as part of four. It can be stricken. You can keep that and delete the added. Okay, yeah, that works. Um, Sean, or Sean, you have a comment? 
Yeah, I just wanted to, to say that, that functionally, the idea was to keep LLLC and NLC um, quite similar. They, they are slightly different, but LLLC is, is functionally a subset of network lighting controls. So from a, um, you know, for example, number three, monitor occupant activity, et cetera, that should be basically the same as, as the functionality in LLLC. Right. That's um, and and that actually is more or less what's required uh, by other sections of the code already. CJ. Yes. Thanks. Um, two questions. Two comments. Um, one. This is just clerical. But since the uh, colon at the very top says each NLC luminaire shall be independently configured to. I would suggest that items one on both this section and the prior say provide for continuous full ring dim dimming, just to make it make sense grammatically. Um, secondly, um, Andrew, you made a very astute comment about how this is specific to general lighting. Um, and I would love to see that language again, because I'm wanting to see if we can make sure that that language is applicable to this as well. Because my problem is in fact addressed if we look at the occupancy sensing controlling general lighting in the space. Whereas if you have a wall washer or some sort of um, art accent light along the side of the space, if that can be left on. So then in your visual field, while you're working in an open office environment, those are not having to be automatically dimmed down. That, that does in fact address my, my concern. Okay, so you suggested that we remove configured and go back to provide? Uh, no, configured, uh, is that what I said? <laughs> That's what I got out of it. For Great. The first provide thing. for continuous full range dimming. We'll provide. Yeah. I see this as a rollback. We'll provide continuous full range dimming. Provide yeah. for continuous full range dimming. Mike, you don't agree with that? Well, I think we're going from you have to be using continuous full range dimming to you have to have the capability essentially. Okay. I'm just looking at the language of the LLLC luminaire shall be independently configured to configured for it just didn't make sense to use the word configured twice. So I was just looking to find another word. I can buy that. Um, as to this general comment, uh, where did you see that, Andrew? And CJ, what else? I'm sorry, I was on mute. Go ahead, Andrew. What did you need the comment on, CJ? I um, you made a comment previously about how there was a note that the occupancy sensor controls needed to deal with general lighting. And I'm wanting to see where yes. that was written up, I think. For it was, yeah, it was up above. I would agree with what you just said, but I it was up above um, right there. Yeah. General lighting. Great. So if we can find a way to allow that sentiment be put to the network lighting control as well, I think we'll target what I'm after. I think that would be up to the sections that are referencing these control sections. I mean, in other words, if either of these sections get referenced by other parts of the code, then they um, they would, you know, could add that caveat if they wanted. So if C406 references this, this they can add that if um, you know, right now it's just applied to the open office credit um, at the beginning of C405.2 where it gives you the LLLC option for compliance, any fixture not complying with this would have to comply with the other path, you know, with the standard controls. So I, I just, I'm not sure that, there's nowhere this is needing to be, this is just the capabilities of the system. 
Um, CJ, and then this has taken longer than I was hoping it would. Um, it might be good for a few people to agree on things ahead of a future uh, meeting. Um, CJ, go ahead. Yeah, I think if we simply put in where it says under network lightning controls, it says in addition, each NLC luminaire, we could say in addition, each NLC general lighting luminaire shall be independently configured to. Okay, uh, I don't know that we're, are we close to an answer on this? Mike, CJ, and- I, I feel like that's a problem for the reference from C406.4. Glad to table this if we'd like to discuss something else. So is there, who would like to meet and who would like to organize that group um, to get to the small group consensus before they, this comes back to the tag again? <laughs> Um, I'll be a part of that. I'm gone Monday, Tuesday next week. But okay, Mike, how, how how close are we to resolving this? I just hate to have yet another group to sign up I, for. I keep thinking we're really close, Lane, and then we're not. So, um, are we close, CJ, Mike, and Andrew and Sean? Well, it gets it concerns me that then if we had a non NLC, if we had a NLC luminaire that wasn't general lighting, it wouldn't be required to do anything, but they'd be able to claim all the credit as if they were doing it in the section that referenced this. Perhaps we could establish the general lighting uh, allocation simply to the occupancy sensing um, uh, item. If, Chell, could you, would you mind scrolling down? Uh, as Krista's got Krista, control of the screen. Yeah, thank you. I guess, do you think we're close, CJ, or do you think we need to kick this to? I think small we'll, group? that's great. Does that address your concerns, Mike? That's, uh, yeah, that's better. Uh, Sean? I don't know. Totally. I think I, I just wanted to say that that um, anything that isn't sort of part of the quote general lighting here, uh, if it's if it's a light fixture that's installed, is still going to be subject to the other requirements of the occupancy sensing, daylight sensing, all of those other things. It just it wouldn't necessarily be part of this very specific section. Right. My, my concern is in C406.4, they'll be getting credit for extra credit for doing this. Yeah. Um, and I want to make sure that they're doing something for that credit. And we're not looking at that piece here, so it's a little bit difficult. But I, I can accept this. But, but shouldn't that be addressed uh, by Reed in the C406 section? Because this, these two sections are really just defining what we mean by NLC or what we mean by LLLC. And that's, right? that's why I don't think we should be putting general lighting up top. We can let whatever referencing section do that. Just like we do in, in, in this section itself, C405.2.7, it specifically calls out general lighting right now, right there in the purple. You know, it says general lighting controlled by this or this. So open office will not, the non-general lighting in open office will not have to do these things. That, that is clear. And I feel like every, that should be on the, you know, that anything that references any of these sections just needs to put in that caveat. That makes sense to me. That's fine with me as well. 
Yes, okay. So we'd, we would eliminate the word general that we just added in um, this and the other place. I think there was another place. I don't think there's any other place we've added it and left. Okay. But there's a couple more things on the next screen down for NLC. But Mike, where is general lighting listed above? At C405.2.7. It's in the, the, the earliest language in the section. Um, if you go, yeah. Great, okay. So it affects both sections below it, great. Yeah, for, for anything that references, for the open office requirement, if someone references 405.2.7.2, when they make that reference, they'll need to say, just like here, you know, general lighting shall be controlled by C405.2.7.2. May I ask then if the network lighting control scenario is used, it's used in more than just open office projects. Um, I think we would still want occupancy sensing not necessarily to be required for accent lighting. So does the general lighting comment above still reference it properly? It would not apply unless the thing, I mean, the, the question would be, and C406 is a good example. If we're giving people credit for doing NLC controls, um, I, you know, that just becomes one of the fixtures they're not controlling and they don't get credit for it, but they wouldn't have to do it. Yeah, so C406 would then tell them which set of lighting they would need C405.2.7.2 to apply to, right? Right. That was, that's, was my idea. And uh, Reed has quite a different formulation for the enhanced lighting control uh, rather than, I think it's 90% threshold. It's a much lower threshold and then you get partial credit for the percent of the lighting power or floor area that you're controlling okay. with an NLC fixture. So for this section, it sounds like we're generally good with what is written on the screen in front of us. That's the sense I'm getting. Um, are there any, any more comments about the code language in front of us? I, I think there's still the trim language. Yeah, yeah, we're gonna get to that. Okay. Yep. Okay, trim, let's talk trim. <laughs> Who has questions or comments about the high-end trim? CJ. Yeah, I've made a comment about wanting to know simply where 85% came from. Um, I don't feel strongly about this. Uh, I do think that it is interesting to think that designers might end up deciding to put an 85% light or a 0.85%, an 85% light loss factor um, on their calculations and then over design things simply because they would know that the trim exists. Normally we're doing a 0.9 light loss factor for most um, LED luminaires on our projects. Yeah, well, and I, yeah, this came from the Reed Hart proposal. And actually, I believe even Andrew suggested that at PSE, they were often doing 15% or even more in their trim stuff. Um, I agree that there seems like there's kind of a potentially a catch 22 there. Um, but that is what this other bit about, you know, you can go ahead and do a target light level. Um, um. Yes, yeah, CJ, that was actually the compromise that we came up with was that 85% uh, is kind of in there for those, those however many projects in which they don't have a, a uh, lighting practitioner or somebody who's really savvy with what they're doing, uh, whereas for the rest of the projects, it would depend on what your sequence of operations was. So that's why we put in the the, the key or there or to meet the target light level documented, etc. Sounds good. All right. Are, is there any more comments on uh, trim? I will happily entertain a motion to move this thing forward. Motion to approve as amended on the screen. 
Second. Second. We have a motion. We have a second. Is there any further discussion? Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. Okay, motion passes. And we got away without another work group. <laughs> yeah, that was an important 52 minutes, but um, we, we got it uh, done well. So that's good. So an update on work groups. So I, I emailed Stoyan, who's the director of the Building Code Council staff. And um, he responded that the, the tags can convene working groups. Um, there's, or, or rather, there's nothing in the bylaws that prohibit the tag from establishing subgroups. And there's nothing that specifically allows it. What we've done, and then this is my experience, is in the past, we have asked the proponent and to gather stakeholders together to make the proposal better. Um, and that has been an informal activity, not an official subgroup of the tag. Um, we can, by a vote, establish a subgroup of the tag to more officially look at something, and that would probably be a public meeting. That would be a public meeting. Um, but in the past, what we've done for most of these is just say, hey, you know, Mike Kennedy, why don't you gather the three or four people on this call that are interested uh -huh. and talk and, and, and improve the proposal through that. Um, so if this group wanted, we could establish a subgroup to look at the heat pump water heating proposal. And that would be a, uh, a public meeting and an official extension. Um, or we could keep it an informal group that is simply advising the proponent on ways to make the proposal better. Um, and since we're not at a quorum, that the informal method is, uh, is possible. Um, does that address the concerns of those who express concerns about subgroups? I'm fine. I'm fine. Okay. Because there were several people that expressed concern about that, and I wanted everybody to know what what are, what's possible. We could establish an official subgroup. We don't have to. Um, we can simply ask the proponent to convene these these individuals, and then the proposal will get better through that that process. Okay, well, um, I will send Johnny the list of people who wanted to be part of the subgroup and, um, or not the unofficial subgroup, the people that would uh, advise him on how to make the proposal better. And then he can convene that group. Okay, next code proposal. This is occupant sensor controls, is it? This is 093, yes, occupant sensor controls. So to, re to remind, this is essentially, um, uh, as, as we discussed last time, uh, taking among other things, the list of uh, spaces that are, that are um, uh, clearly requiring occupant sensor controls and moving them back to where they are in the IECC, uh, again, to, to kind of try to keep things um, as unified as possible for um, infrequent practitioners or for practitioners out of state, um, as well as to clean up uh, a little bit of the language that um, uh, there were some inconsistent uh, call outs that were happening um, and to, to look at some of those things. So this is essentially the result of a couple of meetings with um, uh, Dwayne and Mike and um, uh, Andrew, I think you were in one of them and um, um, uh, Reed and Levi Snow and um, Mike Meyer were also involved in some of them. Okay, did that group generally achieve consensus around this proposal? 
I'm going to defer. I believe so, but I'm going to defer that to Mike and or Dwayne. What do you guys think? Um, I think there was there's one issue down. I mean, I think we were in uh, concurrence with most of these changes. I think there was a concern in this section right here. Um, and how, well, if you go down, scroll up just a little bit more, or sorry, down a little bit more, um, right there, the occupancy sensors for all other spaces shall comply with 405.2.1.1, um, but all the other sentences have been struck out. So I'm not sure that that makes sense. And the, the kind of the con flow of the controls don't make sense to me just into that default section, that C405.2.1.1. So my opinion was we should restore those two, those other sentences in that right there that have been struck out. So it made sense. Is that, is that the primary discrepancy or, or difference among people from the group? Or are there other still controversial areas? Mike McGivern? Yeah, I just had a question about at the uh, header. Uh, if you scroll up, please, where it says lights to control lights. I wonder if we shouldn't, as a friendly amendment, uh, modify lights to luminaires to become more, uh, more compatible with the rest of the. Uh, C405 and the National Electrical Code. Sounds reasonable. Sean's giving us a thumbs up. Dwayne. Yeah, could I share a screen? Please. Uh, gotta wait till somebody unshares. Okay. Um, Where on my screen is the screen I'm looking for here? Uh, sorry. Uh, I'm sorry for the delay. Where to go? Okay, maybe I can't share a screen. How did that happen? Um, Sorry, I, I don't seem to show on my share screen list the screen that I wanted to share with you all. Um, let me just try one more thing here. No, um, that's too bad. I it's just not working for me. I I have a a uh, um, a, a table. I sent that to I think Mike and Sean as well. Uh, uh, maybe you have more success sharing than, than, uh, than I did. I'm working on that, Dwayne. I have it if uh, somebody wants to let me share the screen. There we go. Thank you. Um, uh, my my idea was that that. Uh, to try to combine a few ideas that have been floating around about how to keep this more or less aligned with the with the uh, um, national code and and still explicitly guide people to the correct sections, um, I propose this this table. So it's basically the same list. It's just got. Uh, 
direction on the code section. Right. So you can see number six there is open office, and that is directs you to 2.1.3 and fiber rated stairways. Because uh, the other way that I've seen a couple other uh, possibilities uh, for how to describe this, and I think they were both kind of um, falling short. So this would be my proposal is to is to take that introductory sentence and and this table and put it at the top of of 2.1 and then it references all the subsections below it and and this guides you to which one you have to comply with that looks pretty clear sean i, I think this is fantastic uh my only my only caution would be that that while we are trying to make this as easy for people to to understand as possible they can glance at it and say, okay, storage rooms absolutely need to have occupancy sensor controls, et cetera. I would still um, keep in a, a catch-all phrase somewhere that says, um, you know, as we, we talked about, um, uh, space is not specifically enumerated, need to, need to comply with, you know, whichever section we want to, we want to send them to. Well, uh, that's like item 10 on the list is, is the space is under 300 square feet. But other things that are not on the list do not require occupancy sensors, the way the code works. Um, but they could have it potentially, Duane. Well, they don't. I mean, the way the code works now and the way we propose it going forward, only the spaces that show up in this section specifically require occupancy sensors. Right, but all the other spaces where they have the option to have occupancy sensor in lieu of scheduled shutoff or time switch. So I guess I can see that. I, I'm in favor of this table. I'm not sure we need the numbers and I wonder mm -hmm. about al alphabetizing it, but I mean, okay. I'm, I'm not sure we need the one through 15 numbers. Let me clarify. I am I am okay as a friendly amendment with getting rid of the, the column of numbers, and I'm okay uh, with alphabetizing. Although it's a little funky because we have like, um, uh, you know, the the first word in each of those things is not necessarily the the room. Some of them say it doesn't say office comma open plan. It says open plan office so forth. Okay, let's not do that. Okay. Um, and then if someone wants to add another sentence below this that says something that will pick up other space types about which I'm not yet clear, please have at it. Are there, so Krista, do you have this table? I don't think I sent it to Krista. Okay. If we are going to adopt it into the code, we should. Make sure Chris has a copy of it. Um, I've got a screen share. I can always just recreate it. All right. Uh, there'll be no need. I'll, I'll send it to you uh, right away. So does anybody have any thoughts that are that this is a bad idea? OK, so I guess we'll go back to Krista's screen and just pretend that this is the actual, what we had on the screen is what we will have on the screen when Krista shares again. Well, I guess that's the entire code proposal, isn't it? Is that one, uh, the table. So would we then call it table something or other? Yes, it's table C405.2.1. Okay. So anybody else have any comments? CJ? Yeah, this is just a clarification. And you guys know where my pet issue is. Again, if we've got like a public space, like a hotel lobby, and you've got a uh, what's considered to be a corridor that's right alongside of it, does that mean that that corridor needs to have the light shut off? Can you say that again? If you have a space that's a publicly accessed space, regularly lit with some sort of scene control, if you have a corridor that you can see that's right, just right next to your public space, does that mean that the lighting in that corridor has to shut off with an occupancy sensor? 
Yes. That's where I think this is uh, flawed. I would love it if we could change this back to service corridors because public space corridors do in fact contribute, the lighting of that does in fact contribute to what lighting you might have in the space that you're immediately in. Right, uh, I think that though the, the last time we discussed this at length um, with the large group that we decided to um, no longer just reference service corridors, but to reference corridors generally. And uh, can somebody tell me if that's incorrect? I believe that's correct that we agreed to go with corridors. We also didn't, weren't able to vote on it because it um, was in, before we had been referred these uh, proposals to us. Are there a few more comments on this? If it really just hinges on this service corridor versus corridor thing, I think we can we can vote on that. But if there's other substantive comments, then let's hear those. Um, Sean, I, I I would say that if we wanted to carve carve out specific exceptions, CJ, for example, um, lobby corridors or uh hospitality or even healthcare corridors maybe we would put those in there but um one of the things that i think we probably still want to be capturing are things like multi-family corridors uh that are not service corridors right uh so multi-family is is one of those places where we're probably actually going to see a pretty fair uh, amount of savings from um uh, from being able to dim down uh based on occupancy I don't disagree. I think that's a great suggestion. I think if we could find a way to have an exemption for public spaces that are hospitality oriented, I don't know, maybe we, is that a wordsmithing that we need to come back to? How do we take that offline and not have to talk about that here? I wonder if we could vote this in and then you could uh, come back next meeting with a, a code change proposal to the, to revise this and bring it back up so we could vote it in with, with the assumption that we will look again at language for corridors adjacent to public spaces. Yeah, like if it said corridors, comma, except for corridors that open to public or that let's directly not, open to public spaces or something. Let's not try to do that right now because we can't even define public spaces. So, okay. So, um, and this is one of the changes coming from the IECC. It, so, that, that's what it is in the model code. It's corridors instead of service corridors? Yes. Yeah. Which we debated when we first brought it up as well. And I don't think we came to consensus on it at that point. I agree with Dwayne's suggestion that we vote this forward. And then if someone wants to carve out an exception, we can revisit that. I okay. Can we go look at the language for corridor? controls, because I actually have a comment there. Is that in this proposal? Yes, yeah, at the end. Okay. <clears throat> okay, yes, yeah, that Two point one six. Um, I had a real hard time. I really don't like the exception for two foot candles. Um, it just seems really ambiguous to me. And then I would like to see an exception here for hospital corridors because ninety point one has hospital corridors as exempt. Um, but those are my two comments on that, and maybe they could be addressed at the same time. I think that's a good idea. I think if you want to come up with the, the language and then you and CJ can um, jointly propose slight modifications to this proposal. Uh, if And then if and when you do that, we can reconsider it. Does that sound good? Uh-huh. Yes. Okay. Anybody have a motion? I move that we uh, accept the the current proposal with the 
addition of that table um, and, and with the understanding that we will likely revisit this at a future meeting. We have a second. Second. We have a motion, we have a second. Further discussion? Um, all right, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. Okay, motion passes. Um, one one thing for, for going forward, somebody was going to write that additional sentence that goes below this table. And and uh, that person needs to identify themselves who's going to write that. Or we could just volunteer Sean. Sean Hunt. I'll take a shot at it. This is Mike Kennedy. All right, thanks. Um, <clears throat> are we up to 026 now? This is Levi Snow. This is about daylight harvesting. Um, uh, Levi, uh, this is Mike Meyer. Levi is, uh, I think, camping or hiking with family, so he was unable. This is a, a modification. The previous daylight harvesting was interestingly written around number of fixtures in the daylighted zone. As a byproduct, uh, one of the challenges were there are fixtures that really weren't daylight harvesting uh, uh, capable with sensors. Uh, downlights is a great example. And so it kind of triggered that as well as um, notoriously um, uh, designers kind of figured out how to quite literally ma make sure the quantity never triggered it. Uh, so this was switched to a wattage based me method. Uh, IEC 90.1, California, California Style 24 all use a wattage. This is the connected load within the daylighted zone. Um, 90.1 2019 Addendum O, I believe it's titled, just recently changed theirs to 75 watt in the primary zone and 150 in the secondary, primary and secondary zone. Uh, Levi uh, shared this with a bunch of us in advance. He also had a small working group. Um, uh, I believe California Title 24 is, their value currently is higher than this, but they're, uh, they also hadn't changed it in a number of years. And they were also uh, 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 building on the work that 90.1 did. So I, I think we're all kind of getting to the same number very quickly. Um, and I'm super supportive of it. Um, it's small, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a good change. Okay, thanks. Anybody else have a comment? Dwayne, your hand is up. Sorry, that was a leftover hand up. <laughs> your arm's gonna get tired. All right, anybody else have comments on this? Okay, so the homework was done, it was brought back, it has um, a different uh, method in it. Um, I'll entertain a motion to move this forward if nobody else has comments. Motion to move it forward as written. Second. We have a motion, we have a second. Any further discussion? Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. Okay, motion passes. We are on to 99, 199. Um, Non-visual lighting. This is a Michael Meyer one. So Mike, Michael Meyer, do you wanna? Uh, so this was a, a small word changing that I s proposed. Um, uh, just the issue as, as we move into circadian lighting, which is lighting that is a non-visual application, um, the, people could misconstrue this. Um, I had originally tried to remove this. We kind of wordsmithed it on the fly. I apologize. I didn't upload the new version. I looked at 90.1 um, and 90.1 has two, uh, has a number of ex exceptions, um, but I, I think they're good. And so what I would propose is just changing this. And I apologize again for not putting it out there uh, in this printed version yet um, was just saying life 
uh, lighting for life support of non-human life forms and for food warming slash preparation, which I think is A, the examples that are pro somewhat provided and B covers last time when there was a discussion about uh, laboratories and animal grow or uh, plant animals in laboratories, non-human life form covers most of that. And then also, and food prep and, and warming covers almost everything you would want. There are other exceptions in 90.1, but they're actually listed very similarly in your number five, um, and, and in other sections. So I think this is, again, the right change uh, and who's ever making the change, thank you, um, but also and food warming slash preparation, uh, just in case, not that I honestly cook, so I don't really know how food lighting works in food prep, but someone will tell me, maybe an easy bake oven. Um, anyways, so um, yes, th that would be the proposal I, I suggest. And yeah, that would be those lights over the French fries that you see at drive-in. It, isn't that the warming, Dwayne, or is that actually, are the lights cooking it? Uh, those are those are those are cooking. I mean, those are oh. those are warming. Those are just keeping them from getting cold. Right, uh, and keeping the meat patties warm and the buns warm. And... I, I get the warming. It's the it's what what lighting and food preparation. That's where I'm a little confused. But again, I'm not well, a chef. I don't think preparation needs needs to be there. And I, and I like that with non-human life forms, you picked up extraterrestrials as well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, well, you should cover them as well. I don't know why preparation is in there either. Um, I guess I don't know what lighting one needs for. I, I, I'm not. I, honestly, I'm not sold on the preparation. Where I, it was just what we have. I, but again, I don't work in commercial kitchens, so I don't know what the words are or what the issues are. And I have worked in commercial kitchens, and I don't think there is such a thing. So I would be fine with removing the, the preparation part. Okay. And then, so, uh, Michael, does this then reflect what you wrote, um, what you want in the proposal? Yes, please. As you're, you're, missing, okay. you're missing a couple words he asked for. Before non-human life forms, it was for support, life support of or support of? Oh, good call, Dwayne. Uh, yes, uh, I think that is the right words. Uh, life support of non-human life forms. Yep, thank you. Okay, so this, is there any other comments? <clears throat> motion to okay. approve. All right, we have a motion, do we have a second? Come on, I know some of you support light non-human life forms out there. Second. Okay, we have a motion and second. Further discussion. Um, uh, I think I'm sorry. I'm I'm catching an error here. Uh, oh, the oh, it's the zero watts two per square foot. I'm just making sure that conversion's correct. Um, sorry, it was thinking out loud. Oh, you know what? Um, now that you mentioned that, didn't we just? approve another amendment that changes that 0.02 to 0.01? Yes. As well as that, I think the person whoever did that conversion did it backwards. I, if my math is right, well, if you're using 0.01, then it should be 0.176. I don't know if we need that many decimals, though. I would say 0.1. Um, 7.6 is fine. Yeah. Because there's 10.7 watts per meter. 10.76 watts per meter squared is one watt uh, per meter squared. So, yeah, that, that looks right. Should be 107? 107, yeah. Or 108? Uh, correct. 108 is fine. We'll give them that extra hundredth of Thousand, a hundredth thousandth, of, yeah, four thousandth of a watt per square meter. Okay. All right. We have a motion and a second. Is this considered friendly to those who made the motion in the second? Yes. Okay. Uh, all in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed, say nay. Okay, we are on to
plant light efficacy. Sean. Good afternoon. So I was not at the meeting where we where you discussed this, but I had good notes from my associate. Uh, we don't have any trouble with uh, any problem with moving the the threshold for the exception down uh, to ten. That is fine with us. That was a negotiated number that came out of California, and if a different number is appropriate for Washington, we fully support that. Even support taking it out entirely if you feel like it. Um, there was a question about lighting controls, which I think we just answered that yes, in fact, plant <laughs> growth support, or I should say uh, non-human life form lighting support is subject to time controls. Um, the only other thing from the discussion that we had to, uh, from that I had in my notes for homework is that there was previously uh, requirements for plant growth around that was oh. lumen based. And this is, uh, I don't see it in the integrated graph and integrated draft, which makes me think that it did not come through, which is a good thing. This was an approach to efficiency for plant growth lighting uh, that preceded us having this good metric that we could use. And that approach should be retired at this point. Um, if there are any other questions, we think this looks good. Any comments, questions? Mike, um, in light of the last proposal, the change uh, for plant growth and maintenance, should that be uh, married to the last uh, supportive light, uh, not uh, light growth or whatever the terminology we used previously was? Um, it's, this shouldn't be tied to that terminology because this is specific to plants and really doesn't apply to, I guess, other light forms, <laughs> life forms. Um, this, this metric is really about plant growth and should really only be applied to plants. Motion to approve. We have Mo Michael Meyer. Oh, I'll wait to comment. Okay, we have a motion, do we have a second? Second. Any further discussion, Mike Meyer? Yeah, I just want to echo support. I think it's good. I think the reduction is fine. I just just wanted to be a, a, a cheerleader. Yay. All right. Um, we have a motion. We have a second. Uh, let's vote. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. Okay. Passes. Thank you, everyone. Oh, to connected power, and this is Michael Meyer. Michael, do you want to talk about what changes may have happened in this one? Uh, yeah, I actually, uh, again, I apologize. This is one I didn't make the change for because I, I, I failed my homework, it looks like. Um, in short, the change proposed here was to reduce the uh, watts per linear foot. This is what the track, a line voltage track is rated at. Um, that is not, uh, uh, that the, the reason why it's a shift is that as we move from halogen to LED, there's just less power on the track. Uh, the, the heads are more efficient, those type of things. Um, 90.1. Uh, did adopt a, a, a 10 uh, watts per linear foot, um, IEC, I don't have my number, for, excuse me, I don't have my notes in front of me, but I believe this is the IEC number. Um, uh, the, the, the 16 watt, um, I think was, re was recently changed there. Uh, during the tag, there was an agreement that a smaller number may make sense, but it may not be the eight number. And I, I, I apologize, I realized I did not reach out to people to get a consensus on this. Um, uh, there was a suggestion of either 10 or 12 watts. Um, uh, again, this is just how you rate the track. It doesn't affect the, it, it really kind of affects how you, when you try to do the back end calculations to determine the retail allowance, it's a helpful thing to know. Um, but uh, it, it, it just kind of essentially affects how much track you can have in the space. And as the power density values have come down, it really kind of needs to come down as well because of the shift to more efficient sources. Okay. Are there comments on this? Um, I remember there was a discussion on on how many watts per linear foot, and there wasn't um, 
a group to to further discuss this. CJ, Andrew, others, CJ. Yeah, um, I'm actually fine with leaving it as it is. I did an assessment of this myself. I think we talked about this briefly during our preview. Um, in terms of the products that are out there in the marketplace, I'm seeing that we really are specking 16 watt fixtures on tracks now and then. So I guess I'm fine with leaving it at 16 watts, 52 watts. Um, okay, right now what's on the screen is eight watts and 26 watts. Yeah, which would be an advantage to people like me. So I'm saying for the purposes of um, making the code more restrictive, I think that keeping it at the 1652 is actually uh, fine. Thank you. Anybody else have a comment on this? Uh, I, I just wanted to ask CJ, what's the frequency of the spacing of the heads? I would say really no closer than 18 inches. I mean, everyone's, I mean, heck, you don't, you don't know. You don't know what you're lighting. That's the whole point of track. The whole idea is you're giving yourself like a, a watts per linear foot um, unless you use a current limiter. Um, I, I've been struggling lately with finding uh, there are certain products where they don't use current limiters. You simply have to feed at the power supply that's feeding the track. And so then you have to analyze, okay, what's the, probably the likely quantity of heads that I'm gonna have on it. And looking at the quantity of heads that we're having on tracks, I think that the 16 watts is actually pretty reasonable. And Mike Meyer, what, uh, what did you say that we went to it at 90.1? We went to 10. Now we did um, a pretty thorough evaluation of um, many different analyses, one that involved just scaling, another that looked at a couple of different reports, um, a couple that also looked at um, uh, the availability of, of Energy Star products, and we can talk about why Energy Star, but anyways, and then we looked at a couple combinations of spacing of uh, one foot, two foot, and, and, and many different con uh, comparisons. Um, and, and, and really, I, this ultimately has a low impact on the energy, but ultimately why the change needs to happen or why it helps happen is that when we go to make the change for the retail allowance, in in the uh, LPD, it allows the LPD to come down because you can use a little more track uh, because it's not uh, being uh, overly counted. So, so that's the full background uh, on the proposal. But we're not proposing to reduce the display light this cycle. I understand. I'm just trying to say how they're related. Andrew. Andrew, I don't hear you. Mike Kennedy. Yeah, I just wanted the, the background on the 16 number was um, based on real old field work at this point, but really based on track lighting out of Seattle um, that found quite a bit higher numbers than have ever been assumed in 90.1. Um, and a kind of a progression from that point. Um, and so I'm not sure I feel comfortable going down to 90.1 level. I mean, I, th I think we have some, some evidence that says the 90.1 levels are maybe a little too uh, low for what's out there. So, so are I, you in favor of 16 there. and 52? I like 16, yeah, and 52. Okay. Andrew. Sorry, I was on a double mute. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I would agree with the 16 and 52. Um, Mike, you were saying you did some analysis down, but it was a high ceiling looked at. I recently worked on a project trying to use some track for a high ceiling 12 foot and the lumens in order to get the max to min ratio um, out there wasn't working. And the only fixture I could find out there that could do it was a 22 watt fixture. Uh, great question. Um, we did not vary our analysis by mounting height. Um, I, I would echo kind of what CJ has said. It's a little bit of a guess. My only comment would be that as your ceiling height increases, yes, your wattage is going to increase, 
but you tend to, I'm not going to say always, you tend to also increase your spacing a little bit. So while it's a 22 watt fixture, you probably are pushing beyond that 18 to maybe two feet um, for different reasons. Yeah. So, so all I'm saying is that as you increase wattage with height, your spacing also may change. Uh, but I, I, right. I'm not advocating hard on this. I, it, it, okay. But it's yeah. what, I'm, what I'm hearing is, is okay. general I'm reading curious. around 16 and 52. And if we're in general, if the lighting folk among us are general agreement about that, I would rather just move this forward unless there's. Um, but if it's 16 and 52, wouldn't that be. Yeah as it is currently in the integrated draft and therefore yeah, cor not correct forward? if the general consensus and i i don't know if you can do a stravo but if the general consensus is the 16 and 52 i will withdraw it well i could just um uh move to disapprove this um uh, this uh amendment we have a motion on the floor i'll second that Motion in a second. Further discussion? Okay, all in favor of disapproving this, in other words, keeping the 16 and 52, say aye. 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 Any opposed, say nay. Okay. Great. We are on to... Additional entire lighting power of 94. This is CJ. Do you want to talk about any changes that may have happened since our last tag on this? Yes, please. Uh, Krista, I actually emailed you uh, another Word document to have us look at. So basically, when we presented this proposal previously, the ultimate goal was to try to have Washington State more closely match ASHRAE relative to a handful of things that were part of the tables. But specifically because we were concerned that we are not given um, as much opportunity to make sure that our spaces can include artwork illumination and lighting for ornamentation purposes, specifically light art. Uh, and when we, what I proposed previously was the notion that we would actually just eliminate all the footnotes and uh, specifically footnotes uh, C and N and I got a lot of pushback. Uh, again, the way that ASHRAE has it described is they specifically talk about uh, having uh, for each space where lighting is specified to be installed in addition to the general lighting for the purposes of decorative appearance or for highlighting art or exhibits, uh, item uh, provided that the additional lighting power shall not exceed 0.75 watts per square foot of such spaces. So that's what it says in ASHRAE. We think that's way too high. Um, so we were suggesting something lower, but even that, I think I was suggesting 0.5, but that was just too onerous. So this proposal is actually to scrap the elimination of the footnotes and just go ahead and put footnotes in. Um, I just want to commend Mike Kennedy for letting me know that he actually does work on the energy code forms because I found a glitch in the energy code form, uh, which is one of the reasons why I wanted to change these footnotes because I felt like if, if the footnotes are causing problems uh, clerically that um, getting rid of them would be beneficial. But if we have somebody reliable like Mike to be able to make sure that we get this to work right, I feel better about leaving them in. I should clarify, I, CJ, I work on the city forms. Okay. The state, I used to work on the state, but they're now through the website. That's Lisa Rose now. Great. Well, Lisa's a terrific advocate too. And I know she was trying to find a way. She, we actually both discussed this as well. Um, we kind of came to the idea that it might make sense to just go ahead and keep with the footnotes. So. If you could scroll to, so let's just take a quick look at what C and N say as you have on your screen right there. So as a reminder, footnote C says, 
for spaces in which the lighting is specified to be installed in addition to and controlled separately from the general lighting for the purpose of, and we should get rid of that D there, uh, highlighting art or exhibits, provided that the additional lighting power shall not exceed 0.4 watts per square foot of such spaces. So this is what the current uh, footnote C says. I'm just, I edited some typos and actually that D um, gel was there because it needs to be acknowledged as a strike through. Um, uh, Krista, sorry. Um, so that's what our, our item C says. Item N is additional lighting power for ornamental lighting. And this is qualifying ornamental lighting includes yada, 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 yada. Frankly, I think it doesn't matter. And I think that this list of what those light fixtures are doesn't really, I think it actually gives people fodder for the idea that, oh, look, I could maybe have this thing be considered an ornamental light. It's not. It's specifically for the use of a decorative element that does not serve display or general lighting. It's a special thing. So I, I'm suggesting that it gets strike through that if people disagree with me, that's fine. But the reason why I'm mentioning C and N here is because then I wanted to go back and talk about which space types I think they should be applied to. So now, Chell, if you don't mind, can you, um, yes, let's just take a look at the first chart there. So I believe that we occasionally have light art that is happening inside of audience seating areas. You know, we could go and we could pick exactly which ones in this area should be allowed some sort of additional watts for an element that would serve light art, but I'm suggesting we would do it in this zone um, in audience seating areas. The next one down, and this is the one I care uh, greatly about, would be corridors about. This is a miss. I've noticed that in, in the Seattle code, there's an N that actually goes after this otherwise um, here in corridors. Um, it's missing from the Washington State code. So this one, I would really like to make sure we actually put the N in so it matches the Seattle code. Um, scrolling back up, is there any more on the left side, um, right side? No, okay, going down, um, stairwell. Uh, in the stairwell, I do think that there are public stairways where you might in fact have uh, an art wall. Um, I can think of a few, especially if the stairway is uh, a main public space. So I figured you should be allowed to have art in your stairway. Um, there is already a footnote N for stairways, which is great. However, the Seattle form doesn't work, which is why I flagged it in red, even though maybe it does for Washington. And moving on. So the next page, we have uh, proposals of footnotes for convention center exhibit space. Again, I think we do occasionally have- hey, CJ. hey CJ, I'm wondering if we go over the previous space and uh, previous page and then take any comments on that. Yes, that sounds um, fine. Does anybody have any comments on, on the proposed uh, notes and then see that are being put on there? Henry. Uh, yeah, for corridors, this would basically double the LPD allowance. Is that correct? Only if you have a light art element, which could be whatever wattage it happens to be. Okay, and what is defined as a light art element? Well, previously it's been defined as if you scroll down to the N definition. Can we clarify you're talking about adding C and N to that category, CJ? Uh, correct. And in, in uh, so. um, again, in Seattle, we under corridors, it does exist already. Okay, so ornamental lighting includes luminaires. Um, it was such as chandeliers, sconces, lanterns, neon or cold cathode, light emitting diodes, theatrical projectors, moving lights under light colored panels when any of these lights are, um, and it didn't say that are specifically, but I was hoping to add that, used in a decorative manner that does not serve as display lighting or general lighting. This is if you want to have, like, you get off your elevator corridor and you want to be able to put something that is um, in the space, like a piece of neon or something like that, or you want to have one down at the very end of a hallway so you see it as you're walking towards it. Um, specifically corridors, especially in hotels, uh, we have found are really, really tight on their on their uh, LPDs. And do these kind of lights have any sort of uh, lighting control regulations or would they just be on full all the time? Um, if you want to have a regulation about a 
I don't know, 50 or 200 watt neon thing. I, we could talk about that, although I would, that, that's not under the purview of what this section is about. Okay, I'm just concerned about maybe like a wall sconce or art between two entry doors on every wall that would be on full bore and double the LPD. That's all I'm really looking at. Um, I don't think they would double the LPD. I do think though, in the grand scheme of things, the amount of wattage that we're talking about on say a 10 story hotel, even if you did have two decorative things that were supposed to be um, anchoring something, uh, you would certainly be talking about less consumption than what you probably have in your kitchen by half, if not a quarter. Okay, that's my only comment. Thank you. Okay, are there other comments on the first few on this page of footnotes that? Um, I guess I was concerned about adding the two budgets. I almost would rather just see art display light be part of N and just have a single footnote there instead of the two separate ones. But well, I, I think there are going to be situations where you want to, we, we might want to provide for, for art and display lighting, but not to also have a general decorative lighting. Okay. just seems like a lot of places we're adding stuff. Michael Meyer. Um, so so I, I actually misread this. I still like the proposal though. Um, in 90.1, the art and decorative are in the same category. So basically uh, it's a slightly higher value, but to, to make the argument of, well, you might want to want a, an ornamental fixture there and then a decorative fixture here or a light artwork here. But ultimately, at the end of the day, I don't want to say it's non-functional lighting, but it, it's meant to make the space better. And, and it's just kind of a catch-all. Uh, I think it's fine the way you separated it. I was just mentioning that. So because you, you right now technically have it in two categories. So you could, in theory, do 0.7 watts if, if I'm reading this correctly where and, and 90.1's combined category is 0.75 and we're actually trying to lower it but so all i'm trying to say is i th think if i'm reading this correctly you could let's say do a corridor you could have artwork the functional lighting and the ornamental and i don't know if that's i think that's where you're starting to get a little beyond it i, I do like how you guys have pinpoint where you can use them i just uh i don't know if you want to either reduce the wattage a little bit for the ornamental lighting or if um or, 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 or the, just the idea of possibly combining them. Uh, but I, I just want to provide a second opinion. Sorry. Thanks. Mike Fowler? A uh, clarifying question, and I think it's similar to what may have been just asked. Just use the corridor example if the lighting is uh, 0 0.41, and if you did install one ornamental light, my question is, does that make the entire corridor go up to 0.71 or is it, does a corridor stay at 0.41 and then you also now have a budget of 0.3 for ornamental lighting? It's additive. It's additive, so it would be 0.71 for the entire corridor? Right. O only yeah. if you're, it's used for that purpose. Right. So you could, put, you could put a ton of watts in one fixture in one location in that space but it has to be used for that purpose. And but if you start with 0. 0.41 as the lighting power density, and then you add 0. 0.4 and 0. 0.3 to that, you end up with, with a lot more total wattage. Right? I guess my question is, if I stuck one ornamental light in a corridor, does my entire corridor go? I mean, I know the, you know, from a lighting design's perspective, you would have them spaced, you know, every 20 feet or something. And, and but I just want to clarify this, if I stuck one, ornamental light in a corridor, does yes. that you know, make it jump the entire yeah. corridor or is it, is it specific to the ornamental lights? That is your budget is 0.3. I think the answer is no. If, if your one ornamental light equaled 
0.3 watts per square foot of that whole space, then the answer is yes. But let's just say it was a small ornamental light. You would just get whatever wattage there is for that ornamental light. The, the general lighting would still be a 0 0.41. But if you install a whole bunch of ornamental light, you'll get, you get up to 0 0.3 watts of ornamental. Uh, does that answer it? That that answers that your answer is what is what resonates on my mind. Um, I just don't know that the footnote specifies that specifically. And CJ, I thought mentioned a word that would help clarify. You know, specifically for I think that may have been what you had mentioned, CJ. But I don't want to put words in your mouth. You know, that if it was uh, 0 0.30 specifically for ornamental lighting, if that would help clarify, um, it doesn't in, enlarge the general lighting number. Now that we've removed the fixture list, maybe, yeah. No. CJ? Yeah, and I'm, I'm looking at uh, an example form right now, and Mike, to your point, um, it is specifically for wattage that's associated with those lights that you will establish as being for the purposes of either type C or type N in those specific spaces. And then the comment about that, that are specifically used in a decorative manner, I think does help to address that concern. Okay, yeah, and then yeah, I was reading the first sentence and I didn't know that I caught um, the that are specifically used for uh, within the other strikeouts. So I made my eyes just may have missed that, but thank you for clarifying. I think N could be clear. C, C seems very clear to me, but I'm not sure N is quite quite so clear. David, ready? Um, yeah, I'm concerned with the, the addition of this footnote to number of spaces and, you know, using the corridor as an example. Um, that's a lot of extra power for, you know, kind of doing what is, seems hap to happen, which is uh, some kind of lighting around the, the unit number of apartments and whatnot, um, which, yeah, like Henry noted, would double the total power of these corridors. So I think you could see people arguing that it's ornamental <laughs> and getting that extra power. So are you suggesting maybe we reduce that number uh, for ornamental lighting or for uh, decorative lighting? Or just not adding it to as many of these spaces as proposed. CJ. Yeah, I just want to remind people that we're not talking about a significant load here. I mean, let's just say you did in the design of your corridor want to add a single watt or a two watt little tiny pin spot on your sign. Are we really going to tell people they can't do that? Well, I guess how many watts per square foot is that, that pin light uh, added up over the corridor? Okay, so let's say you have a corridor that is 700 square feet and you're adding like a two watt pin spot at 20 doors. I think that we're talking about a very insignificant addition of, of light. If that were to be the type of device we're talking about, but yeah. So that's, yeah. The way the code language is defined here, it's it's permitting a lot more than that. Yeah, yeah this is Henry. I, I it got, would be a 0.05 watts. Yeah, I got 0.05 as well for that example. So that we have math people on it. Um, so at least for corridors, perhaps 0.4 would be a, a bit more generous than is needed. Um, Michael Meyer. So again, I, I'm I'm supportive of the proposal. In 90.1, as I mentioned, we had a combined one. I, I think if you and I am going to be completely arbitrary here. I think if you took down one or the other by uh, a few hundredths of um, so. I don't know when the last time your additional your ornamental lighting number was changed, but here you've got a 0.4 and a 0.3. Uh, I would say that uh, you're. I don't again. I don't know the age of those, but I'm guessing they're a little old. And I bet if you dropped one of those numbers down a little bit, you're. I mean, I think our combined 
90.1 decorative allowance, which is both C and N. I think we're, we're now at 0.75. I think we're going to end up at 0.5. And I think if you brought one, if you brought C or D, uh, C or N down a little bit, I think you would uh, address some of the concerns. Uh, but I am supportive of what you're trying to do, CJ. Could I mention that it, in the Seattle code, which we worked out pretty much with the same gang, for corridors, we have an additional 0 0.25 for combined display and decorative lighting. And I judged that to be necessary when I did some quick calculations. And, and I think just about every hotel corridor around uh, needs that. Um, but but 0 0.4 is, is weirdly high as far as I'm concerned. So what I'm what I'm hearing is, I guess what I see is, this this code proposal is fairly different than the code proposal that was originally um, proposed. In other words, the original code proposal, I don't see CNN being added to lots of stuff. Um, and then I think we're also talking about what the wattage is here. I would I would hope we could. Um, I think this would take a long time if we tried to resolve it today. Um, I'm hoping that uh, CJ, you could convene a few people and, and come back with something that is, 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 is more acceptable to this group because I've been hearing lots of discussion. Does that sound, does that sound good, CJ? Um. I, I am amenable to that. I do think that if the issue is the value to which we're adding it, I think we could potentially approve this with the notion that we're going to take a look at what that value is more specifically, and we could banter that about. There are a couple of, of items I wanted to address as part of this code change proposal, which are still the same as the previous code change. But if you scroll down, I can e explain what those are. Yeah, and I think the two elements that, that I think would require further discussion on where does CNN apply and the numbers within CNN. Sure. Uh, but other things, let's go for it. Okay, scroll back up just a bit. There you go. Oh, no, too far. Um, no, down to the beginning of C405.4.2.201. Okay, so I found that the comment to turned off during non business hours and what seems like it, this is covered in another section and doesn't need to be listed here. So I felt like striking it out would be a better clarification since it just says it's controlled in accordance with section blah, blah, blah. Um, then as to the two other lower uh, updates, um, there didn't used to be two items. So this would be separating it into two. And this is one that I'd love to get this group's feedback on. We do have projects where they are trying to do tunable white or a tunable color light to be able to deal with circadian stimulus. This uh, we talked about briefly during our last um, meeting. I think Arena may have had some actual metrics on this, but for tunable white, you're talking about power that is essentially doubling the load of the product, except they're not necessarily turned on at the same time. So this is simply stating that for luminaires serving circadian lighting stimulus, Specified fixtures with tunable color or white light may be listed at 50% connected load. I think what we asked in the earlier one was, could, if those fixtures, would they be limited to only ever providing 50% of the connected load or would they be capable and likely to exceed that 50% connected load? that it's how they work is they blend their LEDs together. Again, I think Arena had some metrics on this that she shared last time. Okay. Michael Meyer. Uh, this is another one. I'm, we tried this on 90.1. We're still stuck in some language on it. I am supportive of the concept. I would love to see Arena's data on 50%. Our numbers say something different. The other concerns I have is that uh, the problem, the challenge I didn't see was a supporting definition of circadian lighting stimulus. 
I didn't know which metric was being proposed. And I, I worry that that gets into a conundrum. Um, also, it doesn't have to entirely be done with tunable. And then I think the other thing that does need to be required here is that you're using a time clock or a network control. So you aren't, you are not, you're providing the stimulus only for the required period of time. Uh, Again, I'm actually supportive of this. I just think it needs uh, some word changes and a little tweaks. And I'd be willing to uh, trade some emails back and forth with you. But I, I just think as written, it, it opens the door for, um, also I think it actually should be applied to spaces like the, the footnotes we just looked at. Um, for instance, I wouldn't actually put a, uh, a circadian stimulus in a hotel, uh, in an ambient, uh, uh, in a transitory space like an atrium or a corridor, and and I think it's important. Uh, and someone might say, well, we want white tuning in there, and so I think it's important to s specify those spaces. Um, again, I'm supportive of the concept. I think it's where the industry needs to get to. It's just a hard way. It's hard getting there, uh, and I would love to help out any way I could. Thanks, Michael. Arena. Hi, um, so I just wanted to chime in. I don't actually have any data. Um, I was, I think where we left it was, I was gonna try to reach out to the Design Lights Consortium uh, to get some data because they have uh, requirements for white tunable lighting and they collect test reports from manufacturers. I wasn't able to um, get anything from them. And I think CJ um, was going to reach out to some manufacturers as well, but uh, I wasn't successful, um, CJ. I don't know if you have, if you, if you got anywhere with that. Nope. <laughs> okay. Honestly, um, can I respond to the um, yeah, okay statement really quickly? Please. Um, I actually would be fine with striping, striking any reference to circadian lighting stimulus as part of the statement, because what I really care about is the fact that there may be a reason that somebody might want to do tunable color or tunable white light. That's a regular thing we're seeing on jobs. And it's just unfortunate that even if the fixture is not going to be used at its actual connected load because of the way that the product works, we have to rate it as such and it screws up the LPAs. So I, if we struck serving circadian lighting stimulus and simply had for, lum, for, for specified luminaires or for luminaires with tunable color or white light, they may, or luminaires serving blah, 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 may be list, may well, be listed for that. Since we're wordsmithing, CJ, I guess the other question I had, and I forgot to mention it, was the 50% connected load. I was confused by that. So if the fixture is rated at 30 watts, does that mean I'm using 45? Or if the power density is 0.5 watts, I'm counting 0.75? I, the connected load was throwing me off. I didn't understand what that actually referred to. Uh, it would be that if the fixture was uh, input watts, 100 watts maximum, that you wouldn't have to list it in your LPA energy form as 100, you would be able to list it as 50. Okay, I apologize for completely being obtuse about that. Um, I, I still, I'm our numbers we're seeing of, of tunable, we're seeing a much lower differential, um, but I, I at least understand where you're going. I'll be quiet, I, I, I jumped in, I apologize. No worries. All right, so I think CJ, can you convene a group? Um, uh, not in the next two weeks, I can't, but if this is something that we can try to do some email back and forth on, we could do that. Okay. Um, does anybody else want to kind of convene the group and include CJ? I can do it. Okay, thank you, Irina. Who wants to be in the group? I'd like Chris Walgamat to be in it with Nia. Wayne? Uh, I'll play along. And I think this Andrew. Group... I'm sorry, go ahead. Sorry, Andrew, um, on that list, please, Irina. Okay. And also volunteer Sean Dara. I see he's on. And I think this group would look at the entire proposal, not just, not just the uh, circadian lighting section, oh. ideally. Oh. I guess I'd like to be on that then, Mike Kennedy. 
I would volunteer Chris Walgamot there on behalf of NIAP. I just heard somebody, but it was really quiet. I think it was someone also volunteering Chris Walgamot from NIA. Okay. I think it was Shilpa. That's right. Okay, there you are. Okay, so we're gonna table this and we don't need a motion to table it, I don't think, do we? We'll just take it up later. Okay, we're almost through lighting. So this is Daniel Salinas. I didn't see Daniel in the meeting. Is, is anybody prepared to speak about this? Uh, Mike Meyer can, I read it. I don't know if others wanna, but if not, I, I can take a stab at it. Go for it, please. Um, I'm sorry, I'm grabbing my notes. I'm skimming to them real quickly. Uh, so this is adding in a, a proposal for unfinished spaces. Uh, the idea is that in an unfinished space, you may not have all the lighting you need. Um, and therefore, um, you might have to meet some egress lighting. So this adds in a, comment, uh, a footnote O, which the first, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll explain it before I, I, I comment on it. Uh, so where a space is designated as unfinished, uh, the LP, the power density shall be based on the building specific space. So for instance, if your office space was uh, uh, ex expected in the future, it would be listed as unfinished office space and you'd get that lighting power density. And lighting for the space shall meet the life safety requirements for illumination at the paths of egress designated uh, for building plan to review. So it's kind of trying to say, we may, you know, if you read this forward, they may put a couple strip lights out there for, for uh, safety reasons uh, for egress, but they want to have this unfinished category. Uh, th that was the overview. Um, I, I was confused by it for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, I, I actually don't know if it would make sense as a footnote O, because then based on your footnote table, I think it would technically have to apply to almost many things in the table, or it's a general footnote, but then it's not really a footnote. Um, and then I, I personally didn't understand it of how the power density should be, what, what you use with the power density. So is that for rating the electrical system? Uh, or, or or something else. I was very confused if it's unfinished and they put a strip light out. Um, if they're only putting strip lights out, of course they're going to meet the power density because they've, they've put the bare minimum amount of light because they didn't finish the space. So I, I, I read it, but I, was, I didn't have any more and I was confused by it. Thank you for, uh, for pinch hitting there. Uh, Mike Fowler? Yeah, I just pull my notes back up. Um, when we reviewed this um, in our pre-phase prior to uh, being passed on to, by the uh, Code Council, um, it noted that um, in C405.4.2, uh, it has buildings with unfinished. I, what I'm going to say is that I feel this is already addressed in the code um, because buildings with unfinished spaces shall use the space by space method. And then within space by space method, where a building has unfinished spaces, the lighting power allowance for the unfinished space shall be the total connected lighting power for those spaces or 0 0.2 watts per square foot, whichever is less. So I feel like it's already covered in the code and this is not a needed proposal change proposal. Unless, unless somebody's got something other different, but it seems to be covered from my review in the code already. Thanks, Mike. Mike Kennedy? Um, I just wanted to say that um, I feel, and I think both the previous two people kind of mentioned it, but it seems like there needs to be some statement about how to handle the proposed lighting <clears throat> if we're giving them credit for the LPD of a future use, but they're just install, installing life safety lighting, it seems like they're gonna kind of do really well relative to code. Um, so I found it kind of confusing that way too. I guess there's there's a couple of approaches. One is the Mike Fowler approach, which is it's already covered in code. 
therefore we would not need this. The other one would be to modify it to make more sense. Um, how many with your reactions think of the tag members and alternates think that this is something that's already covered in code and therefore we don't need it? Yeah, I see a bunch of thumbs up and then also some hands up. So, uh, uh, Henry. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think uh, my light understanding of it is to not be able to use unfinished spaces with emergency egress lighting as a means to lower your overall LPD. Um, maybe what Mike just mentioned where you have to go to space by space method, method kind of fixes that, but I imagine this is what the proposal's probably trying to get to. So you can't use a future office space to lower your whole building LPD and load up lights somewhere else because the TI finishing up that office will have a different permit um, and they won't be beholden to the rest of the lighting power density. That's my understanding at least. Yeah, so are you, are you, do you think this is uh, necessary and good and, or, and need, maybe you need some wordsmithing or are you on the, in the camp of not necessary? Um, I don't think I can confirm that this is the correct language, but I think that is a hole in the code that could be fixed and I imagine this might be a method to do that. Okay, great. CJ. Yeah, I think that I also am not in favor of the code change proposal as it is written. And I am also not in favor of having unfinished spaces be part of the lighting power allowance table because I think that that is an excuse to get more watts for space that you're putting stumble lighting in. Um, but I think that the reason why this is being presented is that it is a, a hole in the just from a human understanding as to that unfinished space thing that Mike's talking about, Mike Fowler was talking about. I think that it's just a, an area of some confusion. So I think we need to try to find a way to make it easier for people to understand that unfinished spaces cannot be considered with the rest of the actually occupied space on a project. And maybe it's just making some tweaks to language or finding a way to highlight that a little bit more. Okay. Yeah. I'd like to say that I, following CJ, that as kind of an unfriendly amendment here, that that we'd say where a space is designated unfinished, um, the lighting power density uh, shall not be um, calculated, or the lighting power density or the area shall not be calculated, uh, because because it, it it's absurd to add in some some uh, stumble lighting. That kind of makes sense, yeah. If you, if however, that's that's a fairly hostile amendment to Dan's thing, so I think that that more appropriately, we would just um, I would vote to disapprove this. Okay. Um, I, it also sounds like, based on other testimony, that this wouldn't be a an O uh, subscript. It would be somewhere else in the code. Um, so that also complicates it. Mike Kennedy? Well, I had two things. One is um, an earlier conversation on a previous meeting um, led me to believe there were some uh, issues with unfinished space in C406 um, and the treatment of unfinished space there. And kind of feels like an area that does need to be revisited uh, to make sure that's kind of clear. Um, and I guess to just address Henry's point, um, I feel like this just kind of perpetuates the whole in code unless it also addresses what you can claim for the proposed lighting. So just based on that, I would support, I guess, denying this, but I think it should be something we research a little bit, so. Well, if we generally agree that there's a hole in code and that this proposal's intent is to fix it, then we can, modify this proposal such that we fix the whole in code. That just seems like a good, good path, but I don't think we're going to do that today. Um, so we could, we could vote against it, vote it down today, or we could try and salvage the intent of it and modify the language heavily to, um, 
to where it's it fixes the whole encode. Um, Mike McGivern. We send it back to the proposer as a uh, as a uh, an amendment or a, you know motion to send it back to the proposer to modify to address the whole. Yeah, are you? That's a perfectly good motion. Do you want to make it? I make a motion. We send it back to the proposer to address the whole for unfinished spaces. Chris, is that clear enough to you? What what you would do? Yeah, I think I can move forward with that. If there's a second. Okay. Yeah. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay, we have a motion. We have a second. Further discussion? Yeah, I was just trying to quickly write something to substitute myself. Uh, and what I've got is, is where a space is designated as unfinished, neither the area nor the lighting power in the space shall be calculated in a lighting power density. I mean, I think that sounds good. So I, I guess I don't know our jurisdiction here. Can we modify this without the proponent in the room and pass it? Or, or is there some other procedure? And I'm asking Krista and Duane because you have experience in this, perhaps. Um, I think that the proposer does have the opportunity to um, decide whether an amendment is friendly or not. Well, wait a second. No, we can we can make any kind of amendment with a, a vote of the tag, whether the proposer likes it or not. Right. They have. They can always go back to the committee uh, to either change it back or uh, withdraw it if they don't like the changes. Okay, so my understanding is if Dwayne suggested that we use his language and perhaps even put it in a different spot because we agreed this spot wasn't the best, then we could vote on it, vote it forward today if we wanted to. So Dwayne, do you wanna send that language to Krista or put it in the chat or something and then she can modify the proposal for that and then we can get perhaps consensus on that. CJ. Yeah, I just want to voice that I think that Dan would appreciate that. I think that he actually does specifically want clarification. I don't think he's looking to have unfinished spaces because he wants to get the watts for it. So I think Dwayne's proposal of changing the text and just sending it to him to, for a thumbs up is great. And I, I just put that in the chat. David. Uh, I mean, I support this change, but I think there is other language that needs to be modified and reviewed um, in addition to this change, like the C406, I think that Mike noted, what, how, are there any edits required there? And then also, I guess the question is, if we make this change, do buildings have to use, with unfinished spaces, have to use the space-by-space -space method? So Yeah, that would make sense. I mean, otherwise you could have an office building with 80% of the space unfinished with a tiny bit of, and and have just unlimited for every place else. But if you're deducting the area of the unfinished space from the building area, then- well, the building area just... method doesn't work that way. Oh. Um, one problem we have is the header of, I mean, I think Henry's right here. And if you look at the header of, the space by space method, it has some language that we would need to change if we're going to follow Dwayne's change below. Because it states specifically how things would be handled with unfinished space. So and there's two other, there's two other sections at a minimum that need to change just in this C405.4.2 section. Okay, um, so it sounds like we need to do a little bit more work.
before we could approve, before we want to approve this, approve this. Um, I mean, Mike, do you think that this is something that could happen in the next five minutes within this tag, or do you think this is? Take I'm not, not in rope in what's going on with C406 um, and also with C407 potentially, depending on what we do here. Um, I think we could make C405 consistent with itself. We, we, can deal with on C we can deal with 406 and 407 later, right? Yeah, that's what I was thinking. So if we, if we deal with C405.4 right now, then we could um, yeah. Then we can be done with this and then bring it up for C407 and 407. I also wonder, I, I haven't read the proposer's reasoning statement, but I mean, looking at C405.4.2.2, it's pretty clear. You know, that first sentence, um, that's pretty clear treatment of space by space. And um, the footnote seems to kind of I don't quite know where they're trying to go with that. Mike, is that sentence about what you actually can install or is that, I think the worry is that you could use that to trade off in your proposed calcs. Uh, I think that's what the footnote's saying. This is saying you can't do that. This is saying you have to, you have to, the allowance is whichever is less, 0.2, or, or if you only have 0.1 in there, you get to, you can, you use 0.1, and you get dinged if you have more than 0.2. So it may be that 0.2 is too low to get the needed egress lighting. I'm not sure. I guess to, to Dwayne's language, if you replace the unfinished thing with what he wrote, would that somehow, would that somehow correct it? I think it might. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know egress lighting LPDs, but if you put 0.1 in one of these unfinished spaces, then you're below that minimum number of 0.2 watts square foot. But if you just can't even include it at all in your proposed, that but might be a good backstop. That language says if you put in 0.1, then the allowance is 0.1. Oh, yeah, sorry, I see that, sorry. Um, and I think the I, one other concern would be if you do Duane's language, they could claim the unfinished spaces and put as much lighting as they want in it. Mm. And I, I don't know that that would happen, but I, I don't. Nobody, nobody over lights an unfinished space. If it's really unfinished. <laughs> it's an unfinished warehouse. Patrick. But I agree. I think we should treat it like we do these mixed use buildings. The commercial portion hasn't, um, doesn't have a designated tenant. And so we put all the installation in the walls and designate everything that um, is required. And then when we build the building, whether they insulate it or not, they have to insulate all the walls. When the TI permit is being done, if they do anything different than what is in the energy calcs, then they have to produce a whole new envelope. So the unfinished spaces, typically like Duane said, just get minimal lighting so that you can show the space and for fire life safety. And then as you don't know if a restaurant's moving in or an office and they all have different lighting power allowances. 
So yes, Dwayne, do you think this is something we can finish today? Um, I'm not exactly sure what the problem is, so I don't know how we would finish it. <laughs> Sorry. I, I, I kind of agree with Mike. I'm not sure what the problem is. We pull these permits all the time. I seems looking at the description, it seems like the, the egress lighting uh, requirement would change depending upon the use type of the space. But in unfinished space, there's there's no use type. No. Right. So would it work in, in C405.4.2.2 where it defines the space by space method? Would it work to put my sentence at the end of that first paragraph? Or replace, replace some of that. Yeah, because it already has this. And then it defines it. But if Dwayne, your sentence is about not taking credit for it, then that would actually be different. So we could just replace that first sentence with my sentence? And the one in, uh, there's also one in C405.4.2. The last sentence. But that one can stay. The last one just says you have to use the space by space method. Right. But you could actually just say you can't claim it right there. But whatever. I feel like if you replace it just in here, C405.4.2.2, you're good because you're required to use this anyway. Well, can I make that a motion? Well, I, I want to see the language, unless it's, it, I want to see the language on the screen <laughs> so that we have clarity on what we're voting on. Can somebody copy it out of the chat and onto the screen? I think Chris is doing that right now. Okay, All right. space is undesignated, is unfinished, neither the area nor the lighting power in the space shall be calculated as part of the LBA. Patrick, you still have your hand up. All right, does anybody have any comments on what is in front of us? So quick question, if we're, for Dwayne's proposal, you would be plugging in zero instead of 0 0.2 and not counting the area in, in that in those numbers. Because okay, that's what I'm trying to do. Is it like we're debating, are we 0 0.2 or zero? Zero. Well, I, I was saying that you, you wouldn't plug in any value or or you or the area. Neither the area nor the lighting would be calculated. Now be serious, just ignoring it. David, ready? Um, yes. So just I mentioned earlier. So this idea of a building with an unfinished space but otherwise fully designed, like a multifamily or office building with one retail space that is unfinished, they would be required to use space by space in that situation. Right. Is there a rash what a what's the rationale there? Well you're gonna fill in the unfinished space later and it's gonna be a space by space. Right, so you don't have the total amount of lighting power for the building uh, to calculate from. So a, a multifamily building with a, a 100,000 square foot multifamily building with a 1,000 square foot retail space would just, that, that um, approach, <coughs> excuse me, the building area method could not be used. All right. That's what the code says now, right? Yeah, uh, and that's why I'm kind of pushing back on that idea. I'm not too concerned because we typically only get space by space method calculations. I can't remember the last time we saw a building area. Calculation. Most all the multifamily projects we work on use building area. I guess to that end, this sentence could be added to 
the previous to the one where it directs you to use a space by space method, but that's that's already part of the code. So I don't know. I think we could we could if we wanted to pass this today, and then David, you could come back with some suggestion that would sure remove that. Does that sound good? Mm -hmm. David, why don't we email together? Sure. Okay. Um, is there a motion? There is a current motion on the floor to table it, so that'll need to be taken care of first. I remember that. There is a motion and there was a second. Um, can you remind me what that was for? That was, was to send it back to the proponent for revision uh, based on the discussion. Further discussion on that motion? Um, I think that instead, I'd rather uh, just um, disapprove of that proposal entirely. Or, or do we have to keep that alive in order to make this other change? I guess we do. Did you make the original motion, Dwayne? I can't remember. And it was Mike McGivern and Henry Odom. Okay, Mike, um, do you want to modify, Mike McGivern, do you want to modify your motion to uh, do, to do anything or uh, to like, like approve what's on the screen in front of us or anything else? Uh, I'll rescind the motion. So, Krista, on the language on the screen, you'll add back in the strikeout of a 0.2 watt? Because that existing language was deleted, right? Yes, there would need to be a strikeout. Yes. Okay, does anybody want to make a motion? Does anyone want to make a motion to either disapprove this completely or to perhaps approve what is on the screen? Except for the adding back in the straight out. I'd like to make a motion to approve what's on the screen with the understanding that David might come back with uh, some improvement. Okay, we have a motion. Is there a second? Second. We have a motion, we have a second. Further discussion? Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. Okay, so it passes. Uh, we are on, to, we're almost done with the lighting ones, um, almost to our envelope proposals that we were hoping to spend the majority of the time on today. Um, LPA compliance in existing buildings. This is Dwayne. Uh, yeah, this um, makes a, a, a language change because this is not, this is about receptacles generally, not just controlled receptacles. Um, and it, it, moves the threshold for uh, lighting for for the L LPA um, in, in alterations from 50% uh, uh, replacement of fixtures down to 20% replacement. This matches what's uh, been in the Seattle code for decades. Um, and and um, ooh, I see another an, another line of text in there in red. Um. I'm sorry, this is what was the uh, tag revision from the last time. Okay, well, I the wrong file again. The, 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 wis the wisdom of the people has spoken. So we have that clarifying uh, sentence added uh, by the tag last time. CJ. 
Yeah, I'm curious to know um, when, if we take this, and when it comes to projects statewide, um, that means that if you're doing a renovation of your, you know, your office lobby in Spokane, that you then need to install a new lighting control system to be able to cover uh, the new lighting that's being put in. If again, if you're doing any more than 20% of the, well, related to the levels you've got here. I'm just wondering if there's been a cost analysis done on that, because if somebody wants to like swap out their inefficient fixtures for something that's more efficient, are we going to be pushing them to maybe not do it because then they actually have to put in zero to 10 volt wiring. They've got to do other sort of controls that are going to make it more complicated for them and deal with the daylight harvesting. I, I get, I get it in Seattle. This is, it's kind of a, we, we are absolutely mandating people do it. I'm just wondering if there's a economic impact of this elsewhere. And I'm curious if this more than anything. I don't have a, an, an economic uh, impact. Um, uh, it, it was, it was the, the most, uh, it, it was our, our intention to move lighting power allowances to modern levels um, using, using the occasion of, a, of some kind of work on the lighting system as a trigger. Uh, the same thing happens in in uh, the the current state code, but it's it is um, uh, it's it's slower. Uh, so it happens when you when you replace uh, only when you replace half of the of the fixtures. So just to follow up, lighting controls then would have to be considered if someone is doing any updates. Uh, this is about the lighting power allowance, isn't it? Uh, not about lighting controls. Yeah. Um, so so it, it just says that when you when you hit that point, you have to comply with four hundred five point four and, and point five. Which is just the interior and exterior lighting power, and and so it doesn't have anything to do with controls. Um, that that happens at a at the next stage, but at, at this stage, uh, twenty percent of your lighting fixtures will trigger that that you have to have the whole room be um, comply with the lighting power allowance, not with any kind of control systems. Does that address your concern? Great, CJ. Mike Kennedy. Um, and I, I believe the IECC is at 10% and 90.1 is at 20%. So it, yeah. right. it's just state of Washington has been lagging behind on this particular metric. Okay, this seems like it's ready for a motion. Motion to approve. Second. We have a motion. We have a second. Further discussion? All right. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Well, this passes and we are done with our lighting. It only took us a few hours. We have 25 minutes left. Um, I would love to start getting into the definitions and envelope proposals, which is our next next topic. Um, we are behind in our where we are hoping to be, which means we'll need to schedule more meetings. And if anybody has any great ideas about how to move these more ex expeditiously forward, I would love to hear that. Um, I don't want to cut off comment, but I also want to make sure that we are using all of our times, our valuable times, uh, well. Andrew, you have something to say? 
Um, I was going to bring this up um, without the whole group, but um, seeing that we didn't finish, we finished lighting per se, but there are still some things that need to be addressed. Do you know when those will be addressed? And is there a, a time frame? Um, is there a time that we'll be voting? I'm asking because there is time I'm planning to be away and CJ plans to be away and trying to figure out schedules accordingly. So is there a deadline when the next votes will be in discussions? I realize there'll be working groups I have to work with. Um, yeah, so we're so curious about that. We, um, there's a general schedule and at the next one we'll, we were going to address chapter five and miscellaneous items as well as items remaining from our last couple tags. Um, obviously we didn't get very far today. Um, so Chris and I have to put our heads together and figure out what the schedule is going forward because we got through maybe half of what we were hoping to today. Um, and we're going to go into August for sure. Andrew, could you and CJ just um, uh, tell tell and, and Krista what what dates you need to black out? Yeah, yeah. we've done that. Yep. We we have done that, but I don't think y'all have known as well. So. Yep. Um, just send the dates you can't make it, and the CJ can't make it, and we will we'll we'll try to plan accordingly. Okay, that sounds fair. Thank you. Mike Fowler? It was uh, before our uh, main 10 o'clock feature and lunch. Um, and just in terms of wrapping up the lighting proposals of today, there was one earlier this morning where um, you asked CJ to provide some alternate language, which I kind of, I remember she put in the chat and I read it and I liked it, uh, but I just don't remember what proposal that was for. And if we wanted to address that change or pause it. I think that but was since CJ went to the effort of re rewriting that language, I don't want it to get lost. <laughs> I think that was 076. Was that correct, CJ? Uh, uh, it's the multi space one. I just put it in the chat again to as a refresher. Multiple use one. Is the interior lighting allowance? Yeah, it was 076, I believe. So what I was hoping was that this sentence of to serve one of the primary functions helps to clarify, Mike, what you were concerned about. Because again, sometimes the primary function isn't the name of the space type. So this allows us to look at what the typical uses would be and how the lighting could serve it. Yeah, and I think, I mean, I like what you rewrote and I think it's still gonna, it'll be necessary for project teams electrical engineer, lighting designer, architect, um, getting on the same page and labeling rooms what they should be. Um, but you know, that's that should happen anyway. But yes, um, this I did like the rewrite. Can I move to approve this then as written? You can make tag members can make motions at any point about anything they want. So if you're making a motion, then you are. Did you make a motion? Yes, are there further comments before CJ makes a motion? Go for it, CJ. I motion to approve this as edited. I'll second. second. May I have a second? Motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? Okay. All in favor, say aye. 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 aye.
Uh, any opposed say nay. Okay, thanks Mike for bringing this back up. Passes, we are now done for lighting for the day. Um, so we're on to 148 definitions. This is a Lisa one. I haven't heard much from Lisa today. I think she might be out. Um, a lot of these uh, were, were taken from, from uh, uh, Seattle code. I think that they were considered to, um, to be non-substantive, to just be all clarifications. Okay. Um, to what, how would you like to walk through these? Do you want to look at every one or? I think if, if Chris just scrolls through them slowly enough um, and anybody has any comments, they can bring them up. I feel like we reviewed these. Hmm. I think we reviewed a lot of these um, when we did not officially have them, so we couldn't make any motions to approve them. Now we have the power of making motions to approve these. On um, on a condition space, remember we talked about it, but I think air is intentionally transferred at a rate exceeding. Okay, I remember now. We we decided that that was a good thing. Do you agree, Mike Kennedy, that we all decided that? I, I believe so. I, I don't specifically, I remember that we debated this and that there was, I seem like a consensus position. I can't actually tell yeah, you the position. I think it was about that nobody was clairvoyant and this, this says it has to be mechanically transferred. Yeah, so I think we're good on the condition space, Shell. Great. Move to um, approve. Did you move to approve, Dwayne? I did. We have a motion on the table. Is there a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. Further discussion, and two people have their hands raised. So, uh, Mr. Cartwright? Uh, Dwayne, we, we talked before in, in town hall meeting at least once about a definition for central water heating. Um, was there any progress made on that? Uh, I don't know if we've, uh, I, I've, I've got one in the Seattle code that I, uh, this was not transferred in here, but that's, um, uh, I think that would be part of the water heating work, not, not part of this. It would still land in the same section. So you wouldn't, you wouldn't have a definition for central uh, service water heating. Well, it's not part of this uh, uh, right here. I I attempted to define it, like I said, in the Seattle Code. Okay. As a as a informational note. Yeah. Okay. So when we get when we get to central water heating, maybe we ought to kick around putting it in, including it in the state. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Hey, you ready? Yeah. Can I ask a clarifying question on on this? So an elevator or a stairwell that had an electric heater at the bottom of the stairwell, um, the, the entire stairwell wall, the walls of the stairwell would be considered part of the building thermal envelope and their and condition space. Is that the yeah. correct interpretation? Right. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Okay, we have a motion, we have a second. Um, further discussion? Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. Okay, passes. Um, there's some more definition cleanup under 224.
I mean, at the risk of, of appearing to be not very smart, is an unconditioned space just simply a space that does not meet the conditioned space definition? Uh, oh, conditioned space or semi-heated or low energy. Okay. Um, and, and, and furthermore, you can see the last sentence in that definition, it's a, 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 what's been a, always a, a question about whether your crawl space or attic is a, uh, a, is a condition, is, a, uh, is an enclosed space. Yeah, I guess I'm, if, if, we have, if we define condition space, are all other spaces unconditioned or is there some some spaces that are not unconditioned and not conditioned. This is interesting, Shell. Um, I mean, when you start labeling things like crawl spaces, attics, and parking garages, I kind of agree with you that if it doesn't meet the definition of conditioned, then it's automatically unconditioned as long as it, if it's still an enclosed space, like what's underneath the unconditioned. So, so what's, what's your question, Jill? Because I think that's, I guess, this is clear, especially that first sentence of unconditioned space. Yep. It's, it's a not space. a conditioned space. It's an enclosed space that's not a conditioned space a semi-heated space or a low energy space. So, I mean, they're technically though, they're not truly enclosed, Duane, because all spaces are all ventilated. They all have vents. It yeah. says it's. It, it says in that sense that it's not considered an enclosed space. Yeah, there you go. Oh, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm fine with it the way it is. Um, so, would the wall between conditioned space and semi-heat space be considered a thermal envelope? Yes, it is currently. It's, I don't believe the definition says that now. Yeah, it currently, that's a cold wall, Mike. So we could be losing that. Okay, is there further discussion? I guess what I say is we use this all the time. I, I'm going to go with someone's preview. I don't know that there's a problem. Okay. Uh, David Reddy. Um, <clears throat> well, on the air barrier definition revision, I think we had talked about that the um, the air barrier may not always be aligned with the building thermal envelope. That's true, David. That is exactly true. They're not always the same. Um, wh where? Building thermal envelope and air barrier are part of the same assembly. Nope. Nope. Sometimes we seal the building in a different path than we insulate it but it's still the air barrier, you know, still it includes the thermal envelope, but it may not be the exact thermal envelope. No, but the air barrier is preventing, what it says is it's preventing passage of air through the building thermal envelope. And that's what it does. Well, I don't think you need the thermal envelope because it's not always the same. I think just saying building envelope is acceptable. Uh, yes. No, no, that's not because oftentimes the building envelope and the building thermal envelope are two different things. If you have, you know, a, an enclosure uh, at, at your ground floor for your your um, lawn maintenance equipment, and it's it, that is unconditioned space. The building envelope on the outside is not the same as the building thermal envelope, which is separating that, that utility space from the inside of the building. So it's important to align 
that the air barrier is preventing air from moving through the building thermal envelope. It doesn't say it has to be aligned with it, it just says it's restricting and preventing air. That's right. Okay. Well, yeah, as long as it's, the interpretation isn't that it necessarily has to be aligned, I think that's fine. Is there further discussion on any of these definitions? Uh, Mike Fowler. I was just going to quickly point out that what is being proposed is adding the definition thermal to air barrier. That's exactly what's in the code. What the proposed is is just italicizing building thermal envelope because that's a new, that's a change definite or italicizing it because there is a definition for it. That's the proposed change in that statement of air barrier. Great. Okay. Is there further discussion or should we move forward with this? Motion to approve. Second. A motion, we have a second, further discussion. Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. Okay, passes. Low energy buildings. Might be the last one we discussed today. Actually, it's quite simple. Aaron Whitlatch proposed it, but it has one word change in it. Motion to approve. Second. We have a motion, we have a second. Further discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Say nay. Okay. Well, we have uh, two of them for semi-heated buildings, 130 and 158. Let's consider them. So the first one is a Mike Kennedy. The second one is a Dwayne Johnlin. So go at it, guys. Mike, you want to go first? Sure. Um, the semi-heat buildings limits you to gas heat. Um, these exceptions were added to allow other kinds of heat form. And it kind of introduced a, an issue that you could have as much electric infrared heating as you wanted. Um, and so my um, proposal was just to, let's see, is this my, which one's mine? The one with the highlighting is is mine, but but with uh, the, te the teal is your phrase added to mine. Uh, wait a minute. This so the one on the left is the Dwayne one, but Mike, you added the the blue part. Mm. Okay, let's talk about Dwayne's first. <laughs> so I I I'm. Uh, First, in that exception, I'm clarifying that 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 it, that that electric infrared heating equipment is not for for heating the whole space, it, and it follows the other rules, uh, uh, including insulating behind it and and having it controlled by an occupancy sensor. And then I removed the the thing that says anytime you have a heat pump for your heating. You can have all the heating you want in a semi-heated building, unlimited, um, and have it be a fully heated space. If you, I guess, take a wrench and whack it really hard so that the cooling capacity is disabled. Um, and to me, to have to allow fully heated spaces is just um, uh, and call it semi-heated is is absurd. So it's doing two things: it's getting rid of uh, allowing heat pumps for. Um, uh, for full for heating the space in a semi-heated building, and it's it's 
clarifying the restrictions for use of a, uh, electric infrared heating. Uh, what I'm picturing is, is like a repair garage I go to, you know, they have that, uh, the garage doors open, it's not, it's cold out there and they just have infrared heaters pointing at the mechanics so they don't freeze out there. Same with the desk in a warehouse where the guy checks in and, and out loads that are coming and going from the warehouse. Um, there's there's uh, an infrared heater pointing uh, at that desk. So, so um, and, and Mike's suggestion was, well, it shouldn't just be infinite, you know, so that somebody could try to get around this putting a, a thousand of those in. So I said, yeah, okay, we'll, we'll give it the same total um, heat, heat um, capacity limit that we have for semi-heated spaces generally. That's it. So my proposal has the three changes. The top two are actually coming out of Dwayne Seattle work and are clarifications from Seattle, the, the section on fenestration that forms part of the building thermal envelope and closing semi-heat shall comply. Um, and then replacing standard reference with baseline because we don't have the standard reference model now. Um, my version of the exception, I, I, um, it just says provided that the total heating and cooling capacity doesn't exceed the limit for in the definition, which is eight BTUs per square foot, you can have these two forms of heat. Um, and those are the two that are in the code currently. Um, and this is output capacity, not input capacity. Um, so I think the, the main difference with Dwayne's is the difference with a uh, heat pump. Um, and then I think uh, my one concern is that I feel like you could, with Dwayne's language, you could have eight BTUs of gas heat and eight BTUs of electric infrared. Um, so I, I'd be happier if Dwayne said provided the total heat capacity is less than, or something that, that made sure it was the aggregate of the infrared and the gas. So is this something that Mike and Duane agree on a better approach or are we? I, I agree with Duane's except for his, I wish the, I wish his exception had my first sentence. Well, um, not his yeah. highlighted bit. Well, well Mike, uh, I'm, I kind of want to leave in the the eight PTUs of of general heating um, that's that's allowable and and still allow them to have to have uh, an electric heater over a workspace here and there. You don't want to include that capacity in the eight. No, I I'd, I'd, I'd leave them separate, and I okay, well, we, we differ then. Okay. I disagree. I don't see why they should have more than eight BTUs a square foot. They should be able to heat their. Yeah, well, any mine, mine turn off those those uh, infrared things. I'm insisting that they turn off when nobody's there. They're controlled by ox sensors, so you can't you can't maintain even a minimal amount of heat in in the space with those uh, infrared heaters. <clears throat> Let's get input from a few other people. Um, Patrick. Um, well, I definitely like Mike's and Dwayne's. Um, the electric infrared heating equipment at eight BTUs per hour, which would be 3.4 watts. That's like nothing. And if you look at the electric infrared heating equipment, I mean, it, none of them are very powerful. So I, you're, I think you're just about outlawing it at eight BTUs per hour. Most of the infrared heating equipment is gas. And, you know, the small ones are, geez, they're, like 40,000 BTUs. So I, I, I don't think the eight BTUs per square foot, um, that's one, 
one watt per square foot, no, 3.4 watts per square foot, it's nothing. You're not, you're outlawing them, Dwayne. Um, what I'm saying is that you can have a few electric infrared heaters for specific spots where people work. And when the people come in there, um, or I guess it could also work for a, a, an unheated dining area or something like that, then the infrared heaters go on for that limited space for the limited time the people are there. That's what it's for. Uh, David Reddy. Um, I guess I was wondering, I mean, the, uh, I guess this provision, I guess, is generally only used to not insulate the walls, right? right. Um, and so there's up in the body of the section, you know, it says do not include electric resistance heating equipment. And I guess I'm, I've questioned why, you know, using a gas wall heater versus an electric wall heater is makes it such that you don't have to insulate walls in these spaces. In, in this case, once again, I'm not heating the space. We have, we have a, a specific radiant heater, which heats the things that it's looking at, uh, uh, and only when those people are there. I, so, yeah, I, I get that. I think but, that- These are two different proposals, you yeah. guys. They're, I, they're not, they're both about semi-heated space, but they're different in their nature. And, and David, um, I do like five to seven storage facilities every year. I'm hooked up with a guy that does storage facilities. That's it. And we don't insulate the walls because they use those coiling doors. They all fall under the semi-heated space category. We insulate the roofs and then the office area is treated like a regular building. Um, the part where it does not include electric resistant heating equipment is old language when, and this was before fossil fuels and where we were trying to save electric energy. Um, I think if you stay in the guidelines of semi-heated space, you should be able to heat these buildings with anything you want. Um, currently, I, I mean, a lot of times they use gas. Um, I have one going in Paulsville where they're using VRF because there is no gas. And I mean, they're very unique structures and you need to be able to build them. And I have no idea why we build so many storage facilities. I'm trying to get a stuff. I don't store anything. But that said, that's old language from many codes ago. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I recognize that. I, I guess I'm raising the question of is that language still useful, um, especially if we're making these modifications to allow electric infrared heating? Um, yeah. I would say it's not useful anymore. I would say. Um, I mean, there's not currently a proposal on the table to allow electric resistance heating in these situations, right, Patrick? No, but I would make a friendly amendment to Mike's and maybe David would back me that we don't exclude electric resistance heat. Um, they only really want to keep them at about 58 degrees. They're not overly heated shell by any means. Okay, so we're, we're over time by five minutes. Um, and Mike and Wayne, the next thing we're hey, going to be able to hey, resolve this today or do you, do you guys need to? Uh, no, I would rather work with Mike offline before the next meeting and see if we can handle Dwayne's and Mike's all together and even David jump in and see if we can um, try and accommodate all these spaces. And does, that, especially does that sound the, good, Mike and Dwayne? No, actually, I'd like to. I'd like to at least take a shot at making a, a proposal. That's a bit of a combination here. Um, I would like to propose to accept my 
code change proposal as shown on the screen with the addition of the two changes that, that Mike Kennedy made um, in, in C402112. That's, that's um, a motion. Okay, we have a motion. And I'm going to actually wait till Krista is able to paste this um, before hoping to get a second. So, so everybody knows exactly what they're seconding. If there's a second. Okay. And then there'll be a strike through of standard reference on the second paragraph. But yeah. Okay. Is there a second for Dwayne's motion? Going once, going twice. Anybody? A second. Take Mike McGiver and provides a second. Is there further discussion on this proposal? I have a quick question. This is Henry. Uh, why are heat pumps explicitly not allowed? No, the uh, in the last code cycle we said we said that a heat pump. We had that second exception that said if you have a heat pump for heating and you somehow disable the cooling side, you, you can have unlimited. You can have all the heat you want and still call it a semi-heated building. And I said uh, no. Um, semi-heated building does not allow unlimited heat like that, even if it's coming from a, a, an efficient source like a heat pump. And also, it's not clear to me that, that really you can permanently disable the cooling in a way that you couldn't re-enable with a turn of a screwdriver. So, um, so yeah, the, it seemed like that was uh, a, a, an inappropriate exception we put in last time. I I'd like to, I guess, extend on what Dwayne was saying, just for background. Traditionally semi-heated, you couldn't cool the space. Um, our current criteria is just a heating capacity criteria. So you could have your computer room be a semi-heated space. Um, but if, if, you, if you let cooling be in there, and so I think that's the concern is we don't have a lot of backstops on the cooling side um, in terms of how this might get applied. Hey. Uh, but I agree, it's like, well, why would you let infrared heating and not heat pumps from, uh, from if you're just looking at it from the heating side, which was, I think, Lisa Rosenau introduced the heat pumps. Um, and I also agree if we have our current carbon number, I mean, electric resistance is better than gas heat. Um, so, Actually, um, Mike, the definition of semi-heated space in chapter two specifically does not allow cooling. I know. And so it's, it, there isn't actually a, an, a, any opportunity for people to provide cooling in a semi-heated space, even now. Right, but if we started allowing heat pumps, they could have it. It, it would, yeah, it, it would be so easy. Okay, so we have a motion, we have a second. Um, is there further discussion on this? Uh, David, ready to raise, raise your hand. So does that mean you will have further discussion? Um, actually, no, go ahead. Okay. Um, okay, well then let's take a vote on this thing. Uh, oh, Mike just raised his hand. Yeah, sorry, call. one last quick question. I just want to clarify um, the electric infrared would allow it, or could allow going above the semi-heated building capacity? No, because that's no. what I put in this, the not to exceed eight BTUH. Okay, that's, uh, I'm on board if that's the case. I wasn't quite sure if the language, based on Mike's comment earlier, Mike Kennedy's comment earlier. You're allowing that, eight BTUs of gas heat and eight BTUs of infrared heat, right, Dwayne? Right. So the building itself would be get up to 16 potentially, if someone wanted to play that game. And, and if they were continually there in front of the, the heaters. Okay, we have, is there further discussion? 
I guess that's that's I'm I, like I have the same concerns as Mike Kennedy did that this you could combine and get eighteen BTUH allowable in a semi heated building. No, uh, you can you can have and I know uh, Chell is eager to get a vote here, but you can have your eight BTUH to have that minimal amount of heating that is allowed for a semi heated building, and it's still cold in there, and so you can. You can have infrared heaters for specific, you can see what it says, localized heating applications, not general area heating that turns off when the, there's no one there. So there's a two whole separate categories. It's not like we have a whole 16 BTUH of heating in the building. Okay, um, was there a discussion? I have my hand up. Okay, yeah, you've had your hand up for a while, so I didn't know. I took it down and I put it back up. Okay, uh, ask away. I think when you say fenestration that forms part of the building thermal envelope and closing semi-heated spaces, that there is an economic impact that is huge on these storage facilities because that would basically outlaw the coiling roll-up doors that they use on every one of those projects. I will say that when we have glazing in an external wall of a semi-heated space, at least myself, um, I make the glazing be C402.4. But uh, windows and doors are fenestration, and so you would be absolutely outlawing the coiling doors that they use, and they would have to go to a sectioned insulated doors, and that's not part of their building system. Well, this is actually a clarification of the existing rule. It's not a new rule. I mean, the, the existing rule says the only thing that's different between a semi-heated building envelope and a fully conditioned building envelope is the opaque wall insulation doesn't have to be there. That's the only difference. So this is pinning that, that down to say exactly what the, the existing language already says, but make it more clear. So this is not a change. Okay. Um, let's vote. Do we have a quorum still, Krista? It looks like we're at least really close to having a quorum, even if we don't. Um, should we do a roll call, Krista, just to make sure we have enough people here? You're on mute, so I can't hear you. But um, I'm counting. Okay. We do still have a quorum. Okay, let's take a voice vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed, say nay. Nay. Okay, that, Krista, based on your count, we have one nay and the rest ayes. Does that have enough votes to pass? I counted specifically seven eyes. I'm not sure if there were more than that that voted, but sure. It just has to be a majority. A majority. We need to have a quorum, and it needs to be a majority of the quorum. Which it is. Which it is. Yep. OK, we'll say that this passes. Um, well, it does pass. So. All right, thank everybody for your amazing quantity of time and your, your insights into this and your research and thoughts. And uh, I look forward to seeing you next next Friday as well. Hey, let's do this again. Yeah. <laughs> Bye everyone. Bye, everyone.